Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to day three of FinTech Week Lithuania. I'm super excited to be here today uh, because it's day three of a four-day global financial conference that connects 110 experts from Europe, North America, and Asia to discuss fintech reality, trends, and challenges that are shaping finance around the world. As one famous futurist said, in 2030, we'd probably have 2 billion people using day-to-day -day banking services without the interference of banks. I would also like to shout out to our main organizers. Ladies and gentlemen, put your virtual hands together and clap for Ministry of Economy and Innovation, the Ministry of Finance, the Agency for Science Science, Innovation and Technology, Rocket, Fintech Lithuania and Fintech Hub LT. I would also like to share a couple of reflections from yesterday's uh, day two of the event. Uh, we think I th we, th we heard fascinating discussions about digital assets and the future of capital markets, as well as hearing news from the London Stock Exchange. And I think it's a near certainty that in the near future we will have a programmable digital euro. I think everybody agrees that uh, and established that COVID-19 has accelerated and fast-forwarded the digitalization of the economy and our lives in general. General, so we just need to sit back and enjoy the ride. Is it really? Probably not. We need to put a lot of work into this. But I would like to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the recordings from the previous days are available on the OnVent platform and today's recordings will be available tomorrow. I would also like to share some guidance for you. Uh, so conference agenda is available on the website www.fintechweek.lt and for registered participants on the OnVent platform. The live broadcasts are available on Facebook, uh, the OnVent platform and YouTube and follow our news uh, in social media like Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and our website, www.fintechweek.lt. By registering to the participants hall in the virtual event, you can visit the expo where you can take a look at the 52 stands and chat with the participants via chats or video calls. And if you access the auditorium, you'll see, that's right, us here in the studio having a lot of fun and broadcasting to you live. If you do have questions, please use the chat window to ask them, uh, but do make sure you ask them in timely matter as they are only available during the presentation and if you do have questions in general how to navigate the platform please visit the info desk and the girls will gladly help you out other than that if you do face any difficulties please just follow the instructions on your PC screen everything is very seamless spotless and easy and do you know why I'm so excited, ladies and gentlemen? Because finally, I have a co-host that is going to help me out while I get to enjoy a cup of wonderful, well, kind of afternoon coffee, if you like. Uh, I would like to present to you the moderator of uh, our pitch battle that is coming up next, Andrus Milinavichus, co-founder of Baltic Sandbox, a first private accelerator in Lithuania. The company focuses on accelerating innovative solutions, M&A deals, investment consulting, and Andrus is a marketing and communications expert with 12 plus years of experience under his belt, and he's going to be working with corporate products. So today, he has an awesome panel of people, that some of whom you have already seen in our earlier uh, discussions and uh, interviews and it's going to be very awesome so Andrus I'm so excited to, uh, excited to pass on to you while I get to drink my coffee. Dear colleague thank you thank you so much for such a great presentation and I wish you to add some mayo you know to your coffee because it has to be tasty because you know like the sugar sugar is like it's so standard don't do it don't do it make something different today uh, how was the day how was the day can can you can you spare me with so some far, details so wonderful it has been just a blast you know it's really hot uh, wearing a suit in this particular weather is not the greatest idea. 29 degrees outside in the open. I'm trying to hide from the sun as much as I can. But I'll tell you what, Andrus, you go ahead with your discussion and we will kick off and talk a little bit more about uh, how it went after your fintech pitch battle. Good luck. Thank you so much. And calling a fintech startup pitch battle a discussion, that's a bit an insult for me, but whatever, whatever, we can cope with it. So, hello everyone. I'm really glad to invite you to the best part of this event. It's a fintech startup pitch 
battle. We all know that every crisis creates opportunities. We know that the fintech community is capable of thinking outside the box. And we can show you the real examples. That's exactly why we decided to have this pitch battle. Fintech Weekly Fania invites you to this short session today and short session tomorrow in order to actually show you the teams that created something significant, something really interesting, and something, some ideas that could be applied in every corner of this beautiful world, right? Okay, uh, what do we actually care during this fintech pitch battles? We care about the pivots, we care about the growth during crisis, we care about the winning partnerships, and we care about the solutions that actually conquered the new markets. But before we start, I'd like to present the organizers of this fintech pitch battles. So allow me to mention everyone. First one is Mita, second one is Baltic Sandbox, the third one is Startup Wise Guys. The fourth one is 70 Ventures. And last but not least, of course, it's Rocket Vilnius. So, guys, today we are going to have the pre recorded pitches that will be three minutes length. But then we have each and every team answering the live questions. That's the important part. Because you can be really, really clever to read something from the paper, but then we have an, an amazing jury to ask you some difficult questions. Allow me to present each and every of our beautiful jury. Can I start with you, Sharunia? Sharunia Smolakite, the head of Rocket Vilnius. Sharunia, how are you doing today? Hello, Andrews. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, so far, so good. Uh, a wonderful day, and I can't wait to hear the pitches that you have prepared for us. Thank you so much, Rune. Then we have Gitanis Galkis, the partner of 70 Ventures. And Gitanis, do you still do something at Lidban? Hello, yeah, thank you for, for the introduction. Yes, uh, I'm still on the board of Lithuanian Business Angel Network. And uh, yeah, uh, trying to, to build the better ecosystem for Lithuanian startups, both uh, investing as a VC and uh, helping the angels connect with startups. Then we have Jone Vitulevicute, the partner of Startup Wise Guys in Lithuania. Jone, what's cooking at your kitchen? Ooh, uh, a lot of co uh, is cooking actually. We are scouting intensively, so we have went quite far uh, digitally to now look into Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine, Turkey, and then we will come more to Europe. So it's a lot of work, a lot of interesting insights. Is there something hot that is coming up that you'd like to mention at the moment? You know, you can thank your mom if you want. Uh, I'll leave it for the later, but uh, yeah, I think uh, um, the hot trends that are coming from the regions that we're looking at right now, it's actually very interesting to compare to what we have here. And yesterday I did a keynote about what the trends we see in the West. So everything kind of follows a very clear tire system. So interesting to see how it develops. Great, great to hear that. And last but not least, we have Sandra Goldbreg, the CEO of Baltic Sandbox. Sandra, how is your summer going so uh -huh. far? Uh, hi, Andres. So far, my summer is going great. Uh, as you might know, we switched to online acceleration, and uh, now we have more and more startups despite the summer uh, participating in our programs. I'm really curious what are going to uh, all those real estate owners are going to do while everyone switched to online. But I really think, really think that's a temporary trend that we're facing right now. And Yone and Sandra, of course, everyone is waiting for a chance to be able to meet live and to have a proper, proper time together. Because this is exactly how the innovation starts. Nonetheless, we don't need meeting live to actually innovate, right? And for this, we would like to show you the amazing six pitches today. Just before we start, I'd like to note a few things. What is really important today? Really important is the rules of our pitch battle. The pitches will be three minutes long, and then we'll have three minutes for the Q&As. After that, 
jury will evaluate each and every pitch in four main criteria. The first one is the problem, of course. Then we have a solution. Then is there a market? And of course, does the startup has attraction? And then the prizes, of course, we're not competing here just because. The winners of the battle will receive several prizes today, um, apart from the glory and everyone's attention, of course, including vocation package at a lighthouse co-working, co-living in Klaipeda, fast track to Startup Wise Guys FinTech Accelerator Selection Bootcamp, fast track to Baltic Sandbox Bootcamp, and other prizes that I'll tell you a bit later. Okay, said so that, let Let's let's start the battle of the pitches. Okay, I invite the first team. This is Vim Money and the representative of the team, Sofia Herbuzuk. Two thousand twenty expectation and reality. After blocking caused by the pandemic, most businesses found themselves in a plight. Demand for goods and services fell. Declining income in some industries created a chain reaction of declining income in other industries and deepened the crisis. How to return demand to pre-pandemic levels? To restore demand for goods and services, it is necessary to restore the purchasing power of citizens. Purchasing power can be restored by creating affordable lending. But in a crisis, financial companies are forced to take tougher measures. Typical lending becomes less affordable and the crisis deepens. Our solution is to restore demand through the introduction of new algorithms for the accumulation of deposits and, land and lending. These algorithms can be implemented by introducing local electronic currency or cryptocurrency. Entrepreneurs will be able to take loans and make mutual settlements in local electronic currency and thus re-establish their business connections. To make loan in local electronic currency more accessible, we have developed a new financial flow management system. In this case, we have the algorithm of automatic combustion and return of funds. Users are motivated not by fear of fines, but by the possibility of obtaining additional income. This approach accelerates the circulation of money and can potentially speed up the re-establishment of business connections. The size of the market can be estimated by studying the statistics of declining enterprises' income in the post-pandemic period. Potential customers are sellers and buyers, users of social networks and mobile applications. Potential customers are employees and employers who need financial assistance. In addition, they are private investors who are looking for new sources of income growth. As of now, there is already a working prototype site, bimmoney.com. Bimmoney platform combines social network, marketplace, and internal payment system. Our team is able to solve technical tasks, but given the scale of the project, more resources are needed, so we are now actively looking for partners and investors. For the system to work properly, we need to register a financial company. The system can be implemented in the form of an electronic money issuer or a crypto company. Our goal is to build a better world. We hope that our system will help entrepreneurs to rebuild their business and bring us closer to a better future. That was the first pitch, and thank you for that. Dear jury, do we have questions? Sure. So I, I can Dennis? Answer. So probably the first, the first question, why do you need blockchain for this? Why, is it, uh, can, why cannot this be done on a regular system? What, what advantages uh, does it give? Uh, good afternoon. I'm, an, I'm a consultant and assistant of the money company. Um, I'm right now uh, in contact with our CEO. Uh, so I'll translate uh, your question quickly back to him and then translate back. So please hold on several seconds. Uh, 
um, we need blockchain. Um, so for now, we have uh, the project is on the MVP stage. So we uh, it wasn't our priority for now, but for the future, we need blockchain to protect uh, information and for stability. So banks don't protect information and don't are not stable. That's the assumption, or? Uh, we need this for transparency um, for our clients, uh, for our customers. Who, who would be the customers? Uh, our customers are um, buyers, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, so mostly uh, these two types. And uh, yes, entrepreneurs, buyers. Anyone has any other questions? Yeah, I, I, I would like to ask at which uh, stage are you currently with your product? Uh, our product is on the MVP stage. We have already a website, so anyone can log in and test the system. Uh, you can find instructions on that website, so it's a working platform. You can find uh, all the details how it works there. You can try it. Um, you can see how everything works inside. Maybe I can. Uh, but we had to. Uh, we had to stop because we uh, had already people as it started registering there and we had to pause it for a second because we need more um, assistance if we want to make it a bigger project but people were already trying to uh, use the website and testing uh, our platform uh, just maybe a side note uh, i think the project is actually disbursing the capital not testing the website so for me as a, an investor or in a way in, an interested party, I would not be interested in even learning about the website. I would be interested in uh, actually seeing, can you disburse those loans and get them back once, uh, once the business uh, is, uh, has solved its issue? So without this, it's, uh, I don't care if there's a website or, or something else. It's just an underlying business. Yeah, so maybe a question related to Gitana's remark is, uh, can you briefly tell uh, the timeline and what are you looking for to take it from a website to actually a tested solution? And uh, I think we don't even need to touch upon the blockchain part, which is, I think, it's quite far-fetched from now. Okay, thank you. Uh, please uh, give me one second. I'll just I'll just like to make a remark that Sophia is a translator of the startup founder. Just bear with us. The the beauty of the technology is here and today. You can smile. You ask a very difficult question. It's easy. <laughs> it's easy, right?
maybe we can ask Sophia to come back. Uh, um, okay, yes. Um, Welcome sorry, back, Sophia. Uh, We're you know, glad to have you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. As you know, that's a very complex question, uh, so there are many details. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, tell that uh, our timeline and our next steps um, depend on uh, whether we register that company uh, as uh, whether we work with cryptocurrency or electronic currency, uh, because it makes a big difference. Uh, we are very flexible uh, in this question. Um, we know that in some countries uh, it's easier to work with electronic uh, currency and in others uh, we can try a cryptocurrency. So it depends where, where we register a company. The company is right now registered in Ukraine as LLC. Um, uh, the CEO, Andrei Zhuknik, has 100% of the capital. We have a team, uh, but uh, in Ukraine, uh, the legislation is not right now adapted for uh, cryptocurrency and um, companies of uh, in this sphere. So we are looking for um, for uh, implementing it in the EU with the help of um, investors and our and our future partners. Uh, so we'd like to register it in another country so that would be uh, easier with the legislation and everything. Um, um, so yes, it basically depends whether it would be a cryptocurrency or electronic currency, but we are flexible to meet any requirements and um, wishes of our partners or inv and investors. Okay. Thank you. And we have one last question from Sandra. Thank you. Uh, so talking about the cryptocurrency, over the last several years, uh, we, while well, we all have seen that cryptocurrencies have proven themselves overrated and unsustainable, so why do you actually need another cryptocurrency? Why to create it? Why not operate with the like fiat money normally? Uh, so our main task is not to create a new cryptocurrency and use it. Our main task is to create a financial flow management system and uh, research the motivational, different and new motivational systems for customers. So that is our main goal. That was the first startup to present their idea, problem and solution. Thank you so much, Sophia. It was nice having you here. Thank you. Thank you. Have we a nice day, everyone. We move on to our next startup and I'd like to present Travel Union and Roman Cornu. Hello, my name is Roman and I'm CEO here at Travel Union. No one would argue that tourism is experiencing the deepest crisis in its history. Hotels are empty, planes go stuck on the ground, huge tourism infrastructure remains virtually unused. The old problems in the tourism still exist. Did you know that 95% of revenue is kept by banks for a whole week and 5% for up to three months as fraud prevention deposit? For travelers, today experts worldwide have already stated that after the crisis, Travel will be more expensive due to safety measures. Here, Travel Union will aim to break the deadlock. Our solution is travel-related digital banking platform, combining a bank, a payment system, a loyalty system with a new travel currency time and a travel marketplace. Union means that we are going to unite travelers and travel companies, providing a direct channel for communication and settlement between them. Okay, you would ask me, what travel companies will get in the end? I think actually all they can dream of, all the regular banking services with below market commissions, instant settlements, and the most important and new distribution channel to dedicated customer market segment, customers of travel union. Companies will be able to sell last minute deals for loyalty, time, 
provide significant cash back in time, increase the average check through consumer loans. And what about people? People will get our simple to use and efficient mobile app on inside with the general bank and functionalities, it provides special cash back in time for partners' offers which are not available to non-clients. The list of discount offers is constantly updated based on the user's interest and change in location. And how are we going to make money on this? In addition to 2% commissions, the payments and settlements have been received by all digital banks. Travel Union will receive up to 50% and sales commission for tourism services been sold through our platform. We're also going to develop loans to travel travelers and travel partners and get interest income up to 15% and share our income with our clients in time rewards. All that I'm telling you here is not just a dream and idea. We have a ready to use technological solution and we are going to be among those shaping the future of the industry. Time has come to revive the travel and banking industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roman, for your pitch. And now I turn to Jury. Jury, do we have questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Roman, for the presentation. I think uh, I'm lucky because I've seen your pitch deck, so it was a bit easier for me to understand uh, what you were talking about. Um, my question might be a bit specific. So you said that you can provide cash back in time. Does that mean that you actually have to have the liquidity on your side and have the money to support that? Or do you run into yes, any absolutely. risk? Yeah. yeah, so the idea is just so all, all the time is backed by cash. So I have, uh, so the idea is of, of time, yeah, so simply, to, so we receive uh, as a bank or as an uh, electronic money institution, we receive fee and commission from uh, um, settlement companies, we receive it from our partners, and so we just not take all this commission to ourselves, we just share this commission with our clients, yeah, and we, of course, we keep uh, like a special deposit, like a cover for this time, yeah. So it's 100% that, especially at e-money institution stage and later at, at the bank stage when we get there, it will be, so we will see upon liquidity of this, uh, how much money is spent so we can decrease this amount of coverage. Thank you. Thank you. Do have so actually, like, you know, the, the next question, if I settle, so for example, if I my client pay in time to my partner, so effectively, so I see transaction in time, but my partner received cash in the end. Thank so, you. Roman, maybe just a clarification. If I understand, uh, you want to eventually establish a bank uh, that would uh, deal with the both parties, the agencies and the travelers. Uh, it seems to be a very high cost as, as fixed of uh, actually capital requirement and so on. And in the end, uh, you will also have a high, in my mind, the high customer acquisition cost. So what volumes do you need to have in order to to, to pay off? Okay, let, yeah, let me explain where we're now and what we're doing. So at this moment, we already received uh, uh, two weeks ago, electronic money institution. So my find in, in the moment is 1 million of which uh, over 500 is in cash. So, uh, so far to create uh, application background, and put first uh, customers and partners on board, I spend just 300, yeah, just for you to understand. So uh, regarding the bank, yeah, for special banking license, we need 1 million as a capital, and I think this is not a big deal, yeah? So as soon as we are already active, we... So today we started uh, our so-called Time Hunter game. So with onboarding of clients, we already have a big partner, which is Test Tour, the first partner we onboarded. We uh, signed already with six hotels in Greece, uh, like five four stars hotels, and they provide their uh, like uh, one, five to seven nights as present to our uh, clients for solving this uh, like puzzles in this time hunter game. So at this moment, I'm interacting uh, these clients from my network of partners, yeah? And this is effectively free. Uh, just for you to understand, yeah? So for a regular bank, so the customer costs something like 200 euro, 
Uh, for FinTech Bank, it's from 50 to 70. For me at this moment, because I attract clients from my partners, yeah, this is free. Okay, and uh, so when I start issuing cards, it will be something like, so for the card, like, and uh, what I prov provide for free, it will be around 11 euro plus some marketing expenses, like 20 euros max. Yeah, because we have very wide network of partners and they are ready to provide these clients to us. So this, Sorry, is, this is like the main... believe that it's free. It's, uh, yeah. It can't be free because you will need free. KYC costs and AML costs and so checking verification. Every, every, explain. And so every client, like for me, yeah, so the cost of one client is 11 euro. Yeah, so this is card, KYC, and you know, all the cost of one client. So what's on top of 11 euro? This is my marketing expenses. I, 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 I don't buy it, but fine. No, it's, it's, if you don't buy it, I can show you like calculation. It's not like something, uh, it's, it's not like, uh, so because I already, we already printed cards. We already like signed all the agreements with, uh, uh, like all the providers we integrated with processing, we integrated with currency cloud. So we did all the integration. So I know my costs very well. It's not just cost. This is, this is like a, not in the model. This is already my life. Yeah. So this is this agreement signs. This is my calculation. But onboarding partners, signing with them contracts, having them as distributor okay, networks, so all of this costs money. You may so work for free, partners, but if you want to scale, it will not be for free. Uh, onboarding partners, so the partner, first of all, partners, so as I explained, so there is a big problem for travel industry. Yeah. So the main problem is a problem for travel industry. It was before COVID-19 and it's still the same. Yeah. So the problem is, so, so the travel is treated by all the banks as a fraudulent, bad, unclear, like a lot of cash and so on. So this is a niche. This is one thing, yeah. Another point, so travel industry has a lot of uh, services which is not sold today, they will expire tomorrow. So travel industry is ready to provide very high cash back and they need additional, uh, additional way how to sell it. So effectively through this time, we create a special niche. It's like, you know, you probably, uh, uh, the best example in, in uh, microeconomy, it's like a uh, um, segment, yeah? For example, a businessman can fly in the same, uh, in the same flight, yeah, for 2,000 two, two euro, yeah? And you will have a student for, who is flying for 100 yeah, euro. Uh, and they sit in, uh, uh, like, together, yeah? So if you create a special segment, like, uh, in my case, a special segment are travelers, yeah, uh, who are tr clients of travel union and who can pay in time. Yeah, I mean, like, it's in special, in special, not currency, but in, in, in special loyalty points. Yeah, so you receive this and you can help all the partners to sell what they are not able to sell. So the my, my proposition for the partners, it's not just, you know, banking services, uh, verified clients, no fraud, but the most important is this niche which I provide access to. And they have so to much jump Roman, in. I'm yeah, just for you to understand, at this Roman, moment, I have Roman, 12 hotels Roman, do you and hear I have just two. Who jump and I pay Roman, do you hear me? <laughs> That's a beautiful, beautiful answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Unfortunately, we cannot afford ourselves to have that much of time for answering the questions. And dear audience, yes, I see your questions. Unfortunately, we have no time. So thank you so much, Roman. We have to move on because we have other projects to be presented. So allow me to present our third pitch, and it's going to be Oval Global and the founder, Ilya Kosolapov. Hello. My name is Ilya Kasalab. I am one of the founders of InsurTech project Oval. Why every person, when hearing the word insurance, thinks about something bureaucratic, slow and heavy? I remember my first working day in the insurance company in Vienna. I was in cargo claim department. A new claim declaration was received and I asked my boss to help me to work with the claim. The answer was, don't be in a hurry. Let's do it in one week. I understood that something is wrong in the insurance industry and that is how the market still works today. Do you know that almost 75% of potential market is not covered by insurance companies? Just imagine the number of new clients if they realize that insurance can be fast and seamless, if a client gets compensation when it's needed, immediately, and even no single touch with the insurance company. Our team knows the solution. 
We create not just a technical platform, but entirely new insurance experience, focused on new products with instant claim payment, white labeled to be included to any B2B partner. We automate insurance policy to make insurance fast, seamless, and pleasant for clients. Accident, moments, money. Yes, so easy. It's possible due to reliable, independent, in-time data provision. Insurance companies pay us a fee for each policy sold. Commission-based revenue sharing is natural for insurance. We have created a machine which can be easily scaled. We have started with flight delay insurance as a proof of concept. And now we apply the proven approach to new products and new markets, including the biggest insurance market, car protection. How it works? From the installed telematics device, Oval knows all real data about the accident in seconds. Just imagine, for example, a Mercedes driver who gets money just after the crash, which could be spent immediately. And we have launched a technical pilot already in CIS. Let me picture the potential European market opportunity, even only in motor insurance. Our average policy price is around 250 euros. Our fee is 6%, or 15 euros. It's just one euro per month. Around 75 million contracts are renewed every year, and more than 200 million have no insurance because of lack of economical sense. As an assumption of 0 0.3 penetration, we plan to get 3.4 on existing and 9 million euro per year on totally new market segment. Amazing? And just one product line. Shortly about launch strategy. Pilot with a flexible insurance company first, then having working proof of concept, we propose our products to giants of insurance industry for their existing clients and most important, to new ones attracted by our innovative products. We have succeeded with approach in CS market. Next is Europe. We have already signed agreement with Lithuanian insurance broker Mai before the pandemic and partnered with Baltic Sandbox Accelerator during the pandemic period. These partners will open new markets for all. Now, we are looking for B2B partners in motor and travel verticals to distribute our innovative solutions. Contact me if you are interested in offering new kind of products to your clients. We have a unique product, a team, a vision, and strategy. So, we are ready to make a real difference in insurance. Thank you so much, Ilya, for your pitch. And now I turn to the jury. Jury, do we have questions? Uh, yeah. You mentioned uh, real-time data. So I'm interested, how is it compatible with the various industries? Uh, for example, automotive and uh, uh, airplanes. Uh, how is it different? Uh, well, thank you, Andreas, uh, for the introduction. Thank you, the jury. Uh, I'm happy to be here. For the question you asked about the in-time data provision, it differs from every product. As I told, we started from flight delay. Uh, in this product, we are integrated with independent data system flight stat or uh, flight in the air. And from there, we get all the information about the flights, delay or cancellation. And according to this data, uh, the insurance company agrees to make it. If we speak about the car protection, we get the data from the installed telematics device on the car. And this device gives us all about the accident, just from every second. How was the crash? What was the strength? Uh, and where was the impact? So repeating, in every product, every independent uh, information. So are these uh, the two key industries you are current, uh, currently focusing right now? Uh, correct. Uh, the investor investors ask us to be focused and these uh, two verticals, travel insurance and car protections are our focus. In the travel insurance, it's not only flight delay, we add new risks also, like for example, baggage delay. In the car protection, it's not only car damage, but also personal accident, for example. Yone, I saw you had a question. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit about uh, how the testing is going over here in the Baltics? I, I heard it right, right? That you have uh, um, a deal with one of the insurance companies. How many users do you have using it? Uh, any statistics on that? Uh, we do not have at the moment the traction at the Baltic uh, market. We signed the uh, first binding agreement with the insurance broker in Vilnius, and now we are finalizing the first product with uh, one of the insurance company on the local market. Thank you so much, dear jury. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Ilya. That was a nice pitch and nice answers. We have to move on. I'd like to present Thank everyone you, our third and it's Raison AI and the founder Alexander Zaitsev. 
Hello everyone, my name is Alex and I'm here from Raisin.ai, a magic app for managing personal finance and investments. We started our project because of the problems which faced our customers, like overflooded market of digital financial services, excess of information noise, lack of regulation, and of course higher ticket for pre-IPO and private equity markets. So in April 2019, we launched an app which solved the majority of those problems and the coolest thing we offered to the customers was the opportunity to invest in private equity and pre-IPO companies like they could never did before, starting with only 100 of euro and in a fully legal environment. Reason is available for users all around the world, but Europe is the target market for us. Our business model is pretty simple. We collect fees. We collect fees for for example, exchange operations, and of course, we have a margin inside those investment opportunities we all offer to the customers uh, in private equity and pre-IPO markets. Uh, our main competitors are the neobanks and the online platforms offering the investment opportunities. I'd like to benchmark us with Revolut, which is only five years old and is valued for more than six billion of euro. So, who is look and I'm sure and that we are going to be a unicorn in a couple of next years and for those who is looking for equity upside I'm offering to join us. Why well, I'm sure of success because of our key metrics. We have more than 4000 customers on the platform right now starting from April 2019 and we have a pretty grow uh, pretty cool growth rate uh, of the customers it's something about 40% per month. Uh, also we uh, had a pretty cool and uh, growth rate of the customer assistance on the platform starting from 19,000 when we launched an app uh, to more than one and a half million of euro. We were also recognized by several well-known organizations like TechCrunch, for example. In 2019, we were chosen as top five EU fintech startups. And I'm also sure of success because of the team. Uh, we have a great experience in IT and financial sectors, uh, working in the major uh, companies in CIS, Russia, and Europe. We have already raised more than 700 a uh, thousand of euro from private customers from private investors and now we are looking for an opportunity to uh, offer this the, the investors uh, our equity up to 1 million of euro and of course we are looking for partnerships with the banks and the and inquiries and additional financial institutions thank you very much for your attention Thank you, Alexander, for an amazing pitch and I really much hope to see you this autumn at the Slush Conference in Helsinki. We'll see how will that happen. Now I turn to the jury. Jury, do we have questions? Sandra? We, yeah, we do. Uh, thank you. So uh, I have two questions, basically. First of all, what's your customer acquisition cost uh, at the moment? And secondly, you mentioned that you are fundraising now. So how are you going to spend the money? Alexander, we don't hear you. Can you can you spare us a moment? Nope, we don't hear you. One second. Jury, can you can you spare me with some uh, uh, more moments about the pitch then, since we cannot hear our founder speaking? Sharuna, what do you think about this project? Um. I really think it's interesting uh, as a perspective and I have uh, also a couple of questions from my side that I would like to go deeper. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them, uh, he mentioned that uh, currently they have Airbnb and uh, SpaceX on their platform. So, you know, how to onboard the companies there and, you know, how fast they can move on with onboarding the new ones. So you have the same question. How can you approach Airbnb and SpaceX? Should you use LinkedIn or maybe is it's a Facebook that you should be using, right? Well, I believe we'll hear a different uh, secret recipe. <laughs> exactly. They, they actually know someone from those companies. Yonia, what do you think about this project? I hope it's not a project. I hope it's a startup, <laughs> a company. <laughs> That's a very good uh, <laughs> but yeah, remark. I mean, um, I'm always a little bit scared when a young startup compares itself to Revolut and says <laughs> this is not much that they achieved. So. Um, but there might be a good reasoning behind it. So I understand that the sound is on and we can back. Uh, yeah, Alexander, questions. do you hear us? 
Yes, I do. Can you hear amazing, me? Amazing, amazing. So we uh, unfortunately sorry, we spend a lot of time. So Sandra, can you repeat your question shortly? And we have one minute for the answer. Yeah, I had this question. What's your current customer acquisition cost uh, comparing to your lifetime value? And how are you planning to spend the money that you're going to raise? Sure. So uh, the customer acquisition cost is 12 euro. Uh, we are going to spend money on the additional developments and, of course, on, market, on marketing it uh, to uh, scale the product. Because we, ho we have tested the hypothesis and we do understand that the customers do need our product. We are generating revenues right now. Uh, our revenue for the 2019 was something about 200,000 of euro. Uh, so we're just uh, raising money to scale up. Do you have one more yeah, question? I, I yes, Gitanis, so, please. So yeah. How much uh, do you earn on, on one customer on average? And how long uh, he has to stick around? It depends on the product uh, which he's buying. So generally, uh, if the customer is working with the private equity companies, we're generating something about uh, 12 to 15 percent from uh, the customer's uh, purchase, purchase amounts. So, and uh, it depends on the volumes of the purchasing, purchasings of the customers. In that uh, the investment has to grow more than, uh, let's say, 12 percent for the customer to be at least uh, in the money? Yes, yes, but speaking about the private equity markets, it's a, it's a normal uh, yield, so there are no problems. Uh, this is just the premium for the size uh, which our customers paying when they are purchasing the small batches of the shares. So it's not directly, uh, I have heard the question about the Airbnb. So we're not onboarding Airbnb or SpaceX directly to the platform. We're using the investment infrastructure, uh, which uh, uh, is offering the customers the units of the fund, uh, which have the underlying asset of Airbnb or SpaceX, for example, and it's fully legal, managed by US SEC regulated investment advisor. And uh, it solves the problem with uh, the legal issues, possible legal issues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was Raison AI and Alexander Zaita. Thank you, Jury, for your questions. We have to move on because I see the clock is ticking. I'd like to present you our next startup that is going to pitch. It's Evervest and the founder, Stephanie Brennan. Stephanie, it's your time. The finance industry really can't keep up with the next generation of investors, the same way that tech companies like Facebook, Uber, and Spotify can. It's time to make investing as simple as having a smartphone and a good Wi-Fi connection, the way it should be. Over 93% of stock market value is divided between three continents, America, Europe, and Asia, but the access to other markets is both limited and costly. We're uniting the world stock exchanges in one simple app and making them accessible to investors across the globe. At the same time, we're also educating people, empowering them to make wise investment decisions and secure their financial future. We're like the Spotify of global stock trading with easy picking stock playlists and the ability to follow your friends' portfolios. Our business model is simple. We place a small margin on FX at the time of a trade. There's a small cost to place an instant trade. And we also place a small margin on the brokerage costs we get charged to access stock markets outside the US. Our target demographic of 18 to 35 year olds are part of the Gen Z and millennial demographics that now make up 63.5% of the world's population. And despite this, investments in the stock market continue to form a significant part of household financial assets all over the world. In fact, 89% of our target demographic invest, but sadly only 18% feel confident in their investment knowledge. We're ready to go for our launch date scheduled for quarter two of this year. And in terms of going to market, we focus on providing value, drawing customers to our product and creating a loyal following. We do this a number of ways, but our core focus is on our partnerships with universities, whereby we support students to gain work and practical investment experience, while also beta testing our app and helping us to shape our roadmap in line with the needs and wants of the next generation of investors.
Since January 2018, we've really hit the ground running. We've won multiple pitch battles. We've been a guest speaker at multiple events. We've been featured in more than 70 media articles across the globe. I was listed in the top 200 most influential women in fintech. We've signed with multiple partners, including universities, to support our go-to-market strategy. And we've also raised more than 304% of our initial fundraising target in our first crowdfunding round. We're also joined by an experienced and passionate team, including two of our board members, a former vice president of NatWest that led their Brexit strategy and the former executive director of the Bank of Lithuania, one of the regulators we're obtaining our financial brokerage license from. We've also achieved some great feedback. My first personal favorite is from a Polish journalist that said, since the app is not yet available, I felt a little bit like licking candy through the glass. We're ready to launch and we're inviting you to join our mission because together we can change the way the world invests. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for this pitch. And now I'd like to turn to the jury. Uh, 12 points from Lithuania. <laughs> Where should they go? I'm joking. Sharune, you have a question. I um, see that. Hello, Stephanie, and thank you very much for your presentation. As we've seen, uh, your MVP was live from 2008. So what's still missing for you to kick it off and pass the stage? Sure. Well, firstly, thank you for having me and, and thank you for a great question. So we started in January 2018, but that was when we launched our free investment education blog. So uh, we have created our, our beta and we are waiting on our license approvals. So we submitted our license to the Bank of Lithuania at the end of last year and we submitted to the FCA as of last week. So because of COVID, there's been a couple of delays on licensing because all regulators at the moment are focusing on managing the tier one capital adequacy ratios of banks, um, which is is very important at this at this current time. So we are expecting that our license approval with the FCA will come through by the end of this month. And then soon after, in about uh, July, August, we're expecting our license from the Bank of Lithuania as well, pending no more delays. Thank you so much. Joanne? Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for presentation. I think, uh, uh, yeah, we know you have been around for uh, a lot of pitch battles and congratulations on winning those. But I think as investors, we're interested to see, so where are those users, right? Um, and uh, now in the pitch, I saw that you're about to launch your MVP in Q2 uh, of 2020, which is like ends in, in 15 days. Uh, so is it true? And the second is, when are the first users coming? Yeah, sure. So as a regulated company, we can't launch with live trades until we have a license. Um, so we are expecting, as I mentioned, our FCA license to come through by the end of this month, and then we will start uh, our alpha testing, not only internally with our team, but we'll start placing live trades as well with our CEDAS investors, and then from there, um, university students, and we'll start rolling out to our wait list as well. Um, in terms of your your other question, um, how we sort of expect to, to scale from there, it's really a matter of um, rolling out to our waitlist and then to the general public. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Jury. That was startup called Evervest. We move on to our next startup, and I'd like to present Remit Radar and Sergey Markov. <laughs> Hello, greetings to everyone. I will uh, present to you Remit Radar, a company launched in 2016 in the United, Ke in the United Kingdom. Uh, it was launched as an aggregation and comparison service for centers and receivers of remittances. Who are these people? There are 250 million people, mostly migrant workers, who live home and go abroad to earn money and send it back to their families. And on the receiving end, there's 700 million of their family members who depend on this money for their livelihood. Well, it is difficult for them to understand the commissions and the exchange rates and find the office locations and understand their working hours. So we have taken all the trouble out of this process and uh, we uh, show them the best deals. We run all the numbers. We show them the total amount received after all the deductions uh, by the recipient and we show them the agency locations. So they are very grateful to us and they were using our service a lot. We currently have 350 thousand monthly average users and over 11 million customers. Uh, so we, uh, in order to provide this free service, we aggregate data from 
almost 360 money transfer companies and cover most of the market. The service is in operation since 2016 and it allows us to compile um, GDPR compliant data on our users. What can we do with this data? We can, our ambition is within the next three, three years to transform the industry in the same way uh, like Hotels.com and uh, Skyscanner transform the travel industry. Being right at the beginning of the customer journey, we can always assign to the transaction the optimal routing, even if it, if it is a connection routing. The direct flight is not always the best, not always the cheapest. Sometimes it is much better to send money via a connection. We have the technology for this and we will make money on this. What else can we do with this data? We can help the families of migrant workers access credit. Currently, for the local lenders, their income is not very transparent because it comes from abroad in the form of remittance. We have the data from both sides of the money transfer, and therefore we can supply the necessary information to build the credit scoring. Our technology has traction. We are present in most of the countries in the world. We have 11 and a half million users, and our team includes individuals who are very experienced in payments here, uh, <clears throat> including one of the founders of MoneyGram, and Prince Michael of Kent, his Royal Highness Prince Michael of Kent, is our global ambassador. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sergey, for this amazing pitch. And now I turn to the jury. Jury, do we have questions? I can. Gitanis? So, hello, Sergey. Uh, the, probably the first question is, who, who are your customers or ideal customers that you want to have? And, and how do you reach them? Hello, Labadena. Uh, first of all, before answering this question, I would like to convey to you greetings from our CTO, Denis Kochube, who is Lithuanian, but he trusted me to do this presentation. Uh, the customers for our free service of data comparison and aggregation are the migrant workers. 250 million people who send money and 750 million people who are on the receiving end. So that's a total addressable market of 1 billion people with $2 trillion um, income combined. Every year they move uh, among themselves in form of money transfers $600 billion. How do we acquire them? All our growth has been organic. Currently we have 11 and a half million users in our database and our monthly average, we have 350,000 monthly average users. We have never had to spend even a dollar on marketing and promotion because the clever algorithm that um, our CTO, Denis Kachube, created put us always in the searches uh, because we are more relevant than one given uh, money transfer company. Uh, anybody who searches for a money transfer option would find us in the top three searches without us paying for this just because we are more relevant. So the customer acquisition cost, the fixed customer acquisition cost for the free service is zero. Now, regarding our monetization models, in different monetization models, paying customers are different. For example, in connected remittances, it will be the money transfer companies that will receive additional business from connected remittances. And we don't have to acquire them because 360 uh, remittance companies are already connected. In case of uh, the lending model to migrant workers and their families, our clients, of course, are the financial institutions. Once again, they are after us, not the other way around, because we are opening to them access to a very substantial group of people who, to whom they currently don't have access. Thank you so much, Sergey. And uh, now I'd like I see one more question coming in from Yone. Yone. A very related question. You mentioned you have your a number of users in a database. What does it mean to have a user in a database? Are they using the product? Are they paying for the product? Um, what is this category? The aggregation comparison service is free to the user. Its purpose is to accumulate, for us to accumulate, the GDPR compliant customer data. 350,000 monthly average users, and over the years that we have been around, 
the some of course drop off and some continue regularly to use our service those who continue regularly are 11 million people yes and one more question from sandra uh, hi so how are, you, uh, are your competitors and uh, how do you compete with them actually uh, our main competitor is monitor.com this is also an aggregation comparison website who came into being uh, after us, we were the first. We actually discovered this opportunity because one of our founders was also one of the founders of the entire remittance industry in the early 90s. So we understood that with smartphone penetration into the migrant workers' um, uh, brackets, uh, into the poor people, we have this opportunity. So we were the first to start. Monita uh, raised capital last year and overtook us a number of monthly average users, but we are different in four respects. First, we have more money transfer companies connected to our service than anyone we know in the industry. Secondly, we have more API connections with uh, money transfer companies than anyone. But the most important difference is our business model and monetization model. Everybody uses this data to do lead generation and digital marketing. We also do this. Doing this this year, we have made $150,000 so far. But that's where they uh, start, we, uh, uh, where they end, we actually start. For us, much more interesting is to transform the money transfer industry by creating those connected routes. Before Skyscanner or Expedia, people, if they wanted to get from A to B, they had to take a direct flight. But now a lot of people take connecting flights because it's cheaper, even if a direct flight is available. The same is the situation in the money transfer industry. If you move, want to move in from A to B, currently your only option is to find a money transfer company that has payment licenses in both countries. It's likely to charge you 5, 6, even 7%. But there's always a possibility to find a cheaper route if, it's, if it goes through cheaper corridors like A to C and C to B. Being right at the beginning of the customer journey, we can propose cheaper connecting routings for money transfers that currently are not present in the market. And by this, we are going to make dozens of times more money than just by lead generation that everybody is doing. Our financial model, that, says that even if only 20% of the remittances in three years from now take connected rout routings rather than the direct routes, and if we have only 5% of that market, and if we charge only 0.2% commission on the transaction, then our monthly, our ever annual revenue will be $49 million in, in, in three years, which we hope is true. Thank you so much, Sergey. Thank you so much. We unfortunately we have no time left for your pitch. That was Sergey Marko from the startup Remit Radar. Thank you so much. And with this, I would like to say that the first stage or the first day of the pitches has ended. But now it's the best part. We all know that pitching is just one thing because we have a lot of viewers. I'd like to turn to the jury to have a short reflection session. Dear jury, could you, could, you, could you just spare me with your opinion on what we just saw today? And maybe we could wrap it up into some hints for the other startups that are looking at the moment. Sharuna, could I, maybe I could start with you. How was the pitches and did you find something missing? Uh, usually I'm used to the live pitches when you see people in front of you and of you could course, feel the emotion. Course. So definitely the, the vibe is different. Uh, but from uh, from the pr presentations themselves, um, I would advise practically for all the companies to, to work m out more on the presentation, especially when jury has such a short time to evaluate you. Um, in uh, my opinion, it's uh, not only enough to talk about the big vision, but also to show uh, some numbers. So uh, we've seen it in a couple of uh, the presentations, but uh, many of the guys uh, just mentioned it briefly. And it would be nice to go deeper into where you actually are right now and uh, your future forecast, the, the milestone that you would like to achieve in the most recent times. Thank you so much, Rune. Gitanis, what's your take on the pitches that you saw? And maybe you could comment it from the investor's perspective. So I, I truly agree with, with your comments. Um, the key key issue I see and uh, 
maybe it's also because of the short time it's it's very difficult for you to transfer the your idea and and the, why are you pitching so i think the first thing you need to answer for yourself why are you on stage today and then have this message go through your slides so i missed it in in many slides then uh, in it's it's very likely that i'm not super brilliant or brilliant at all and that's why it's hard to understand your idea so in 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 my mind it's very important especially in this kind of setting to speak in a stupid simple language so so even with the last speaker i didn't i totally didn't get it uh, what he's doing when the presentation was happening i got it in his uh, third uh, third uh, question answer where it was much much more explanatory and much more straightforward so in general a business is what what do you do where do you create the value how do you acquire the customer and what's the difference between the customer acquisition and the price you sell so trying and explaining it in a stupid simple <laughs> sentence and putting the cherry on the top what are you looking for why is it a good investment so try try this maybe maybe it will help thank you so much gitanis yone can i turn to you you represent a accelerator so what would be your comment on the startups pitching that we saw today Mm, I think uh, I'm glad to hear that I think we are all on the same page so the missing things and one definitely that we will spot very easily on being an accelerator and investor and expert is the vanity metrics is uh, the number of users or the number of users in a database etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are a number uh, numbers of those metrics that startups usually use that don't convert in any business so really forget about those we will spot those immediately and i think this this is where most of the questions went to and the second is for sure agree with gitanis what's your ask so why are you pitching here today i know the prizes are great but you could really leverage uh, us for probably much more than a prize so or, or just tell i came for the prize this yeah. <laughs> that would be very memorable i think <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Sandra, would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, sure. First of all, I completely agree with the rest of the jury. And actually, there are two more things. Uh, we've done a lot of online pitching and I've seen a lot of online pitching. So can you imagine I'm the person who is looking at the screen at the moment and trying to listen to you at the same time? And you have 15 to 20 sentences on the screen. Uh, where should I focus my attention? Should I listen to you wisely? Or should I try to read what's on the screen? Uh, this is pretty distraction. Uh, like it's a pretty big distraction, and it's impossible to understand what you're doing exactly. And uh, the second one, talking about metrics, I guess there were like zero companies where I have seen one of the two main metrics, like customer acquisition cost and lifetime value. I can't judge by the amount of users uh, how good you are. Uh, I can't judged by the amount of the competitions that you won. Uh, but I, I can actually see unit economics from two numbers, and those numbers are really important. So it totally makes sense. Thank you so much, dear jury. That was a reflection from our jury. That's a new practice that we like to apply to all of our pitching events. Because we not only we want to ask you questions, we also would like to give you some comments and something to learn from. And now, dear jury, that's the best part. We have three amazing prizes. I'd like to mention just a few of them. We have Cloud Booster Prize, we have Rocket Vilnius Prize, and we have Baltic Sandbox Prize. But for us to be able to announce the winners, we would like to ask you to spare us some five minutes of time. Now, everyone who is watching us, you can, you can actually just get that drink that you really wanted already. And dear jury, I'd like you to actually sit down and to evaluate each and every pitch that you saw today in three, four main criteria: Problem, solution, market, and traction. So, dear viewers, we are coming back in five minutes and we will announce the prizes. So stay tuned and that's an ad break now.
welcome back. There are lovely people that are watching us today and right now online or on any device that you prefer. So, the jury had a lot of discussions, but I already know the winners. Okay, no, no, let, let, let me begin again. I don't know the winners, but I'll invite the people that will announce the winners. In any case, we have three amazing prizes and the first day of pitch battles is about to end. Allow me to present the first prize. The prize is presented by the Cloud Booster Company and it is 5,000 US dollars of Amazon World Services credits. And the winner is, can I have this sound or something or drums or something happening here? Okay, I can play myself. So the winner is the team or the startup Raisin AI. Congratulations, guys. You get $5,000 of credits. I feel lonely here, you know, and I'd like to invite someone else to announce the second prize. Can I invite Sandra Goldberg from the company Baltic Sandbox? Sandra, please join me and tell me what is the next prize and who is the winner? Uh, hi, Andreas. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so the next prize this is the fast track to our Baltic Sandbox Bootcamp, which is happening already next week. And uh, the winner from our side is Raisin AI again. Uh, thank you for showing some traction on the slides, metrics. It was really interesting to see it. Congratulations, Raisin AI, the second prize, guys. You're doing great. Thank you so much, Sandra. And now I'd like to invite our third representative of the third prize, Sharuna Smalakite from Rocket Vilnius. Sharuna, please join me on stage. Hello, Andrews. So what is the prize? What is the price? As you already mentioned in the beginning, that's a really wonderful price that uh, matches the current situation we are right now. So first of all, it's summer and uh, I believe uh, same as us and all the startups can't wait uh, to go outside and enjoy some of the sunlight. Uh, as well, we are just right after the quarantine and uh, we cannot travel too far, so we need to enjoy more of our local adventures. And uh, as we know, startups have uh, don't have much time to rest and uh, go on vacation. So we decided to send them on a vacation uh, to one of the coolest uh, places by the seaside in Lithuania, which is called Lighthouse. And uh, you will get a fully covered for your co-working and co-living um, during your stay here. So I would like to announce the winner. Um, du -du 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 the winner and? is uh, Oval. So Oval Global, congratulations, guys. Congrats. You're going to the seaside. And you have to work there. That's the minor problem. Well, that's uh, th the tough life of startups. <laughs> so congratulations and uh, we hope to see you around. Thank you so much, Sharuna. Yeah. And guys, congratulations one more time. And for everyone who is watching us at, at the moment, I'd like to tell you that was only the first edition of the startups. Tomorrow, we're having even more startups and even more prizes. So stay tuned with the FinTech Week. Lithuania, and I'd like to turn now to my precious colleague Orimas. How was the swim in the lake for this hour that you were away? Uh, well, absolutely. Uh, it was uh, very refreshing, uh, very delightful. I have way more energy right now, and I would be very happy to kind of kick back and relax, actually, as a matter of fact. But uh, as I have you, Andrus, could you share kind of your reflections in general? Um, I'm sure this hasn't been the first time you've been doing this, right? So what are the kind of top pitfalls that startups doing pitches should try to avoid? Uh, that's a very good question, you know, and uh, to be honest, I'd like to write a book about it, but... Um there are a few key things I'd like. I usually mention to them is the first thing is like always know whom are you talking to. Don't forget, like if if you are participating at some certain event, look at the audience and actually think what audience would like to hear from you. You can always place a lot of numbers to your slides, a lot of information to your slides. But what happens then? Audience instantly lose you. They lose you because they start to read what you're showing. So 
If you have three minutes, and if you're, if you're such an awesome person, so grab their attention and tell them the things they would like to actually hear from you. And if you're a really successful startup or you have things that you'd like to mention, I would actually bring them to the beginning of the pitch. I'm joking, of course, the pitch has the structure, right? But still, don't try to put, place all the information that you know inside. You have three minutes, be awesome. And being awesome is just being constantly clear. That's great. I think uh, that's good advice. Absolutely. Don't drown your audience in numbers, right? Because then they stop listening to you and start reading what's Absolutely. on the screen. Absolutely. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, what's interesting uh, Anders, could you actually join me uh, closer? Because we, we we're having a conversation. I thought so it far will apart. never happen. The quarantine was To be honest, was to be honest I today. thought it we will never happen. Yes, that. and we we don't have to have that big of a yes, distance. Yes, yes, good. Yeah, there you go. Right. Yes. Proper COVID. Hello. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just uh, in general, uh, what do you think? Are, are you kind of excited for the second part of the fintech pitch battles? Oh yeah, because because I do know uh, what are the other teams that are going to participate, and I really, really much encourage you all of you to actually come back tomorrow because it's going to be even more exciting. How many pitches do we have tomorrow? Six. Six, uh, as much as we had today, yes, right? Yes, of it's course. A really even split. Yes. Uh, do you already? Could, could you give us a sneak peek on what prizes can they anticipate to win? Oh no, 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 no. no. You have to go to the FinTech Week Lithuania website and you'll see it all there. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, please visit the www.fintechweek.lt website where you can find out all kinds of important information that will be available to you at your disposal. Uh, the agendas, the way to navigate, the stands, the chats, the video calls, everything is there, everything's available. And most importantly, whatever you watched or didn't have the time to watch, uh, don't worry, everything will become available on the platform the next day. So tomorrow you should see everything that was discussed today. And if you want to check, take a look at the um, previous day recordings, then certainly you can do that already. And right now, it is my pleasure to actually segue on as much as I love having uh, um, uh, your presence, Andres, it's, it's really nice. Uh, I will segue on to something really cool because we have another uh, very interesting panel that is going to happen very soon. Uh, first of all, some facts. Uh, investors poured over $53 billion into fintech startups worldwide in 2019, according to Accenture. And let's hear the panel discussion about the most exciting COVID-19 innovations that will shape the future of fintechs. The moderator for the discussion is Paulus Tarbunas, heading fintech Lithuania, which is part of InfoBalt Association. Polus has uh, worked in the banking industry for more than 20 years uh, in Lithuania, Sweden, Ukraine, Estonia, and is responsible for a variety of functions ranging from financial markets to digital banking and taking CFOs and CEO roles. Ladies and gentlemen, panel, the most exciting COVID-19 crisis innovation that will shape the future of fintechs. <laughs> The future of fintechs. Uh, the panel Lithuania, the association of uh, fintech companies and fintech ecosystem enablers. Uh, and I'd like to introduce my guests, starting with those joining, joining online. So, uh, Jesper Kalvaliho uh, Andersen, he is uh, an investor and a serial entrepreneur with a lot of um, mergers, acquisitions, uh, turnarounds under his belt. So, um, I'm really keen to hear how fintech industry looks like in the eyes of the investor. Uh, then we have Douglas McKenzie, who is a serious producer and host at FinTech Finance. So Douglas writes, or actually shoots, <laughs> videos about FinTechs and does a lot of top-level executive interviews. So who else, if not Douglas, knows 
everything what's there to know about fintechs from a holistic perspective and I, I'm really looking forward to hear your observations today. Then in the studio with me we have Vitoutas Karalavichus who is a, a co-founder of a number of companies, Bankera, I would say Digital Challenger Bank, uh, Spectrocoin uh, which is a cryptocurrency exchange, uh, licensed electronic money institution Pervask and recently Bankera has won uh, one of the six categories in the hackathon organized by European Commission EU versus crisis with uh, their funding solution for SME so I'm sure that Vitotas will tell more, more about the solution uh, for us today and Kestutis Gargiulis, who is the founder and chief innovation officer of um, award-winning financial um, software company Atronica, most famous, I guess, for your omni-channel banking solution and, and loans origination system. And I know that you are very keen observer of uh, fintech industry trends, so very much looking forward to hear your views. So without further ado, let me start and I'd like to kick off with the kind of warm-up question. Um, before the crisis, I guess it was kind of common belief that fintechs are kind of more flexible, more adaptable, uh, quicker to adjust to different uh, situations in the market to shift their business models. Now looking back into the COVID-19 crisis, would you say that that's the, that's the truth? That's, that's the fact which we could uh, confirm? Maybe I'd like to direct this question to Jesper in the very beginning. Thank you, uh, and thank you for allowing me to be here. I think it's a, it's an excellent question because uh, in these uh, in these complex times where we all face uh, limitations, uh, new limitations on a daily level, um, the digitization of the world has definitely given a. Uh, an incredible opportunity for for fintech um, in comparison to the banks. Uh, I think uh, yes, the answer uh, is um, yes to your question. I think uh, fintech, in in many ways, in many situations, has taken this opportunity, has proven that they they're ready for it. Um, uh, and especially, uh, it's always easier with a good comparison because uh, we have over these last three months seen the panic um, uh, within the traditional banking sector um, and, and, and seen the bank really abuse situations, especially for SMEs, um, where uh, they have suddenly come out and questioned long-standing loans and asking people uh, uh, for uh, written responses to how are you going to recover uh, your, your, your current losses. And um, this is at a point where Nobody really knew what was going to happen uh, tomorrow. Nobody knew when the lockdown would be open. Nobody knew what was going to happen next. So I think uh, in between the two, you know, that we have on one side uh, the fintechs that is uh, born as a digital entity and the traditional banks that just uh, did not react well to, um, to this situation. Vito, would you agree? And also maybe now it's a good opportunity for you to comment on your solution, what you have developed during the hackathon. So yes, I would agree, but also I think like in general there was not so much innovation during the lockdown because it was too short. And for innovation, especially in finance and technology to happen, you need more than three or two months. But I think the fintech, as we know it, not like, because fintech is a very wide area, but like fintech, as we know it, about the business who are facing the clients online and they avoid the brick and mortar uh, chains and so on. Uh, they actually, they're already prepared for the kind of a lockdown scenario when people don't need to have a physical presence, they don't need to visit a branch, they don't need to use cash. And I think it was a great kind of like a great adoption of fintech solutions in general market, as before e-commerce and so on, so on. Uh, and I would actually like, like to comment on the point about the, that SMEs were left, were left over from the, from the government support because, and especially the SMEs who were not leveraged extremely well. Mm -hmm. Because, because uh, like if you look at the, all the most of the stimulus packages to help society, uh, economists to survive their uh, 
lockdown. It was more or less given to prolong the existing uh, outstanding debt obligations, uh, like not to have like and also have the banks to actually not to have like a bad debts at least for the next six or three months. And actually, the companies who actually were not were not leveraged, were not didn't get like the outstanding debt, they actually fell uh, were hit the hardest because now it's very hard to get a new loan because the financial institutions are neglecting to get a loan. And I think that's the place where fintechs can come in and actually coming in. Uh, despite from our solution, we also like solutions when people are issuing their prepaid vouchers online on the fintech platforms, then you can actually come back to the sh restaurant or bar later on and use that voucher to to buy a drink while giving the cash now. Like uh, now, And we, are, we also looked from Bankera side, we also looked for a similar solution. So we wanted actually to fix the potential breakdown of the supply chain at the earliest phase, where the retailer is actually not able to pay the suppliers. And the suppliers are not in the motivation to do that, but we cannot give a, provide a cash to them because we also like a short of cash. So we should we develop a solution when we issue the loans by the guarantee of both the supplier and the buyer, trying to fix the supply chain at the earliest phase, and like giving motivation of all all the participants of the economy to actually to try to wait and prolong until the lockdown is over, or we transform the economy, which is sustainable in the case of lockdown, if we have to say for let's say next like two years or five years, because we still don't know. Okay. Thanks. So is your solution, which you have developed for this hackathon, is, is it now live and kicking? Are you kind of, was it developed only for the purpose of the hackathon or or do you plan to, to go live with it and to keep so, it running? Yeah. So the hackathon was actually a good uh, exercise for our company to make things quicker inside, inside, our, inside, inside our house because the lending, especially for the SMEs, was always on our roadmap, the next thing to come. And the Gagaton of the situation was a, it's a good opportunity for us to enter the market. So actually, I think we saved at least a couple of months by building the solution, and we're expecting to be live in July. Uh, so the Gagaton of the situation actually was a good pressure for, the, for us, for the company, for the team, to focus and to deliver it quicker than we were planning naturally. Okay, okay, thanks. All right, so I guess uh, SME lending was one of the areas which uh, popped up during the crisis where, where fintechs could... Uh, innovate and develop their solutions. What else? Uh, Douglas, I mean, looking, you meet a lot of executives, you do a lot of, of interviews. What else do you see? Have you, have, what, what sort of innovations or new business models, new products have you observed uh, during these, um, your meetings with, with executives? Yeah. Um, so from my perspective, I, I guess it wouldn't really be so much as, as new technology, rather finally putting in place existing technologies that maybe should have been leveraged um, a couple of years ago. I've seen a lot more um, impetus in cloud-based technologies um, and customer-facing um, and customer experience technologies and fintechs coming forward. Um, and that's kind of pushed itself as well, I'd say, into a lot of the, the kind of smaller fintech banks as well. Um, moving into, uh, going back to the, the lending solution as well, we start, I've started to see um, a couple more fintech banks, like uh, Varen Gold, um, look into actually starting to create lending suites that are, uh, that are far more capable and uh, based off cloud-based solutions and marketplaces um, that maybe should have been leveraged by some of the high street banks and, and other fintechs earlier. Um, so I'd definitely say from, from that perspective, cloud-based technologies and, and uh, machine learning, um, especially to, to really mitigate some of the risk that the fact that numerous um, organizations around the world are now working from home, um, especially payment uh, or fintechs. Um, and so the KYC and a AML regulations, they still need to comply. So I think we're going to see a, a stronger um, kind of investment in terms of cloud-based technologies um, and, and KYC technologies. Okay, thanks. Kestuti, would you like to elaborate more on that? What, what are your observations? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, it's, it's very interesting uh, if we are comparing the previous crisis which was in year 2008 actually mm -hmm. all the banks were blamed after that that they built this this crisis now the situation is quite is quite difficult banks have 
a lot of liquidity and they are much more prepared, of course. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I see that in the nearest future, the banks will be judged um, uh, by, by their actions. Uh, because now, mm -hmm. now we see the rise of overdrafts and, uh, and, and other fees for, for, for services, especially directed to those companies which are, who, which are in trouble, and especially SMEs. But SMEs in, in previous times as well uh, was, was something that everybody were, were talking about, the SMEs as a segment, but nobody had right tools or right, or right approach or how to serve those, those SME companies. It was so quite a difficult, actually, actually segment in the, in the market. And the same is now, especially when they face a lot of, a lot of problems. But um, if we talk about, about the readiness and preparedness towards um, a new crisis or this so current crisis yes all the all the fintechs and all those smaller companies are much more prepared from the organizational structures maybe from the mm -hmm. organization organizational part of their of their of their business so because they are agile and they are fast and they have new new mm -hmm. infrastructures but they are lacking uh, um, trust maybe or because we saw that uh, a lot of clients during the um, this so current crisis moved back to to incumbent banks and to the safe haven because they 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 are still alive and they are big and they will not fail actually mm -hmm. so uh, we see this part uh, of 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 movement and and when when it comes to innovations we see a lot of interesting stuff actually those small startups of course are jumped into the lending space um, or helping governments to, to to deliver new funding packages and and etc but um, but on the other hand big players like like amazon google now entering the same fintech space and they are not targeting the banking sector actually they will not become banks mm. but they are going to become and they are becoming actually now a new banking technology vendor and there will be a dramatic shift in the coming years i guess that when google amazon and others will start to provide and they already are doing this providing technology and platforms for banks there is a very interesting topic to talk about these big players as well. Okay, okay, thanks. So basically what I hear both of you saying that not so much groundbreaking new innovations, but the rather acceleration of certain trends which existed before, right? But they were kind of accelerated during the crisis and maybe you know, some uh, some shortcuts were made and, and companies faster implemented their kind of ideas and, and technologies maybe in order to, well, protect themselves or to capitalize uh, during this, uh, this crisis, right? Definitely. Yes, right. Well, because uh, COVID crisis is, acts as a catalyzer. All the bad mm -hmm. ideas and not sustainable business model will, f will fail and failing faster. And the good ideas and, and good sustainable business models uh, are going to, to rise mm -hmm. much faster okay. as before. Okay. But let's, let's then explore this a little bit more. Uh, I mean, okay, not so many maybe groundbreaking new innovations, but then Anyway, I think uh, it's noticeable that the market for fintech has kind of expanded a little bit, right? Okay, there are probably we have reached more unbanked people. Uh, you know, probably we have solved number of uh, issues in financial inclusion areas, right? Uh, you know, when people were forced to order groceries online or food online, uh, I think digital payments went uh, 
went up well not so much maybe in volumes but but actually new customers new small businesses adopted uh, a lot uh, more of these uh, solutions would you agree yes i would agree but also like I'd like to make another point. Okay. Uh, the point is like, I think like, as we all agree that like FinTech was already prepared for these circumstances, even they never thought about that. But like FinTech was ready for the lockdown and for social distancing uh, from the client perspective. But there's also another perspective in each business is the employees and back office. And I think like, at least like from my company's experience, and I think it's for all the companies, what was the biggest kind of challenge and the change in the, in the culture was actually the remote work okay. because FinTech was not the, the, the area in which you actually can uh, allow the remote work at like at high scale because of the security issues. So I think a lot of like essential cyber security things we have we have, we have been done in the last three months just to enable the remote work. And I think that was kind of a main one of the main like innovation adoption of innovation to the fintech. Uh, no, not adopt, adopting the fintech or to the by the clients. Okay. So I think the keeper security and remote work and like that change that like now you companies will be more flexible to hire people in remote uh, locations in different offices, not like trying to have everyone house to have like this physical firewall, mm -hmm. physical protection. I think there's going to be also a change for Windows itself. Okay. So that's something what probably has changed for most of the companies over the last three months from back office. Yeah. All right. All right. Have we seen yeah, any agree. new... Douglas, would you like to comment more on that? So, I mean, um, I've, I've got an example, actually. Um, and I brought this up in an interview I had um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, it, talking about um, working from home has been so important for, for everyone. But um, it's really shown how the fintechs have actually succeeded more in better ways and more ways than a lot of other verticals. Um, I was speaking to a Mexican um, Mexican fintech bank, CLAR. And they were able to um, completely put their entire company working from home within a day. And I think that's, that comes about because of, you know, people in fintech are typically very tech savvy. And as a result, they can action these far quicker than maybe many other variables. So if we are, you know, the topic of the panel is to discuss how well fintech has done. Just from that anecdote alone, I think that's, you know, a good um, sign showing how flexible these fintech banks at least can be, despite maybe some of the other larger fintech banks like Monzo, for instance, struggling yeah. with, to kind of mitigate the fact that they mitigate their scale and how far they had come in the time period um, over the last half a decade, for instance, um, to where they are now, um, shows that potentially they are more. They almost become like a, a legacy bank in, in a regard, um, which is yeah, unfortunate. But you know, obviously, I, I think it, it shows uh, you know, the fact that the fintech banks have done uh, done pretty well there. Okay. That, that brings us to maybe slightly different question, slightly off topic, but, but Jesper, I wonder if you could um, um, help me to, to understand. So, you know, before the COVID crisis, money was kind of pouring into the fintech industry. It was enough to have a fintech uh, written somewhere. Um, Okay, <laughs> uh, pouring into the um, fintech industry, but uh, now the situation is um, uh, now the situation is uh, what I hear different. We've seen a trend already slightly before the crisis that both volumes and number of deals. Um, uh, in the fintech industry was going down. Now, I wonder how this COVID-19 crisis will affect investors' um, mindset. And um, Jesper, would you say that in the future we will see less of the fintech startups and only those who have already developed substantial customer base and, and probably have uh, uh, sufficient income will survive? No, I think um, I think uh, as uh, as you also just 
talking about uh, just before I fell out. But um, uh, what has really what has really happened uh, in this, what I find uh, as a dramatic change, is the, not only has market share has, uh, changed in terms of consumer loans, etc., but um, it might not be many percentages that we're talking about now, but it, it's really a dramatic change in terms of uh, tendency, and especially in terms of trust. Um, as you also talked about, this um, symptomatic change of now suddenly it is uh, politically correct with uh, remote work, which was uh, before COVID-19. It was something exotic for us in, in fintech maybe, but uh, for the general consumer, it was, um, and, uh, you know, in B2B, it was something that was considered um, uh, not not normal. And uh, suddenly now it is normal. This trust to fintech and uh, other uh, entities um, has really, has really changed. Uh, so that means that um, with the manifestation of market shares with the change of uh, uh, behavior um, and uh, uh, you will see that uh, this this will drive more investment into fintech for sure um, personally I'm looking at uh, more maybe maybe long term um, opportunities um, such as where do we see the next credit bureaus uh, popping up? Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I see it both in Asia and um, in Europe and, and U.S. tendencies to, to data-driven um, uh, businesses which uh, are, are fighting to take that space. And uh, I just think that this has really given... Uh, a, a, a further strength to um, what uh, before might have been generally known investor crazy, you know, investor circles that um, you know fintech uh, is still to come, and I think with COVID nineteen, it is here. Okay, thanks. Thank Can I um, follow on from that? Sure, Douglas. Just in terms of the um, uh, following on from uh, just was uh, talk about trust. Um, I actually got sent a study earlier today, uh, literally today, uh, which was uh, brilliant for me, shall I say. Um, but uh, within the study, they found that um, a lot of technology companies had found that by working from home uh, religiously and unanimously, they'd found an increase um, of a rise of productivity in software development of 30 percent um, within their organization. Um, and I mean, that is a huge, huge increase um, in three months. Um, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of other organizations and a lot of other industries and verticals would be jealous of that. Um, the one thing that they did find um, is that new software, um, big kind of releases suddenly became a lot harder to do. Um, but it was uh, what I found really interesting was that, that notion of trust and the fact that people didn't have to commute or spend energy going to various different places or interacting with other people, being distracted by other people, led to this 30% increase um, in, in software development times. Um, so I, I think that certainly uh, was a really interesting stat I pulled. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. So. Uh... So it sounds uh, optimistic, I would say, what, what you guys are saying, that uh, we should not see any freeze of funding for fintechs in the future due to the, due to the crisis, but rather on the contrary, probably this, uh, this area is very attractive and as it develops, it will attract continuous investment. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, maybe a question to V Totas. Uh, you know, you are a fintech company. Um, what sort of um, opportunities you still see in the current situation or kind of you maybe have certain regret that you have missed? Maybe, you know, if you knew that this would continue for another half a year, a year this lockdown, would you do something different in your company? Would you, would you go into certain new product areas, new partnerships? I think regarding the product roadmap, I think it would be more or less the same because still like there are things you want to do quicker, but just because you have a bottleneck of development and so on, you cannot make faster. But I think uh, regarding the remote work and the office culture, 
for I think like, like especially like this beginning of this year we had a lot of like kind of how to say the efforts put on the finding new office and so on. And like when we had the, the lockdown, we eventually found out that like it was just like a more or less a waste of time because we actually work, uh, are also working much more efficiently from from home because we, as I say, we have more less office drama because usually when you office you have like small things, you have like you know something is missing from the kitchen, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And then when everyone's working at home, you actually are more work focused, and I think people are happy because they can spend more time with family, so on. Because I think like you, you want to spend your time with your colleagues professionally, but usually we, we shouldn't, we not, not, you're not always seeing them your best friends. So actually having this mix when you have like a coffee break with your family, with your kids, but you actually you have your professional environment with people who are very competent and you can just switch on, in your, in your, on, your, on, your, on your computer and just lock in your room. Mm -hmm. And then you can just leave in one second back to your family. I think that's, that's actually what empowers people and makes mm -hmm. them love the job more and makes mm -hmm. them more e effective. Okay. On the other hand, yes, I think like what what the opportunity which was probably missed by us, but just missed because of the uh, you cannot do everything in one in one mm -hmm. day. It's actually more about focusing about online payments and payment processing, because the lockdown was actually a huge huge potential for the new e-commerce and so on. Especially in March and April, we saw a lot of mm. uh, e -sh uh, shops getting online and getting online in let's say very old school ways when we just taking the orders on Facebook and then we are trying to build the e-shops in parallel and which are rolling down now. So I think yeah. that was yeah. one of the opportunities we missed. Okay, I see. Thanks. I'll take one question from the audience. So um, the question is as follows, that uh, most innovations, especially tools which help dealing with COVID-19, need a lot of data. Have you noticed any progress in opening up or providing more data across Europe and other regions? Kestuti, maybe you'd like to Actually, take that. Actually, yes, and there are a lot of examples, actually. I, I still remember it was almost a month ago, maybe, when NASA uh, launched uh, a new hackathon, Space Apps, uh, which was dedicated to COVID, um, to COVID uh, crisis and problems, and, and all the developers and all the all the teams who who participated uh, were using the open data from NASA uh, and they opened a lot of APIs and they allowed to access all the data all the data th they have but when it comes to uh, other providers or for example now I I've already mentioned uh, Google but Google who is becoming a platform a front-end and technological vendor for banks Mm -hmm. around the world because they know everything about the customers and you can uh, and leveraging this front end and leveraging their uh, ai capabilities machine learning capabilities and um, and the knowledge about the customers you can provide intimate actually very hyper personalized uh, products products in the future mm -hmm. so this uh, opening of data is happening uh, from different directions and from different angles starting from open banking initiative which is taking uh, momentum in europe and ending with additional data like nasa and 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 plant platformication uh, when we talk about um, amazon google and etc and everywhere is data behind, actually. It's the air for, for, for financial institutions and new financial services. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe somebody else would like to comment on that? Jesper, Douglas? Yes, um, if I may, um, I think it's, sure. uh, it's a natural, um, I think it's a natural evolution uh, with the um, uh, access to, to more access to data. I think uh, the, uh, in this, this consciousness that is, uh, has been driven uh, in, in, in our behavior, you know, through, we're basically turning uh, the new limitations into a new uh, minimal living and uh, with a focus on, 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 uh, the positive side of uh, what uh, is, is really a, a, a challenging um, change, but for the millennials, this is you know they, 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 this is normal, and um, uh, also for millennials, it's you know it comes with blockchain, the whole open source tendency. I think uh, I think this it's it's the, the data openness with the data is is, is natural, and it's, it's it's really one of the great things that uh, COVID nineteen has driven through societies. Okay, 
Okay, thanks. Um, we have one more question uh, to Vitotas. Uh, you mentioned some of the cybersecurity issues and solutions. Uh, and the question asks, could you, could you specify some? So what I meant, that mainly reflected to the remote work, so it reflected to the virtual private networks infrastructure, especially like enabling the second factor authentication for employees who are logging to the system, as well as the monitoring of the actions of the employees on internal system. So it's more or less about the, the security measures which most companies and we had before that, but we're not uh, using them at, let's say, the full capacity because the, like, the, the potential risk was smaller than having like, all the employees, special employees who are working with sensitive data, working remotely. So it's more or less about kind of uh, fixing the infrastructure to its maximum potential. Mm -hmm. And what, what I meant by that technology is more or less about the having the secure second factor certificators for remote work, so you actually know that it's your employee who's signing off or somebody else. Okay, okay, thanks. Probably that, that brings us to maybe another interesting topic uh, uh, from regulatory perspective. Of course, there are already a lot of um, rules and regulations, directives on, on financial industry, right? But I think this uh, COVID-19 crisis brought up a new um, or refreshed the the question about uh, you know um, contingency planning uh, things like you know like you mentioned now working from home and having full access to your um, uh, systems and and probably that would uh, bring another wave of regulatory if not new regulations, but then at least checkups on, on the fintech industry from regulatory perspective. Would you, Douglas, would you like to comment yeah, on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's an, ex an example of that, um, that that came about within just because of the pandemic. And um, the SCA regulation or the strong, uh, strong customer authentication regulation that was going to um, take place back in May, um, the FCA um, over in the UK actually delayed it um, because it was going to put unnecessary strain, security strain on uh, retail businesses in the UK during a time where they've all been told to shut up their bricks and mortar stores. And um, so, I mean, that's an example of regulatory flexibility um, that has come about because of the um, the pandemic, whereas it was going to become stricter and, and uh, have stronger authentication. They've actually um, decided to postpone it until stores can, can actually reopen. Um, so I think that, that's actually quite interesting where you would assume that the regulations would become stricter. Um, they've actually, well, they're not going to be uh, relaxed. They're, they're just uh, certainly waiting until the, the pandemic is over. Um, but I, I assume that there may be um, movements in terms of online payments, and, and you're certainly still, um, I believe, the, the verdict on whether the, the transformation from target to payment um, over in Europe from the, the Central Bank of Europe, I think, and SWIFT is going to be made um, some point this month. So that will be really interesting to see if, if those payment, um, um, that, if that, that, that changes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Let me take one more question, probably the last question from the audience, and then we will slowly move to the conclusions. So it um, seems that what we're discussed so far looks kind of positive for the fintech industry. So now we are asked to name what was the negative for the fintechs during this COVID crisis. What, uh, what was negative impact? Negative. Well, for example, when we talk about the fintech, <coughs> when we talk about financial technologies, there are a lot of areas where financial technology payments and etc. Are, are embedded into other businesses. For example, uh, in the in the retail stores, which mm -hmm. are uh, available in, in different countries, or so small small shops, convenience stores, and etc. When uh, during the lockdown, they lost almost all the customers because they were not able to go online, uh, even 
taking taking into account that, for example, our customer in Finland, he has more than 1,000 electronic products inside every single store. You can buy physical goods, but also uh, more than 1,000 e-products, like uh, replenishment of iTunes accounts, bill payments, applications for passports, mm -hmm. railway tickets, and etc. But when they lost this uh, this stream of, of bypassers in these stores, okay. the, it, it was a negative impact actually in technologi technologically advanced retail. Okay. Any it's, more? It's, uh, it's just one of the examples. Any more negative examples? <coughs> Well, I mean, backing yes, up that uh, point, I, I believe... Oh, sorry, Jesper, you go. Go ahead, Doug. Well, I, I was just, um, yeah, just uh, b backing up that that, that belief. And I, I think McKinsey, uh, McKinsey's um, global payment uh, report re uh, reported that there will be an 8 to 10% uh, spending decrease um, worldwide, um, which, I mean, is, is going to dramatically um, affect, obviously, lots of retailers, but also... A lot of the fintechs that were facilitating these um, these payments, which had become, I, we often talk about the movement from large batch payments to uh, low value, but um, uh, low value but high volume payments. And obviously, when people aren't paying anymore, um, that's a significant profit margin that's going to affect uh, not just retailers but fintechs alike. Okay, thanks. Yes, yes and I think. Um, yeah, the the uncertainty uh, was really bad for everybody, also for fintech. Um, fear paralyzes, and um, we've seen uh, a lot of delays. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of investment, uh, that uh, people just, just suddenly did not see how the world would um, evolve and uh, in, in, in a lot of circumstances uh, we have lost negotiations, we've lost opportunities because uh, we did not really know what was going on in spite of the fact that we um, that the capital is available and uh, people are ready to move uh, because of this uncertainty uh, both in terms of seller and buyer, uh, everything just uh, stagnates uh, because of the uncertainty and the fear that, it, um, that, that, that this whole pandemic has generated. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, now I'd like to do a quick round and um, ask from all of you some closing remarks. What are your main conclusions and takeaways? You know, starting with Vito Tas. Yeah. Actually, I will also like add like another one, mm. a more angle of a fintech and like the effect in parallel with COVID, because what we see, especially in the United States, because also another part of fintech is the investments and the uh, apps which allows the retail, retail people to invest. And then we also saw the benefits for people in the US for not having a job, for unemployment benefits, which are even higher than wages. Mm. And that's more or less still anecdotal evidence, but I think like it will go to actually a new story when like people getting their help off their money, actually in even investing in the bankrupt companies and so on. So you are having like people without investment knowledge, uh, diverse, like putting the, fun, the money back to the stock market. And I think there's going to be also another effect of this pandemic, which we will study probably after one year or two years. The best example would be like the Robin Hood uh, users having the, buying the shares in Hertz, which has already bankrupted. Mm -hmm. So it's something phenomenal. And like when the bankrupt company is issuing the shares after, uh, like after the bankruptcy. So it's something also phenomenal. And I think it's also due to the fintech, due to the easy access to the markets. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it also has like a negative e effect in general. Okay. Okay. So I think okay. we're still at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's pretty hard to conclude the actual impact for it. But okay. I, think it's, I think it was still anyway, it was a good stir in the cup when we actually so we will come, we will come wiser and prepared for, for even worse conditions. Okay, thank you. Kestuti, what's yeah. your... Okay, my <coughs> I would tell that uh, now it is it was a very good exercise and, and especially a very good uh, background now to, for the future to choose for every fintech and, and for every new financial institution or financial institution which wants to remain afloat actually to choose the right partners the right tools mm -hmm. to to move uh, and digitally transform the businesses. Stop talking, but just start start doing this. Because if you are not uh, changing, then 
you will die, you will die in the future. And I personally just wait and believe a lot that one day the or semantic web and semantic banking, the banking and web with the conscience uh, behind will emerge finally, mm. finally. And we will have this uh, smart web and all the smart and hyper-personalized banking applications and, and real approach towards me instead of having those uh, just banking products. I want to live my life and just don't think about the banking <laughs> banking products. I want to see this embedded, uh, invisible banking services, okay. which complements my life. Okay, so you're hoping for major transformation here. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, Douglas, what are, what are your final comments and conclusions? Um, I guess mine are, are slightly more negative. Uh, but basically, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that the... Uh, in my in my opinion, the uh, the virus has caused um, a lot of uh, what was going to be collaborative approaches between the fintechs and the large institutions, the banks, um, has actually been scuttled. I think a lot of um, banks are going to actually look at trying to maybe um, work on themselves from the inside, and uh, this might actually... Um, might slow down a lot of the the more exciting innovation that we were going to have seen um and actually maybe have a more grounded approach over the last you know okay. more so than the last couple of years we might see shrinking um from a lot of maybe some of the more successful players that we'd seen really hit quite ex you know exciting heights um but hopefully at the end of the day it will mean that banking services are more effective and uh hopefully in, in the long run it will actually be a positive Jesper, what about you? What yeah. are your thoughts? Yes, I think um, as a conclusion for the innovation and the changes that we've had after this uh, pandemic, I think um, one of the absolute uh, uh, most positive things that I've seen is that people have for years been discussing and been tired of the hysteria of the traditional stock exchange. Um, and we see now that uh, during this period, uh, 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 capital has actually been invested into uh, alternative asset exchanges. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, talking about uh, things that was very, very, that was limited to, to very few people, um, like uh, fine and rare wine, um, where, where you've seen capital being because of the uncertainty of the pandemic and how, how are we going to get out of the lockdown is this a crisis for a year or is it five years you know that people were looking to put serious capital to capital into uh, alternative assets which in in good traditional investment strategies maybe before was two percent one percent and suddenly what uh, was augmented, uh, where people were taking serious risk and putting long-term commitment to alternative assets and new exchanges in alternative assets for, uh, I mean, five to ten years. This is very, very interesting, and I think it's healthy. Um, and I think um, and I think this, this uh, lack of trust uh, that is in the traditional stock exchange is just not going to come back immediately. You know, this is a great opportunity for FinTech as well. Thank you very much. So, to summarize, I, I think the my, my main takeaway from this is that maybe we have not seen major innovations, maybe we have not seen new products coming up, but definitely we have seen extension and expansion of fintech market. And um, that's the main conclusion. So, I thank you very much, guys, for being here. Uh, with with us today. Thank you, Thank you, Jesper, us. Douglas, Kostutis, Vitutas. It's been a pleasure, and um, good luck. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Be good. <laughs>
Alex, uh, it's good to see you. And uh, right now, we cut over to you. Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our today's panel. So the, the team we are going to approach and well, rather the, the question the question we're trying to answer to is uh, M and KYC, uh, the new king. So first, thanks a lot, uh, all of you, for making. We have a very diverse panel, geographically speaking. Uh, today we have with, with us uh, Federica Taconia, Senior Managing Director uh, at FTI Consulting, Steve Cock and co-founder uh, of IML Dix and Joseph Weinberg, co-founder of Shift Network and also advisor to UOCD and uh, NFTF. Uh, but I guess, guys, it would be uh, much better if you introduce yourself. So I guess we can take uh, a minute to, uh, to do that. Federica, would you like to start with that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm a partner at a consulting firm, um, FDI Consulting in particular. I run a practice called Financial Services, and we do two things. We work a lot with regulators, um, essentially investigating and creating a safe regulatory environment for um, um, financial, to, to fight financial crime. And we also work with organizations at Different, different size and different types of organizations from very large banks to small fintechs, um, enhancing financial crime controls. And by financial crime, I mean money laundering, terrorist financing, um, KYC, uh, anti-bribery and corruption, and various other types of, of crimes. Um, and in particular, we've been involved in the recent Swedbank um, case investigation. It's in the public domain, but also in um, working with the Maltese um, regulator, for example, creating a stronger financial services um, industry from a financial crime point of view. That's me. Thanks to us. Maybe you could go on with, uh, with you, Steve? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Hancock. I'm director and co-founder of AML Analytics in the UK. Um, I've worked in financial crime compliance for more than 25 years um, as a global head of money laundering prevention. Um, when we set up AML Analytics it, back in 2010, um, it was uh, done so that we can stress test the PEP and sanction screening systems that financial institutions have in place because lots of institutions um, buy the, uh, the, the screening systems um, and use them without knowing how effective they are and also how accurate they are. In addition to looking at those, we also um, validate transaction screening systems as well around the globe um, and we have a global presence. Uh, we, we work with um, sort of all sectors uh, who uh, um, have to screen their client databases. Um, and that's me. Thanks a lot, Steve. And uh, last but not least, uh, we can go on with, with you, uh, Joseph. Uh, special thanks, by the way, for connecting from the Canada, uh, where it's especially early for you. So thanks again for that. No Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm Joseph Weinberg. I'm the co-founder of Shift Network. Um, I've actually taken a bit of a differentiated uh, turn into the kind of KYC and ML space. Uh, I was an early pioneer in the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, so started in Bitcoin in 2010. Uh, I started working on regulations in about three years ago um, as we started to realize that you know digital assets and cryptocurrencies had a, a greater requirement for clarity on the regulatory side. Um, at Shift, we've been working on identity infrastructure for for governments around the world, um, and most recently been working on solutions to the Financial Action Task Force uh, travel rule requirement for the digital asset space. Um, so we've been working on infrastructure kind of across a, a variety of spans of different areas, um, and have been kind of advising the OECD um, and the Secretary of the FATF uh, for kind of the last two to two and a half years as well. Great. Thanks for that. That's really good and, I guess, valuable for our audience to have uh, all of you guys with uh, kind of cross-experience between the prior 
private and public sector within the, the, the MLCFT area. Uh, as to me, very quickly, I'm Alexandre Pinot. I'm uh, acting uh, monitoring reporting officer for Sonect, which is an EMI license in uh, Lithuania. Uh, I'm also board member at the FinTech Hub, which is the, the largest association of uh, licensed FinTech here uh, in Lithuania, which is gaining weight on the, the Lithuanian ecosystem. Uh, and I'm the, 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 the co-chair and, uh, and founding member of the ACAMS uh, Baltic Chapters, uh, which is uh, getting increasingly involved as well with the, the, the FinTech ecosystem here in Lithuania and in, in the Baltics. All right, so now that we uh, know a little bit more uh, about each other, we can we can set the scene quickly. Uh, we're talking FinTech, we're talking AML. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, avoid talking at least quickly about the FinTech boom. Lithuania has been a few years now that uh, the, the policy of attracting foreign companies and attracting FinTech companies in Lithuania is extremely successful. Uh, Lithuania is now the first jurisdiction in terms of number of uh, licensed FinTech in, in continental Europe. Uh, I'm saying continental Europe, but what is happening uh, with the Brexit at the moment uh, might make us, Lithuania, the, the leader in, in, in Europe in general. Uh, all these new entities, uh, obviously, which for a lot of them are, are young startups, need to get acquainted with uh, often heavy and also numerous uh, regulatory requirements, uh, ever-evolving regulatory requirements as well, which are tied to these uh, this, uh, licenses that they acquired, uh, among which, obviously, uh, IML CFC uh, requirement. And in parallel to that, uh, we have, uh, obviously, all the, the IML scandals uh, in the region, in the Baltic, generally speaking. Uh, so just to name a few, we, we've had uh, Danske Bank, we've, we've had Swedbank, as, as Federica was approaching. We've got uh, Evi a bit earlier on. Uh, and many of these were, were linked to a different type of, uh, of uh, deficiency in due diligence process, uh, in, in monitoring process, and we will we'll be approaching that. But the, the consequence, uh, in short of that, is that a lot of these companies which were arriving on the market uh, have been facing and are, are still facing uh, a lot of challenges when it comes to opening bank account and basically get an access to the traditional financial system, which is very paradoxical uh, at a moment where this fintech ecosystem is, is flourishing. So uh, the first topic I wanted to approach with you guys and, and have your, your inputs on is, uh, is, uh, is basically the, these challenges that the fintech company are facing in, in working in partnering with traditional uh, banks, with the traditional financial services industry, and, 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 and notably the, uh, the the recent position of the Bank of Lithuania uh, that that basically uh, stress how important it is for financial traditional financial institution to uh, accept more tech companies. So I guess the first question uh, on the top of that and on this note is uh, how do you think regulators or supervisors around the world, but especially in Europe, can facilitate the development of this partnership and, and the, the increase of the trust between the traditional financial sector and uh, the, the fintech? Maybe we can start with you, Federica? Sure. So I think, first of all, the problem of when a new um, innovative industry appears into an ecosystem, um, it, it can always create a challenge, and in particular a financial crime challenge, for the um, existing financial services industry. That is because new and innovation can easily, more easily be exploited from, from a criminal point of view, um, and also because there is a sort of um, bias, uh, almost a, a subconscious bias, on the part of those who've been working with certain types of features, all of a sudden there is something new that we don't necessarily understand perfectly, and it also creates an element of fear. So there is an element of it, um, of the novelty, which represents a greater risk, but there is also an element of lack of understanding. Lithuania is not in no way alone in this. I spend a lot of time in Malta, where I am helping the regulators and the industry fix this type of problem. In, in Malta, it's been the gambling industry. It's called the gaming industry in Malta. But it's, it's online gaming, online betting. Um, and the jurisdiction has done a lot to attract it. Um, but 
now the big banks are refusing to give bank accounts to the very institutions that they have sought to attract. And that re recalls very, very closely, it reminds me very closely of the, of the Lithuania problem. Um, there is one single solution to that. It's knowledge and understanding of two things. For the industry, there is knowledge and understanding of the true risks that this new fintechs, this new EMIs and FI represent. If we look, for example, at the cases of Swedbank, Danske and others, um, if I look at the mafia money that I follow every single day, they exploit a lot, the um, EMIs and the FIs. But I am pretty sure that if I ask a random person in an EMI, or if I ask a random person at the regulator, they will not be able to articulate to me how that is being abused. So the first element is to really understand how the, the financial crime is operating through those networks. The second thing is for regulators to educate themselves as to the industry and for the big banks to educate themselves as to the industry. We really need to understand what this industry does, how it operates, and therefore where the vulnerabilities can be. I feel that we collectively as a world have wanted um, to go into this, but not many people have spent a lot of time really understanding um, what is needed. And also regulators need to, and banks need to remember the principle of proportionality. A smaller EMI, a smaller FI has a need for a financial crime compliance framework that it's leaner and more agile and smaller than one of a bigger bank. But that does not mean that it needs to be less effective or that it needs to be just of a lower standard. And it should not be assessed in that way. But it's only understanding that there is a difference between the various players and that various players create different risks that we can involve these new players into, into the industry. That's my view. Okay, thanks a lot for that. So basically, uh, I am a fintech, I am a traditional bank, I am aware of the regulatory requirements, uh, the obligation I'm subject to, but it's not enough. I need to know what risk specifically I'm exposed to so that when I am to show my control for a fintech or when I am to assess the risk for a bank, I know what I am dealing with. Very interesting indeed. Maybe Steve, you have, you have any more uh, input on that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it just really goes back to the fact that um, risk assessment is an ongoing process. Um, and regardless of whether you're a bank, an insurer, or whatever sector you're in, risks always change. And so, as, as Fed quite rightly said, it's down to educating yourself as to where the risks are with this particular new sector and where the threats actually are. So it's a, it's a matter of having a continuous process in place to understand the risks. And it's no different to introducing new products and services that you have to understand the risks of those products and services anyway. Um, so taking on clients that come from somewhere that's a bit different from your, from your traditional customer base is, is really no different whatsoever. However, it's just a matter of assessing the risk. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. So really going into it rather than saying, oh, it looks risky, it must be risky, I'm not going for it. Uh, Joseph, anything to, to add on this uh, on this topic? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's a very timely topic. Uh, the digital asset space in particular has been going through this um, in many different facets. And, and I think the, the hardest thing has been is a few different things. Is one is how do you even figure out what the risks are because it's just such a different paradigm change in terms of you know how money is transferred, who your counterparties are, uh, and so I think that that's coming with its own challenges. Um, I largely think that that's what the Financial Action Task Force is trying to do right now is give us some guidance and, and, and some initial kind of you know understanding of saying, hey startups, it's no longer the wild wild west. You need to start you know thinking about you know risk uh, and compliance in these different ways. 
this. Um, and I think on the, on the flip side of that is what we're seeing around the world today is a lot of kind of back and forth and kind of this 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 tug of war between you know banking and, and just simplified account creation and the ability to actually have financial services uh, in a variety of jurisdictions around the world. You just saw India go through a, a very large Supreme Court hearing with the central bank mandating that uh, companies in India, for example, must be given the right to banking. Uh, this is doing reviews across the OCC in, in the United States, and so I think this is all around the world. Everyone's kind of feeling this 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 growing pain of figuring out how do you work with digital assets, how do you work with a new space, how do you mitigate the risks, what are they? Um, and I think it's you know still will take some time to be seen, but uh, but uh, we're definitely seeing that uh, across the board today. So. Yeah, it's a learning process, ongoing learning process from both sides indeed, yeah. But yeah, I feel like it's getting better little by little. Uh, thanks a lot for that. We've talked about uh, the sweat bank case also before. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, a lot has been written in the press. Uh, this has been doing a lot of noise. This is still making a lot of noise, but I, I think it's quite reflecting a lot of uh, these different examples we've seen with more traditional uh, financial institutions, more traditional banks, uh, and 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 the, the, the whole mood uh, in the region uh, in regards to what has been happening in the past and what is re resurging at the, at the moment. So uh, I wanted to start. We, with you, Federica, since you've been working on this case, and, and ask you uh, if very quickly you could tell us uh, what, what what went wrong, uh, if this could have been avoided, and, and how is this being corrected uh, at the moment? And after that, maybe we can bridge it with uh, the fintech uh, ecosystem. Yes. So the question: Could it have? Could it? have been avoided? Yes, absolutely. It, it, it was easy to avoid. There were so many red flags, and not just a sweat bank. I want to make sure that here I'm not talking about a specific case. I'm using that as the example. Everything relating to financial crime that we've seen recently has very common features. Um, the second thing that um, strikes me is that there were very simple things that failed, very small things that were extremely important. And the size of the catastrophe that's happened is so disproportionate compared to the little things. You know, the type of things that failed is people asking, for example, who really owns this company? And if you think of how many firms and institutions today are still struggling to answer that very simple question, hand on heart, can you say that you really know who owns every single company that is your client? Many firms cannot. And therefore, we understand quite how, how risky the current environment in which we live is. Um, there were these very simple, simple things, and they have caused billions of financial crime. Imagine how much that is still going on and how much we are letting happen these days because of very simple questions that we forget to ask, or because, for example, we have a transaction monitoring system in place that takes the box of having transaction monitoring, but actually does not do anything meaningful. It generates perhaps too many alerts and we have to shut them down or our people have to work through them extremely quickly and they don't get any value out of them. These very simple failures are the failures that were behind Swedbank and Danske and so many other cases. So it's important to think that we, each of us playing in the financial services industry, is not immune. It's these little things that are letting big mafia, organized crime, drug, human trafficking happen. And I see that every single day. I can tell you how much you can pay um, to buy a child on the dark web. And that is what Danske and Swedbank and all these other, as other banks have facilitated, amongst other things. The other problem is that it's an international problem. Um, you know, we think of Swedbank as the, the Swedish bank that has caused the problem. But in reality, the point of failure was primarily um, in Estonia and to an extent Lithuania and Latvia. Um, however, the companies that enabled, the shell companies that enabled the process were mostly UK-based and Panama-based. And the money that went through it was mostly Russian and Azerbaijani. So all of a sudden we realized that it's a global problem and that it's not going to be fixed by uh, 
um, kind of pointing the fingers at a jurisdiction, but rather questioning the the system as um, as a whole. Um, when it comes to the fintechs and the smaller the the EMIs, the the smaller financial institutions, um, they are abused every single day. Um, and one particular way in which they are abused is by the um, by organized crime. I spend a lot of time um, investigating mafia-related, Italian mafia-related cases, um, and the financial institutions in particular um, create a very convenient chain of opacity between um, the, the, the mafia, the, the bad person, and the way in which the money needs to come out. Um, they created that chain of opacity, and they are exploited every single day for this reason. And unless they ask the right questions, they will continue to be exploited. Thanks a lot for that. So it's really interesting. Once again, it brings us to the uh, the requirement, the control, the processes, the mitigation measure within an organization, but also the fact of not closing your eyes when you know something is wrong, which has probably been the case in a lot of these, uh, these situations. Uh, Sylvie, is there anything you, you would like to, to add on that? Indeed, yeah, I certainly endorse what, what Fed said. Um, the, the common thread here is um, either lack of or poor systems and controls. Um, she also alluded to um, firms sort of ticking the box to say they have a, um, a transaction monitoring system or they have a PEP and sanction screening system in place. Um, certainly in my experience, we, we see situations where firms have these systems. They've been in place for some time. Time. They were never configured correctly to begin with. Um, then we find the situation where the staff who were involved in the original setup have moved on, and nobody actually knows the rationale as to what, why particular rules were put in place, what parameters were set, etc., etc. Um, so as a result, we find that these systems are certainly um, inefficient, and in many cases, they're, they're inaccurate. And it's it's really just ongoing testing and tuning of these systems to make sure that you're getting the optimum performance from them. We, we see things as, as, as crazy as um, particular programs not being switched on and they wonder why there isn't a match, or everything being matched but the parameters are so loose that there are just massive volumes of, of false positives um, to such an extent that the firm just can't cope with the output. And as, again, Fed alluded to, they end up switching them off and making the problem even bigger. Thanks a lot. So it's really interesting because I guess uh, that, that uh, rings the bell to a lot of fintech. It's not about the uh, top-notch system in terms of ML monitoring uh, or in terms of onboarding. It's about tailoring it to what your risks are and what you're actually doing and constantly, uh, in an ongoing way, reviewing the way it works so that it's tailor-made and make sure that it, it works, which, which is constant work and which is not obvious for uh, for some of the financial institutions. Thanks. Joseph, do you want to, uh, to add up anything to, uh, to these points? I think they explained it pretty well, to be honest. Um, I mean, maybe I'll add, I think that um, as it pertains again to, to kind of our ecosystem, we have a different set of challenges, but I also think the tools that uh, are in place today and are, are being built are, are, are fairly exceptional. Um, you know, it's, the, the question is really around how do you do proper transaction monitoring? And, um, and of course, we do have new challenges around pseudo anonymity and, uh, and understanding who counterparties are uh, across transaction flows. But, um, but I would say that if, you, if you're looking at the digital asset space broadly, um, our transaction monitoring capabilities are, are, are definitely up there, if, if not in some cases more advanced. And so, um, although most people have not been enforcing um, up for the last few years, I would say that that'll start to change. And I think we should start to see these tools also both develop and advance in, in really, really interesting ways and, and probably intersect with the existing infrastructure that's used uh, by traditional financial institutions today. So keep it short. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, so I'd like to bounce back actually on, on what you've just said on the uh, the increased capacity for financial for well anyway uh, more broadly speaking any subject entity to leverage technology uh, to meet their requirement. But even 
I would say beyond that, uh, to manage the risk, which at the end of the day is, is, is as important, if not more important, than just meeting the requirement and ticking the, the box. Uh, there are a lot of discussion uh, at the moment, which I, I personally love. I, I find that really passionating uh, about supervisory technology, sub-tech as we refer to it. So basically the use of technology directly by supervisor to enhance, make better their risk-based approach and their uh, efficiency in supervising the market participants. Now we, we have a lot of regulators in Europe, but also throughout the world, uh, that have access to much more transactional data that they uh, used to have, either because they have a direct view on the uh, payment system of the market participants, like as in Lithuania we controlling, for example, uh, or because uh, they receive much more data from the market participant. And also in the past, that was something we could not conceive because the volume of data, the volume of transaction was simply too gigantic to even consider acting on it. Now, this is something that technology enables us and the regulator to do. So uh, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, is first, and I mean, to be more specific, if we speak about transaction, do you think regulator and supervisor in Europe, but around the world are ready for that, ready, ready to use the technology for directly uh, su supervising the market participant? I guess we, we can start with you, Joseph, this time and to change a bit the, the, the round, the, the turn of the table. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's already happening today in, in most cases, at least. Um, chain analysis and other tools like that have been widely used by law enforcement around the world. Financial intelligence units are, if not integrated already, fairly well close to integrating. Um, I mean, I think some countries have a bit of catch up in, 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 in trying to figure out how exactly to use these tools, but, um, but I would largely say that they're in place and being used today. Um, I think anything outside of on-chain transaction monitoring is not quite there in its development yet. I think it'll be you know a little while longer as we see the market mature before we understand what other tools are really needed. Um, and that really depends on you know what aspects of the industry you're looking at. Um, but I think for the most part, we've been focusing on you know on-chain analytics, public blockchain networks, and from that perspective, I think they're fairly well advanced and that most people are using them. Uh, and we've already seen cases of you know people being caught by the FBI and different you know uh, departments and agencies around the world uh, for you know, actually uh, money laundering and terrorist financing. So uh, I think it's happening and I think it's the right approach. And I think that we'll see more of that in, you know, the, the, the mid to short term. So hopefully I hope so too. Steve, anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, financial institutions around the world are already providing a vast amount of data to regulators, um, and they're using automated systems to actually capture the information. So it, it makes perfect sense for, for this to be the next step. Um, certainly from my experience, regulators are, are certainly getting there. Um, Quite rightly, as was just said, you know, there's still some work to do, but we are are seeing them getting there. Um, we've certainly been involved, for example, in thematic review work where we've we've worked on behalf of regulators to to, to actually um, look at systems that uh, institutions have in place, provide that information to regulators. So it, it, it's certainly something that they're far more focused on, and we're just going to see more and more of it, and quite rightly too. Federica, do you want to add an, an input? Yes, I mean, I completely agree with everything that's been said. Um, regulators are certainly moving in that direction. Not all regulators are there. Certainly in the blockchain space, um, this is much more in existence than it is in the fiat world. But I think it is imperative for regulators that they get there also in the, in the fiat space. And I am working with a particular European regulator to create this environment of essentially uh, cross-market surveillance, so to speak from an economic crimes point of view. Um, the reason why it is important, it's because a transaction on its own um, may not be suspicious, and that is what we need to know from a financial crime point of view. But that transaction, if we start seeing it in the context of what is happening with other transactions, the same individual or associated individuals um, in other parts of the financial services sector, then all of a sudden the penny drops and it makes sense and the transaction becomes suspicious. And that ability it's only with the regulators, a bank or a financial institution, we'll always see a limited picture. Regulators are sitting on a gold mine of information, and it is important, it's absolutely vital 
level that they use it and they make something with it. Definitely, yeah. With this consolidation, we're definitely uh, blind, yeah. Uh, so we've talked about the well, the willingness and the fact that some regulators and supervisors around the world are already doing that. So we already have success story, we are especially in the, the, the crypto uh, uh, area. Uh, now, when it comes to um, market participants, when it comes to obliged entities, do you think they're ready to basically open their books and be absolutely transparent to the regulators? Uh, we, we can start with you maybe, Joseph. Um, I mean, in our ecosystem, it's a bit of a, even more, a, I'd say a larger challenge. It's the question of what jurisdiction do you even hold? Um, and so I think that that's largely what we're dealing with today is, uh, with the exception of a very few, you have some largest, you know, uh, players and ecosystem participants uh, in our ecosystem where we're struggling to understand where your jurisdiction is, um, let alone then being able to say jurisdictions asking, of course, for enhanced due diligence and everything else. Um, but I largely think that the, 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 uh, uh, the Western participants and actors, I think that that's a position that they're already doing. Um, you know, I think the majority of the largest Bitcoin exchanges, at least in, in kind of North America and, and, and largely in Western Europe, uh, have been, you know, very helpful to regulators and trying to work together to, you know, to, to find solutions to problems, to help them understand and learn better uh, across the ecosystem. Uh, and of course, that would come with being able to open their books uh, and, you know, across enhanced due diligence as well. So um, probably more relevant to the traditional space, I would say. Thanks. Steve, what, what do you think on this one? I, I would agree completely with what Joseph said. I think the, the only issue um, really is data protection legislation, uh, which sometimes can prevent sharing of information. Um, even when I worked for uh, a global group, um, we had problems with sharing information in certain jurisdictions that the, the data couldn't actually leave that particular jurisdiction. Um, and, and it, obviously created a problem. And if that, that's a problem just within one financial group, then it's certainly going to be a problem if we're looking across you know, the, the entire industry. Thanks, thanks a lot. Fereke, do you want to, to conclude on, on this topic? Yes, I, I guess my, my perspective on this is that um, when firms perhaps cannot physically open their books and say to the regulator, just look at what I do as I do it, because I understand why that might pose an operational quite before a legal challenge. Um, but I, the, the, the transparency and the openness of engaging with regulators can fill some of the gaps. And I must say that I have worked with jurisdictions, with different jurisdictions, and seen how that different approach really makes a difference to um, how successful a jurisdiction is in fighting financial crime. Uh, the jurisdictions where um, firms strongly collaborate with regulators, uh, regulators are definitely more successful. Thanks. Uh, we only have two minutes left. Uh, that was a lot to discuss. We probably have a lot more to say. So what I will propose you is that we, we wrap it up. Uh, and well, to get back on the initial question and the title uh, of, uh, of, of our panel, uh, IML uh, and KYC, the, the, the new king, when I heard the topic, uh, I smiled, to be honest, thinking, uh, it's interesting. We're going to speak at the, the FinTech Week, and uh, to me, IML and FinTech, they, they just cannot be taken uh, separately for the simple reason that, to me, that the, the IML is just the, the essence of what differentiates the traditional banking, uh, the traditional financial services from what we call FinTech. If you take the onboarding, uh, if you take the, the KYC, the ID verification, uh, to me, that's, that's exactly what makes it different, the fact that FinTech does it remotely, does it online, does it uh, faster, does it while leverage, leveraging technology, is what makes FinTech FinTech uh, in comparison to traditional banking, where you add and you still have some time to uh, go physically to a branch to open an account, to refresh your account, 
A month ago, my French bank asked me to send them a copy of my KYC by post office. Uh, I'm, I'm not joking. So to me, that's 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 I know is the is the and the way it's done, the way it evolved is, is just the essence of what is fintech uh, nowadays. So uh, yeah, I am KYC, the, the new king definitely in, in fintech, but I would not say the the new one. I would say the, it has always been uh, a, a big part of it. Uh, Joseph, do you, do you want to uh, wrap it up? Yeah, um, on the on the king side, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that the compliance regulations is really important. Um, uh, of course, it's. I think from our ecosystem's perspective, it's about mass adoption, and I think that's what everyone's been trying to understand for the last few years. And so, whatever it is that gets digital assets, you know, into a much more safe environment that allows us to better, you know, build new products and services, uh, leverage the existing systems as well, and make them more secure and more, you know, um, streamlined, I think, across the board is really, you know, the, the intent of, of technology. Um, and so however we can kind of do that and, and, and enable that to happen in a much faster way uh, globally is, I think, really important. And that's really, I think, what the, the mission and mandate of a lot of our ecosystem is. And so um, I, I think on the other side of that, too, is it's also about how we use new types of infrastructure and new types of technologies to to build things that we've never been able to build before. Um, we've been working on solutions to the Financial Action Task Force travel rule, which if you were to look at the solutions today, they look nothing like how SWIFT operates today. These are fully digitalized systems, being able to autonomously determine who your counterparties are and sharing data. Uh, a system like that is just impossible in, the, in a traditional context. Um, and so I really think that we can also bring a lot of experience and innovation and new thinking into how technology is built in the compliance space and, and really make these systems lightweight, really easy to use and, uh, and hopefully better than the ones that we've had before. So. Right. Thanks a lot. Steve, do you, do you want to conclude on your side? Yeah, my conclusion would just be for, for firms really to ensure that the systems and the controls that they have in place suit the risks and are fit for purpose. And when we're talking about automated systems and, and reg tech, um, that it, they are configured properly, that you have ongoing testing in place so that they are accurate, that, that they are um doing the job you expect them to do without unnecessarily and causing lots and lots of noise and false positives uh, that just creates more work. So, um, I mean, really just in summary, we conducted a thematic review on behalf of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the conclusion that their director of enforcement announced when they had their feedback um, conference was that most systems are working well, uh, but they generate far too much noise. And if time can be spent on reducing that noise, you've got more time to be working on the real financial crime issues. Right. Right. Indeed, yeah. yeah. I think we're going to in the right direction as well, but it's going to take some time, definitely. Farika, do you want to add something to, to, to wrap it up as well? Yes, I, I completely concur with, with Steve, you know, KYC can be a good king or a bad king. Um, KYC could be us spending a lot of money and time and resources on a lot of convoluted, complicated process and just wasting money, ticking a box, patting ourselves on the back saying, yes, you're doing the right thing, but actually leaving the financial crime environment unchanged, or we could do um, things in a more sm in a smarter way, perhaps spend less money, less resource, fewer resources, and obtain better results. And fintechs, in particular, have a huge opportunity because they are starting from a zero start compared to the bigger banks that are starting from the legacy. They have the technology available, so there's a huge opportunity for fintechs that I genuinely hope they they um, take and they they move forward with that. Right. Thanks a lot. So yeah, IML KYC more of an enabler than a, than a roadblock. If if uh, if well designed, it's smartly thought. That's that's yeah, definitely the the way forward. And I'm very excited about what's what's coming. So thanks a lot, uh, everybody, for taking the time to uh, to be with us today. I really hope uh, we will meet in person next year in in Vilnius. And, uh, on that note, I would like to wish you a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 
Thank you very much to Alex and the panel for an interesting discussion. I do have a personal commitment to Alex. I still owe him a bottle of wine, so when we meet Alex, uh, this is a public commitment from myself that I give you back your bottle of white wine. And right now, uh, it is a pleasure because I have a guest in the studio joining me today. Uh, the CEO of Idemfai, Domantas Chulde, is with me here today. Domantas, good to see you. Uh, nice. A germ-free hello. And uh, so you were listening to the panel. I saw uh, you were kind of attentive standing in front of the screen could you <laughs> could you share a little bit more maybe reflections on what has been said and maybe there's something you'd like to add yeah so firstly i would like to say thank you for uh, for the great discussion um actually all uh, great topics was already discussed it yeah uh, i don't uh, see what i can add on the top of that um but i guess i can uh, a little bit elaborate more on the know your customer process uh what the challenges uh we currently seeing in the market um, so I guess it would be great to to standardize uh, to make the standard of like, no, a customer process um, in the European Union uh, because currently in every country uh, we, we have the different uh, no, uh, customer process for example in the Germany uh, we have uh, only live agent uh, identity verification process. Uh, for example, in the United Kingdom, we have only a, a photo verification process. That means you can verify your customers doing the uh, sending the, uh, the image of your passport through the email. Uh, for example, in Fena, we have real-time identity verification process, uh, which means you have to take the picture of your ID document um, in real time, take uh, your picture of your selfie in the real time. Um, so that differences actually make, um, in, in one market it is more secure, in another market it is less secure, and uh, I think it would be a brilliant idea to, to, to create the standard in the market. Uh, 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 no, a customer standard in the market, uh, 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 which would be in all the European Union countries. Um, that would be that would make actually a much better uh, user experience and uh, and a much safer environment. Uh, also, it would make the much easier life for the companies like the Identify uh, while we are providing the identity verification solutions. Um, so currently, for example, um, we are providing uh, identity verification solution in the real time. Um, so, for example, uh, to provide in the Germany, we, we still need to uh, do the, another software uh, to, develop, to develop and to enter into the markets. So, yeah. So, effectively, we're saying that uh, all probably in the entire European Union still has its own ways of uh, yeah. the identity process, right? Yes, so, that's right. So, yes. effectively, what we're saying is for you to be able to scale, it would be much better to have kind of a unified sort of approach yes, in the entire definitely. Union, right? Yes, uh, exactly, yes. And, uh, as well as I mentioned, it will be much safer, yeah, because, well, for example, the, the verification method which is using in the United Kingdom or in the USA, for example, we are using the, the, pass, the image verification. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really insecure method. So, and we're also saying that we can't really issue a single instruction to, to an, an end user, an end consumer, right? You have to click on your own country and follow the exact same procedures yeah, that yeah, you need exactly. to. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Um, just a yeah. quick move kind of slightly, uh, as you specialize in uh, AML partly as well, uh, I understand uh, uh, there are two key kind of pieces of legislation, AML D4 and AML D5, what are the main differences between the two and how do you stay compliant with AML D5? Yeah, so actually the, the, the differences, uh, I would list the main differences would be that uh, MLD5 introduced that the, the cryptocurrency ex exchange companies and virtual currency companies should comply with AML uh, requirements. Uh, that means that we must monitor their uh, users, uh, monitor their transactions, uh, fill the SARS, suspicious activity reports, um, also to verify their customers. Um, so yeah, so um, to, to comply with female D5, it's actually, you, as I said, you have to monitor the users, uh, monitor, the, monitor their transactions, um, spot the suspicious transactions, um, monitor the politically exposed persons um, and sanctions uh, lists. So do that, the uh, recommendation to do that is uh, per every transaction. So if a customer is trying to top up their account or to transfer uh, money to the friend, yes, yeah, so, uh, 
where recommendation is to do the political expose and person check and sanction person check where every every transaction um, also uh, not, not mentioned it that uh, no a customer uh, process is, is necessary so you must to verify your customers um, so yeah so compli uh, completing these uh, steps it's uh, actually enough uh, to comply with MLD5 and uh, are we saying that AMLD5 is actually uh, a kind of segue on to a kind of better approach than we used to have? Uh, sorry, can you... Uh, so, yeah, just a kind of, uh, uh, in the general kind of uh, view of the AMLD5, is it, uh, do companies find it more difficult to comply with it? Uh, I guess uh, it is... Uh Maybe not uh, difficult to comply with. It's really similar, similar MLD5 to MLD4. Um, as I said, the main difference is maybe it's that the uh, cryptocurrencies has to be uh, is forced to comply with it. Um, also, the, um, the transaction amounts was reduced uh, on MLD5. Uh, you you must perform the uh, ML check on 250 euro per transaction. Um, on, on MLD5. Uh, uh, the, trans uh, the, uh, the amount was reduced to 150. Uh, if you do the online transaction, so you must uh, verify the customer if you do the 50 euro transaction. So yeah, so it's not 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 very not big change. Super difficult, right? <laughs> okay, understood. Right. Um, so Lithuania Financial Crime Investigation Institution, uh, from remote identity verification recommendations, has officially removed the requirement to take photos of the passport cover. Do you think that was a uh, it was a good idea? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it was a good idea. We also have the, the discussion with FNTT about this uh, requirement uh, because we followed with this requirement maybe more than a year, um, and then we, def uh, we detected that the users uh, do not understand clearly what we have to make the photo of, and in, mo in most cases we were um, taking the photo of a visa page uh, or they take the photo of a main passport page and in such uh, in such verifications we, we even the verification was legit uh, everything was all right but we must to decline such verifications to, to comply with uh, FFNTT requirements um, so yes yeah, so we had the discussion also the, the FFNTT uh, arguments that uh, was that uh, actually you can recognize easier that uh, the passport from which country it is um, from the passport cover um, but also there is really many many places how to identify from which country the passport it is uh, from the main page of passport uh, so yeah so I think it was you know to 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 much additional uh, additional requirement um, and to just to additional click for the users, we know that uh, additional clicks right now for yes. the users is it's, it's, it's it's something uh, that everybody strives to eliminate. Yeah, right? exactly. So the, okay. it was a great idea to remove it. Understood. And then, uh, what are the main reasons why remote identity verification fails, and, and what are the main challenges in this area? Could you speak to that a little bit? Oh, very good question. Um, actually, I can list maybe um, three main reasons uh, why identity verification um, fails. Um, so. The, the first one I think would, would be that the user is still using the old computers uh, with uh, low quality cameras. Uh, what drives to actually when we make a photos of your ID documents and of your faces. Um, so we cannot uh, see the uh, security features, we cannot see the uh, information in the document quite good. So in such cases we, we must decline the verification. Um, yeah, but in second maybe place, uh, I would list that uh, um, human error, I think. Uh, because uh, most of the people, when they're doing a verification, uh, we just, uh, and sometimes we place their finger on, on their name or surname or on their passport, photo, uh, and, and, and we cannot extract the main information. And that also drives to the declined verification. Um, and I think the third would be the lightning. And the, uh, most of users think that uh, when you take, for example, the face picture, making your selfie, uh, most of users leave the lightning on the behind them. Actually, you, what you have to do is to do it for the, the lightning through the, comes from the, from, from the front side. So our face recognition systems then can easily identify your 
face and make the face recognition. So that is, I think, the main three reasons why why verification fails. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Donald is, Donald is giving you uh, real, actual tips on how not to fail the IDNV procedure, which is great, I think. And uh, let's just move on to another question. How hard, uh, and this is actually going to kind of the dark, uh, deepest, darkest issues with identity verification, um, uh, kind of how hard it is, do you think, to get uh, and use another person's identity? Actually, it's uh, yeah, very good question. Um, uh, it's actually really easy to get uh, another person's identity. Uh, you can just uh, uh, log into the black market, and you can buy. Uh, it starts, uh, the, for example, the passport starts from five uh, euros to 10 euros for prices. So you get the image of a real passport of another person. Um, so you get the data the real data of uh, another person. Um, of course, uh, such images is quite uh, hard to use, for example, in Lithuania, because we have real-time identity verification. Um, but such images you can easily use in the UK or USA, uh, because we, we approve uh, 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 image one image verification. Uh, so effectively, just a picture of the passport is sufficed, right, for me to take a small loan or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. For example, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can that you use in the USA, yeah, in in or in UK. Um, but yeah, but it it won't it won't work. For example, in Lithuania, that I like in identify we easily detect such um, uh, fraudulent activities and we denied it instantly. What do you think uh, stops countries from actually moving in a similar direction? that Lithuania, for example, is, right? Where you have the kind of, what, what do you call it, two-factor uh, authentication, right? Or what have you. Well, not necessarily that, but mainly meaning that uh, you would verify the person's identity from two different sources, from two different channels, and other countries don't. What's, yep. do, do you think there's a particular reason behind that? Uh, yeah, I think it's because uh, the AML re regulations was, um, and your customer regulations was introduced in, in, for example, in USA and in UK um, many years ago, and they still have such um, we are still using the old uh, methods uh, what uh, was maybe many years ago was effective um, but for example in Fenia when we uh, we got the remote identity verification uh, uh, recommendations um, it was already developed that uh, it is uh, it is much more secure to use the real-time identity verification that's 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 uh, that's why there is a difference uh, to move uh, to move uh, from the old methods to to new methods. I think it is you know just um, just uh, uh, just you need to uh, accept the laws in the in the yeah. country and and just to uh, train the. Uh, customers train the, the users to, 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 so, to... So effectively what we're saying is that legislation sometimes struggles to keep up with the progress of technology, right? Technology moves much faster than, uh, than, than, than the legislation because it's difficult, it's a part of long deliberations, and it requires a lot of people to get on board, whereas small companies can develop something really quickly, and that's probably where the fruit of their labor is being used by fraudsters and fraudulent yep, activity yep. seekers. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. So, and, and uh, if we sp specifically uh, turn to fintech, um, mm. how do fraudsters, uh, do you think, attack uh, fintech companies? What are the most popular methods? I think the most popular method is when the fraudsters um, gain the access to the credit cards, stolen credit cards, and also it is a uh, quite easy method to get it uh, in the black market. Um, credit cards which doesn't have, uh, for example, a verified by Visa and 3D MasterCard secure codes um, cost from one euro to ten euros, uh, so we buy that credit cards, and we are use uh, we are tra targeting the fintech companies, uh, e-wallets, payment companies, where you can top up your account with a stolen credit card, and for example, transfer the funds to your friend in the same account. For example, in Revolut, yeah, yeah, we can just uh, top up and try to transfer, and then, and for example, we try to cash out the the money from ATM or to buy some goods. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think it's the most popular method and the easiest one. Um, but in this case, identity verification is actually is stopping such fraudulent uh, activities quite well. And, and right now in the market, identity verification is the number one tool to combat with uh, fraudsters.
And for a final question, how can fintechs partner up with Identify to help them out with, and avoid any kind of fraudulent activity? Oh, just to just uh, drop us uh, drop uh, drop in our website and <laughs> just drop us a message. We are open just uh, every day to to consult you and and to find the best solution for you. Thank you. Donald Schulder, ladies and gentlemen, from Identify. And right now we move on to our uh, next panel, uh, Driving the Future of Sustainable Finance. Uh, moderator Alex Gibb, partner at Catalyst Ventures, private equity firm with a range of investments across Europe. Alex has been involved in the fintech ecosystem through various angles for around 15 years now, investing, founding and scaling fintech startups, holding top management positions in leading regional banks, working on governmental level of su uh, to support fintech development and much more. I can see Alex on the stage already. Give him a wave. Hello, Alex. And I pass on the torch to you. Uh, have a productive discussion. Thanks very much. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and a very warm welcome wherever you're tuning in from around the world. I'm really happy to, uh, to be hosting this panel today. Uh, it's a really exciting topic. We've got a fantastic uh, international panel of speakers. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be extremely stimulating. So a very warm welcome uh, to you all to ask questions during the session. We'll be able to answer those uh, live as we uh, as we go along. And uh, we'll have a range of questions for, for the panelists. So, I'd like to, uh, to start off by uh, doing a short introduction uh, to our panelists and uh, just give you a little bit of a flavor of how we're going to structure the coming 45 minutes. So, uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, with me here in the studio uh, Davila Grigiene, who's the CEO of Swedbank uh, here in, uh, in Lithuania. Uh, we also have uh, on the line uh, Otavio Lopez uh, from the IFC, who's uh, Deputy Portfolio Manager at the IFC in Washington, DC. So, a very warm welcome to you from the, uh, from the other side of the pond. Uh, and then we have uh, in London uh, from the EBRD, uh, we have uh, Yatek Kubas. So a uh, very warm welcome to you as well. Unfortunately, we have some technical issues between Vilnius and New York. Uh, so Kisa at the moment uh, was hoping to join us and we're still trying to work on to see if we can uh, bring her back into the discussion uh, at some point. Uh, and Kisa is a senior executive at Refinitiv and a podcast host. So it's also a chance for you to check out her podcast after you've, of course, watched this panel today. So without further ado, let me, uh, let me ask for some, some short introductions. And really, I'd like to get a flavor for, you know, why is sustainable finance uh, interesting for you, uh, my, my panelists? So Davila, tell me, please, a little bit about, you know, what is sustainable finance and, uh, you know, why, what inspires you about it? Hello, everyone. First of all, uh, it's a big pleasure to be on this panel and I congratulate all organizers for this uh, FinTech Week of Lithuania. It's an amazing event. Um, to talk personally, uh, I've been actually um, working in finance field for the last 20 years. Since 2000, I'm in banking, in mostly traditional banking all the time. And um, I, I could say that one of my passions is banking. But uh, about a year ago, I developed a new passion. And actually, this is sustainability. I became very interested in the area overall, not just finance, but overall, because I, I kind of uh, always look for ways to, to contribute further to the societal agenda. And I realized that sustainability is the way to go. And of course, to talk about sustainability, uh, sustainable finance, um, recent events and recent and changes in EU, in European Union, we have a green package and a very dedicated um, uh, overall governance towards driving towards uh, further sustainability. And uh, definitely we will talk more and more about it. And I hope I can share my experience for the last year that I accumulated while researching the topic myself. Super, super. So that's, that sounds really nice, you know, having that, uh, that banking background and then really coming into the sustainability area in the last year. And, uh, and having that passion. Thanks, Davila, and very, very warm welcome once again. So um, uh, over to you then, uh, Otavio. Tell us uh, about you. I know you're both a practitioner and an academic. You've got a lot of experience in this area, so uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your inspiration. Sure, Alex. Can you hear me well? Loud and clear. Perfect. 
Um, so first of all, I'd like to, to thank you and everyone who made this event possible. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here and, and share my experience. For those who don't know me, my name is Otavio and I work at IFC's Treasury, uh, managing IFC's, I'm part of the team who manages IFC's $40 billion in liquidity. Um, and IFC is part of the World Bank Group, which is a, a very relevant player in this arena. Um, I've been, as you said, uh, working and studying uh, sustainable finance. Um, I've been a key person in implementing ESG standards and sustainable um, indicators to our liquidity management. Um, and I've been focusing my doctoral thesis also on sustainable investing. So what, what, what have I learned? And, and I thought, I, I mean, it's, it, this is a short panel, but I thought what could be the messages that I could bring of what have I learned that would be useful? Um, I think to be a better sustainable investor, and this is this is something that I think will um, will connect with everyone uh, in the audience, um, is we, we really need to be focused on the impact. Uh, so I, I started here describing myself and my work, and the, the, the one number I put out is the amount of money that we have assets under management. Um, and, and that's very common in the financial industry. Uh, but I could have started also saying that uh, IFC's Treasury, in the last six years, uh, issued bonds that are expected to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in 18.4 million metric tons. Um, so I, 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 I hope that one day um, we, we go in that direction. Uh, and why am I saying that? Because we tend, even in the sustainable world, to sometimes forget about the impact. Um, and... Um, I hello? think um, it doesn't matter. Hello? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Pardon me. I was I, this is trying Kisa, to reconnect uh, Kisa at the same time, and there's a bit of sound on the line. But uh, but you were just talking about the so, impact, and that's great to, to not to forget that. Yeah. Uh, so continuing, um, the, the impact is very important, and the impact is also very difficult. Um, uh, the financial sector especially, uh, especially is not as close to the real economy as other sectors. So tracing that impact and connecting the dollars being invested in a certain fund or instrument or uh, company with a final impact is not that easy. And what am I talking about when I talk about impact? I'm talking about tons of plastics reduced, uh, amount of water cleaned, uh, number of jobs created, tons of greenhouse gas emissions uh, 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 taken away from, from the atmosphere. Um, or even numbers of trees planted. Asking the right questions is essential. And I think asking about impact and specifically how the impact is calculated is very important and is gonna be very important for um, the sustainable industry going forward. The second point uh, that, uh, that, that I think it's very important um, to share out of uh, the main lessons I learned in my, my recent work and research is that in my opinion, sustainability um, for it to achieve the scale that uh, society and the world requires of it, it has to be uh, connected with financial results. Um, why do I say that? Uh, the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change uh, most recent report concluded that to prevent uh, the worst effects of climate change, we need to get to zero greenhouse gas emissions in every sector uh, within 50 years. That means that a, a very steep upward curve um, will have to flatten and come down in, until 2070 to zero. Um, um, the only way to get to that level of um, uh, impact is if financial markets and capital markets participate in it. Um, so I'll take one or two minutes here just to explain uh, the, the, the three main ways through which um, ESG ratings, green bonds, label bonds, uh, impact investing in general can be connected to financial results. Uh, the first one is through a better performance. Um, there is the saying that all good things go together. So normally a company that has very good ESG ratings, governance, uh, environmental practices is normally the more organized company who will also have better financial results. So that's one. Um, the second one and to me, this is very important and, um, uh, and, and very dear. It's, it's, it's the government regulation and incentives. Um, why do we? Um, why, why do governments um, force cars, uh, impose cars to have uh, um, airbags or seatbelts? Um, uh, there is there is a, a, a 
a social uh, uh, um, benefit to certain policies and requirements. So that's the thing, same thing for um, the environment. Um, I think a lot of people uh, like to criticize um, certain policies from um, um, the government protecting the environment, but it's the same rationale. Um, it might increase lightly prices, uh, but there's a, a, a greater good, um, uh, and, and, and it's a way to put into the prices of goods externalities that right now are not being included. So the last one I mentioned too already, the last one is it's a growing idea in, in the sustainable uh, and impact investing world, which is the idea of climate value at risk. So how will your company or what will the issuer uh, be affected uh, by the increasing um, um, uh, temperature in the world? Um, so with statistical levels, um, we use the value at risk. I don't need to, to explain this in detail. Um, but it's basically a econometric uh, measure where you can come to a value of a certain likelihood of how many losses a company may have. And that's also a way to put a dollar sign into um, um, the issues related to the climate. So, Otavio, that's, uh, that's a really, uh, really, no, really impassioned, uh, you know, sort of call to action. Uh, you know, fantastic that you're laying out some of the ways in which we can actually achieve this. And, uh, you know, I can you know, really sense that passion. So that's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for kicking us off. Let me jump over to, uh, to Yatek in, uh, in London and, and, and just do a short introduction there. Uh, and then we can come back and, uh, and just have a quick review of how we're going to spend the next half an hour together. So Yatek, very warm welcome to you. Just tell us, you know, very, very briefly, you know, your story. What is it that inspires you about sustainability? Hi, guys. Uh Hope you can all hear me and best regards from uh, London. I thought I'm going to sit under the palm tree in London to send a message about the climate change in a way. So that's where the background is from. I'm an associate director at the European Bank for Reconstruction and uh, Development, focusing a lot on capital markets and fintech and started the journey a couple of years ago on the green capital markets as well. You know, EBRD is a development institution and I'm personally very passionate about uh, positive change. And what I think really, if I would say it very personally, what I really think helps me to wake up every morning and force myself uh, to go for the morning run is really the thinking about not only more positive or let's say positive year, but also greener change. And that's what I'm really trying to look at across the project that we are doing as CBRD, including the one that we are implementing at the moment in Lithuania, which I hope we'll have a chance to talk about uh, during the panel. And then one thing that really inspired me to look much more on capital markets and the green business in that regard was a very simple life story that happened to me three years ago. You know, I did my workout and I went to buy a smoothie. So I'm getting a smoothie and I ask a question that now no one of us would ask is, can I get a plastic straw? And I got the look at saying, look, plastic straws are bad for the environment. You're not going to get a plastic straw. That was three years ago. But I got that smoothie in a big plastic cup. And that made me think, uh, what is the perspective we are looking at the finance and green finance? Uh, how actually much broader we should addressing that? And that's what I think is important because Otavio told you a lot about the investment side and the business side, which is great. But there's also much more policy side that I hope we'll be able to emphasize and discuss today that uh, should support that and create a incentives for development of green finance and b also uh, eliminate any barriers that there are and obviously uh, as we could see with the eu level eu green deal and the eu taxonomy there is a lot to now look at and uh, and discuss as well so i look forward to our discussion i'll, I'll stop here and waiting for your questions back to the studio guys Super, thanks, Yatek, and uh, that's been wonderful to hear about. You know, a very personal story. You know, going to the going to get your smoothie and uh, having the whole plastic uh, straw experience, and then being able to take that up to the the policy level, uh, where you can make a real sort of positive change and a greener change, as you said. So uh, let's let's dive into this. So the way the way I'd like to structure the next uh, next half an hour together is to to jump back a little bit uh, and just to touch for our audience to make sure that the concept of sustainable finance is uh, is simple and clear. I think we've got a a very wide, uh, very broad audience listening in today. So it would be great to, to get a, a simplified uh, understanding of what sustainable finance is to get us on the same page to start. Uh, and then if we move on from there, we can actually explore some of the key trends. And then I'm really looking to the panelists to provide some, some great examples, some very concrete examples 
as to uh, how sustainable finance is being lived and, uh, and delivered today. Uh, and then we'll move on then and ask you to gaze into the crystal ball and, uh, and tell us a little bit about the future of sustainable finance and what does that mean. So can we really achieve these targets in the next 15 to 20 years? Uh, can uh, debt and capital markets uh, make, a, make a real difference here? So let's, let's jump into to, to the first question. And I think uh, you know, some of you have touched on this already, especially Otavio, uh, in terms of affecting the bottom line. So, you know, how, what, what are business attitudes in, in, for your target audience? And, and, and how do they really relate sustainable finance to a company's bottom line? So maybe, Yatek, let me throw that back to you uh, from, from, the, from the perspective in London. Uh, sure, thank you. Thank you for that. So if we start at the perspective from London, let me then start with the words that Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, said, which uh, I think resonated with a lot of us. He said, the businesses or companies that are not looking into addressing climate uh, change or climate risk in their business, at some stage in the future, if they neglect it, they're going to go bankrupt. And it really is the statement that I personally adhere to. Why is that? First of all, investors are looking much more towards the ESG element. ESG is environmental social governance. We're looking at the European Union at the moment with a number of policy initiatives. So you set up something which is called EU taxonomy, which now indicates the line of business that can be classified as green uh, and be financed through a number of instruments, including um, green, um, green bonds and green capital markets. If we think about the green capital markets, Last year, we saw something which I haven't seen in any of the other segments of capital market. Green bonds was the fastest growing market uh, in 2019, with 250 new issuers coming to the market to issue green bonds. We are sitting in Lithuania. You guys issued the uh, sovereign green bonds, and there are also energy companies that issue a green bond. So you know that this part of the business is becoming, in a way, uh, the new normal. Obviously, we have to understand what and how we use the proceeds for uh, for the investments that are being financed and how we are actually improving the environment coming to towards eliminating the climate change and being a carbon carbon neutral and that's something that also comes with element of um, of uh, green finance that's not very often is brought to into discussion which is on um, on the reporting side so how the company can report to investors that actually their activities are green or greener, and how those investors can be made aware whether their money are actually going to that side. For us as a bank, so we invest across 38 countries, uh, and last year we invested 10 billion euro. And out of that 46%, so 4.6 billion, we did in uh, green investment. So we have our mm -hmm. internal committee that uh, assesses our investments and, uh, and classifies them as, um, as green. Uh, obviously, we really hope with uh, with the future that this number will will also and the target uh, increase uh, uh, as we see also the client demand. But for this to happen, we also see a lot of need for the policy action to really underline the business to be able to create incentives and barriers. And that's something uh, that we are doing at the moment at Lithuania. And I know our head of office in in the Baltics, Ian Brown, is also listening. Uh, to this panel, where we are working with the Ministry of Finance to support uh, creating the environment that will help, A, the creation of incentives, legal, regulatory, tax-related, for development of green finance, which also includes green capital markets, and elimination of any barriers and transposing the EU taxonomy to the domestic level. And I think this is really, really important. On the other hand, and this is a bit of a provocative thought uh, one of our clients you know in a conversation said something which which also resonated with me and i haven't had a, yet a thought about addressing he says look please do create incentives for green because we are really interested in uh, fostering that agenda but please don't punish us for investing into brown and then the question now means okay what are they really is and going to be the brown investments and are they really going to be punished going forward or sustainability really be going to become the mainstream because we have to maintain the climate and the environment that we have and do not let it worsen, that the brand will not exist anymore. But that's a much more philosophical question uh, going forward. 
well, let's see if we actually have time to get into philosophical, philosophical questions. But Davila, could you share then? Yes, I would like to react as well because I think uh, having incentives is definitely great. Everybody agrees on that, you know. But there is other things that need to be considered. And I think for me, one of the key things that we are watching is consumer sh shift in awareness. Because even uh, five years ago, people would not be able to tell you what sustainability is. And now we, we are more and more aware. And this tells us as a bank to act and, and start shifting our product line, let's say. So last year, we already introduced new products, green leasing for CO2 reduced emission cars. This year, we're preparing green mortgages. Uh, we will have an uh, electric car uh, zero you know kind of uh, emission product as well uh, on a pension fund business we also run quite a substantial business in lithuania um, last year we had a big reform actually and while reform was happening, we figured we could use it for the sustainability angle as well. And uh, with change just in the system, we were able to transform and invest 30% of all our funds towards more sustainable ESG funds, actually. 30% already last year. And a very important thing that I checked yesterday as well, that this still keep performing better than regular funds, so to say. So this is also a very tangible impact to the bottom line. Fantastic example. And, and maybe also just for the uh, for the audience, just to give a sort of uh, an explanation of the mechanics of the green leasing product. So what does that really mean? If somebody comes to the bank and says, I would like a green lease from you, Yes, uh, the cars have to classify by CO2 emission level. If it's below a specific number, it classifies for the product. So basically, and then you have an additional incentive <laughs> in terms of interest rates. So this is great Super. and working out. Mm -hmm. So then the client is actually saving money. They're getting a, a sort yes. of a cheaper lease and they're doing a positive thing for the planet. Yes, Fantastic that's for example. Sure. Mm -hmm. Super. And Otavio, what about from, from your perspective? You know, you've talked a little bit already about the ESG focus on, on, on investment funds from your side. You know, how do you see the sort of the global change? Is there this consumer shift that, uh, that Davila was talking about? Uh, is, is this, you know, filtering through for companies and their bottom line? Uh, tell us a little bit more from your perspective, please. Sure. Um... I completely agree with Dovila. I think what, what Dovila brought up in terms of consumer shift has been the driving force um, um, for a, a, a major shift in uh, funds policies uh, and banks policies, and we could even say in, in, in governmental policies. Um, is that enough, though? So that, 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 that's the question. I think it's a strong force and it's coming. But uh, the consumers are usually not um, as organized um, um, because of the nature. Um, it's just not one single entity. Um, so I think it's, it's an amazing force, but there's a still need for um, um, greater engagement from um, um, issuers, governments, um, and et cetera. Uh, as you notice uh, in, my, in my open remarks, I, I already made a few comments where I think what, it, what will be the future of sustainable finance. So I do think that the sustainable finance will be more and more related to um, um, financial results. Uh, it has to, um, and um, it will be more focused on impact. Uh, so um, at IFC, we've been a key player in issuing green bonds, uh, social bonds. Uh, more recently, during the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the World Bank and IFC announced um, $14 billion of aid uh, to fight against coronavirus. Um, and, and IFC uh, issued uh, um, social bonds, uh, including a $1 billion um, social bond. Um, to to address that, um, you also you also asked um, um, Alex uh, something which is what is more tangible. So um, I don't know if it's very clear for everyone, but um, where we are now, ESG label bonds, it all it, it started a long time ago. Um, some people trace it back to to Quakers, to uh, even 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 further to uh, Islamic and, and Jewish rules. Um, but uh, the, 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 what we have today was basically uh, born um, in the 1950s with the social responsible investment, uh, the SRI, that has developed uh, into um, the ESGs, uh, label bonds, and SDGs. And the World Bank has been a key player um, 
in most of those events. Uh, green bonds, for example, um, uh, Swedish bank, uh, Swedish funds, uh, pension funds, if I'm not mistaken, connected the World Bank Treasury and said we want to invest in uh, projects that are green, um, and we don't have those projects. And the World Bank said I have those projects. So that's how um, um, uh, green bonds were created. So I think this this is a clear example of what is happening. So uh, uh, someone who has resources, has money, has liquidity, um, buys these bonds, which will then uh, create an impact. And it's very important to have r reporting requirements and and um, clear connections between uh, the investment and the impact, as I said. Uh, finally, um, I, I'd like to make a, a, a point that there has been there has been research showing that uh, whenever there is an independent auditor, uh, an independent independent par pair of eyes um, evaluating um, the real impact of green bonds or labor bonds, um, results. Uh, seem to be uh, uh, much more effective. So um, uh, there is a correlation between having an independent auditor uh, and the actual impact of such a label bonds. Super. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that summary. And if I if I sort of sort of wrap up this first part about what is sustainable finance, it's been really interesting to hear sort of three main parts there. I think. Um, so first of all, on the product side, from talking from the green bond perspective, right through to pension funds, right through to green leasing, uh, we've talked a little bit already about government policy, the need for incentives or the role of incentives in, in promoting sustainable finance. Uh, and then also, very importantly, I think, consumer shift and, and how are consumers, perhaps less organized, but also uh, shaping the dialogue around the demand for, for sustainable finance. Uh, we also have a, a question uh, online, which is uh, around uh, supporting sustainable startups. So, so yes, that's, uh, that's also something that, uh, that I'm, I'm personally doing at a practical level. And um, we're really encouraging startups to either, th either think about creating uh, a triple, uh, triple top line, so positive people, plan planet, and profit, so sort of ESG thinking, uh, or even to pivot towards that direction as well. And Davila, you're active. You're active there as well, yes, right? Yes, actually, the... Rocket is one of our uh, sustainability uh, fintech hubs in Lithuania, supported by Swedbank. So proud supporter. <laughs> Super. So I hope, uh, hope we answer Frank's question there and uh, we can, we can uh, of course, talk about that more offline uh, as well. Okay, if we move on to the, the second part then, having talked about what is sustainable finance and getting that sort of broad understanding at those, those three levels, let's look at the key trends or, or these, other, these other drivers. So you've also talked about um, uh, some examples uh, in terms of the products from, from yourselves. Um, unfortunately, uh, as Kisa is not able to join us uh, again due to technical issues, uh, it would have been great to hear from uh, to hear from her about the the whole Black Lives Matter movement in the in the U.S. Uh, I know she also has some very good examples of uh, of sustainable finance and financing marginalized communities uh, in the U.S. Uh, but again, maybe we can we can just hear a little bit from from our panelists uh, in terms of some some really inspiring examples uh, that that you've seen elsewhere. So so Yatek, why don't you kick us off with uh, with that? Great, um, thanks for this. I would like to first say that also on the green fintech startups, I wanted to say two things. One is we we are uh, working uh, on the to one with one of the accelerators at the moment, SWG for the cohort of fintech startups. So if there are any sustainability fintechs there, please, you know, you can Google us on social and apply. Mm -hmm. And we're also happy to work with uh, Rocket as well. So I think that's uh, that's something at the start that uh, really is important um, to us. We as a bank look at the really wide range of, uh, of green activities. I think one important bit is the green bonds coming from, from our markets uh, in our countries of operation mostly Central Eastern Europe at the moment, where the framework seems quite um, uh, sympathetic towards it. Uh, what we see there actually, and this is an interesting observation, is that if you look at international investors like EBRD or others, they really are A, interested in green finance and green assets, green bonds, but also they see that there is not yet a supply of green assets coming to the market at the level that we would like to see. So this supply, element has to be worked on, so there have to be more issuers uh, coming to the market. But what we see talking to domestic investors, so let's put international versus domestic, domestic investors at the moment, they are not really differentiating green versus non-green because there is no also price differentiation. That comes to the issuer side as well. If the issuer has to do the green bond, and Otavia alluded to it, we have a third party opinion and we put extra cost to this, this is not yet 
coming back to in terms of uh, better pricing when those bonds being issued. But hopefully this is something that's going to change in a minute. But as a bank, we run now really a lot of interesting, and because we were at the fintech conference, I'm going to say cool examples of, of green finance. And by cool, for example, we have the program which is called Green Cities, with 32 cities sign up, and hopefully we're going to have 100 cities uh, sign up to this very soon, which going to make our cities greener. What does that really mean in practice? It means, A, the bank supports the financing of greener infrastructure or other investments in the cities, and on the other hand, also cities sign up to the action plan to implement the greener policies. So it's a win-win uh, solution that we see, which is very, very beneficial. The other element which I really uh, like and was uh, mentioned before, the green mortgages. So housing actually, and housing stock, is one of the biggest energy consumption user um, globally. So how can we make this more efficient? So why giving the green mortgages to banks, the banks can also issue an instrument that has become quite important for us as investors, which is called a covered bond. It's a financial product, it's a debt capital market product that you issue and it's secured, bank issue and it's secured by, by pool of mortgages. If those mortgages are green, then we can have a green covered bond, which allows us to actually finance it better and as much of, uh, of interest uh, in the mainstream there. So I really, if I look at capital market side, which is something which is uh, close to my heart and, uh, and my skills, I see much more green examples uh, of products coming into play. And uh, I think they are also, if you look at the policy principles, like for example, green bonds, they relate to something we didn't mention, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, which are UN targets for, for globally set up for all of us and that hopefully will be implemented. And the way to do it is also through a financing by private sector and public sector. But I think, you know, first element is which we are still on the big wave of that is to create awareness of green. And I think you mentioned the shift on the consumer and we see it as well, but awareness is the first element of that. The B is, you know, the action. So we have to action that for the deals and we see that also growing. And then the third element, and I'm not sure it's for us, but it's also for politicians, is accountability. And are we having enough accountability? I will leave that question unanswered, but I think the big shift now is gonna come with the post COVID-19 economic recovery, where we will see that sustainability and the other, and two, and another element of it, which was mentioned by Otavio or IFC, that's something really interesting is the social bond element, because at the moment we're talking about the green part a lot, but there was not much focus on the social bonds that could go for a number of programs like youth unemployment or, for example, women in business programs that we are providing across uh, countries of operation. And I would say that this is the second stage of that sustainability market that we will see going up in the coming years. Super. I think that's uh, some really good insights there, Jacek, and uh, you know, particularly uh, like hearing about the policy aspect from the from the accountability and promoting accountability, and also you sharing some some really good examples of the the instruments or, or financial tools that you actually have out there on the market to to make that shift. So, Otavio, let's uh, you know uh, hear from you. Is is Yatek and the EBRD are they doing the right thing? Are these the right kind of uh, instruments? You talked about the importance of uh, of capital markets uh, in making this change. What do you, how, how do you evaluate this? Okay, we can't hear Otavio. If we can get some sound I on cannot him, hear you, Otavio. Okay. I wonder I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, was, <laughs> I, I was on mute. Um, uh, let's put Ayatek on the, on the spotlight here. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, uh, we're all multilaterals. Uh, we, we work together. Uh, um, and I completely agree. With what, with what Yatsek, um, I think when he touched on price differentiation, that's a key discussion when it comes to capital markets, um, and and that's where I believe uh, um, we need to develop still. So you asked you asked us to speak about um, the going forward. Um, I have many thoughts, and and it's hard to know exactly where where the industry is going to go. Uh, but uh, besides the point that I already raised, I think PSG hopefully and and I, it will uh, become an indication to uh, identify uh, uh, 
uh, reduced risk. So higher ESG ratings, uh, maybe green bonds, a uh, better performance in, in, in that kind of uh, the developmental indicator uh, would hopefully lead to a uh, smaller idiosyncratic risk or beta, which is um, a market aligned risk. Um, today in the morning, I had a discussion with my team uh, about um, uh, some of the SG ratings. Um, and I think maybe for the more specialized audience who, who knows more about the products, uh, uh, I, I think it's very relevant for SG ratings specifically to develop in two structured products, um, asset-backed securities, etc., and um, uh, money market. Um, those are areas where special markets, I think, um, let's say those are not the low-hanging fruits um, compared to corporate bonds or, or some other instruments. So I think we will see development in those uh, specific areas. Um, Finally, uh, I'd like to say that um, going forward, I think if you if if we think about it, how how did this um, rapid growth of sustainability investment came to be? There was there was basically two two um, triggers. Um, one is uh, like Davila said, there was a demand from, but there's also also a, a key element which is data. We never had in the history of humankind. Yet amount of the and processing capacity of data that we have today. And data is essential to the discussion we are having. Um, data needs to be comparable, data, data needs to be updated, and, and, and data needs to be um, uh, used correctly. Um, I think everyone here has been in, in this environment for for many, um, we know that there's space for improvement. And we know that there's uh, going to be um, uh, a rapid growth and improvement in this area. Um, and I'm sure that data will be part of it. Um, I think that um, in, in, in some of my experience in the years, I've noticed the change already in the last two or three years. Uh, and and I think um, rating, ESG rating agencies and even the, the, the standard uh, rating agencies now, um, credit rating agencies, have doing an amazing job into trying to bring issuers to speed on providing comparable, updated, uh, quality data. I think that's, um, again, a real shame why that we don't have Kisa with us today. You know, working with Refinitiv, that's that's something that they're doing. They're really plugged into the data uh, and they've been honing this over a number of years. So, uh, yeah, again, um, you know, for those watching, yeah, have a have a look at what uh, what Kisa's doing with her podcast and what Refinitiv are doing in more more generally as well. Great, uh, great insights there. Thanks, uh, Otavio uh, Davila. What are your yes, thoughts? I was just going to add some things, not to repeat what was said. Many good thoughts are out here, but uh, basically, for me, sustainable finance is a new trend. It's a completely emerging trend that uh, we need to catch on right now if we want to be a good businesses in the future, and so on and so on. It's very important for everyone to understand that the framework of regulations is coming. We will all be able to identify the company impacts, and exactly this is how we will measure and understand what is uh, green washed or what is green you know uh, what where I see that we need to focus uh, not only on consumer uh, uh, overall uh, attitudes and shifts, but also it's very important to work with business community for me because we as a bank, of course, we are dependent on business impacts. So uh, definitely all businesses need to understand and and I think I also have a message for the fintech community as well, because the uh, fintech community as such has an ability to be a forward front runner in this whole trend and change that will develop because eventually in five years or a few more, uh, everything will be regulated so so the banks will not even you know be able to borrow money to the businesses that will not be on sustainability journey as such. So I think fintechs definitely can be uh, uh, using this trend and, and making the most out of it and helping the businesses, the traditional businesses, transform towards this better joiner, towards sustainability. So this is important to take into account.
Super. And, and again, thanks for the, the, the question uh, that we have uh, online about the difference between uh, being green and, and greenwashing. Uh, you know, Yatek, you've, you've already talked about uh, the cooperation with Startup Wise Guys and really looking for sustainable fintechs. So, you know, can you give the audience sort of a short uh, summary? How do you ensure that, that those are really, uh, you know, sustainable finance fintechs uh, and not just sort of greenwashing fintechs? Sure. So, first of all, for SWG participation, you know, we welcome all fintechs, obviously. It's not only limited to sustainability, so let me let me be clear on that. Uh, so welcome all fintechs from, from BRD countries of operation to apply. Uh, you can look at the announcements on SWG or our website. We also partner with Rocket, um, and uh, that partnership went, went live last week, so I'm very happy that, you know, we find a way to do it. And then you're asking a really really valid question because I'm glad that this term was 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 mentioned the greenwashing right in a way so can you a little bit you know dust it off or window dress and sell it as a green so when we talk about the more mature markets when we talk about the green bonds we have a green bond principles we're now going to have standards from the EU we have the EU taxonomy so we will I think especially in the European Union, be quite safe to say what is green and what is not green on the big business side. And I think having all the companies that can be a third party or a third opinion or a third party opinion provider, that's going to bring us to this, which is good. But then comes to the fintech scene when I think, you know, it will be much more discretionary to, to identify what can support uh, or not sustainability. Uh, and I think it's very hard to define for the startup that is about to be developed, whether their solution truly is green or not. And I think that's not only for people like me to look at it, but also engineers and others that are green and ESG, uh, ESG uh, specialists. And that's a really, uh, really interesting element. On the other hand, because sustainability, and we all agree on this, is, I would say, not only a new trend, but it's really going to be the mainstream uh, sooner than we actually expect. I would say that a lot of fintechs will go that way. And then if I were to be a fintech, to be honest, uh, which I'm not because I'm working in a development organization, I would connect to something that Otavio said, the data, because we want to have the data and the understanding, et cetera. Can we find a better ways to, to develop something new that will help us with the data? And then can we get that and link that to actually making the investment greener or more visible that is green? Again, that's just an idea that came a second ago to to my head, but I think it's going to be really hard, at least at this stage, to do it. I think FCA, for example, tried to do it. So Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, they run the world's most famous regulatory sandbox, even a little bit more famous than the Lithuanian one. So I'm so sorry to the Bank of Lithuania for saying that, but your, your sandbox is also amazing. But the FCA sandbox did something really cool. They organized this cohort of green startups. So they got 10 of green companies, purely green, to go for the regulatory issues and actually um, uh, go for the sandbox regime. But the difficulty with this was, I think, for us or for the FCA to define the conditions of what is green for such an early stage uh, business. Super. Thanks. Thanks for touching on that. And uh, Otavio, I guess, you know, uh, the, the, the whole concept of sustainable finance is considerably more advanced over there in, in, in Washington, D.C. and with, with your organization and the World Bank. Um, you know, is greenwashing still something that's talked about? As, uh, as Jacek says, you know, do we need to, to brush that off or where is it today? Um, uh, thanks for the question, um, Alex. Um, as you know, as, although we're based in Washington, D.C., the World Bank is dealing uh, with uh, um, projects uh, all over the globe. Um, putting just for a second the bank aside, uh, my own research on my doctoral thesis is, is deeply related to um, uh, what we could call greenwashing. Um, so I'm, I'm, my thesis is focused on trying to identify um, a connection between funds that claim to be um, um, developmental funds and see if they are uh, different from other uh, non-developmental uh, funds significantly, let's say, statistically uh, different. And on an, another angle, I'm trying to connect uh, green bonds um, with a final impact on the climate. All of that is hard, and that's why I say it's, I, I'm, I'm, I think it's essential, but it's not easy. And um, I think that's very valuable. Uh, and why is that very valuable? Because we don't want to see a world uh, where 
um, as as I, I like to, to imagine. Imagine a world where every single bond is green. Would the climate still change? Um, so the, the question behind um, this, uh, the many questions that could pop up uh, behind this, this one main question is, are green bonds actually doing what they are supposed to when it comes to um, uh, uh, global warming and, and climate change? Um, and that's, a, it's, that's an essential question to ask, because if they are not, um, we probably uh, need to adjust things and, and avoid what we call greenwashing. Because um, if a green bond is not addressing the main um, uh, environmental issue, um, it, it should be at least disclosed exactly what it's doing. To that point, but, I'd just like to, to add – yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, just uh, I'm sorry that we're, we're running out of time, and I think that was almost sort of a very nice uh, sort of uh, summary and conclusion into into greenwashing. Um, sure. I, I think it would, it would be great just to just to sort of uh, wrap up with a with a couple of summary points, and then to go back to each of you for sort of a quick, uh, you know, short one or two words. The, the the future of sustainable finance to bring this all together. So so again, you know, we've talked uh, considerably around uh, green products. Uh, different. It's been really good to hear all of your examples on that. Uh, so, so thanks to all of you. Uh, we've talked about government policy incentives. Uh, we've talked about the role of data and how we're moving to a much more data-driven uh, uh, life where we can actually really measure the impact of, uh, of, of sustainable impact of uh, sustainable finance. We've talked about consumer shift. We've also talked about pricing uh, and how we need to have more issuers, uh, more strength on the supply side. Uh, and, it, and all of this, of course, is, uh, is in terms of having a real uh, positive climate impact. Mm -hmm. So uh, last couple of words, um, you know, the future of sustainable finance. Um, in my opinion, just two words, partnership and green recovery. So what do I mean by partnership is put all forces together, governmental institutions and um, the partnership between business and, and non-profits will start to happen and between governments and international community we will have better results and green recovery is an excellent wish and we have a chance to have it in a greener way. So this is my wishes. Fantastic. Very upbeat uh, way, to, way to end. Thanks, Davila. Uh, Jatek, from you, final uh, quick, uh, quick comments. Absolutely. I think, you know, let's think about AAA. AAA is the highest rating in capital markets. And I think let's translate it now to awareness, action, and accountability. And let's make it personal. We've all changed. Been, our life has been changed in the last two, three months so much. We started walking more. We started using bicycles more. And every change starts within us first. So let's change and continue having that change with us as persons, humans, and that will, in the future, also transpose to the thinking of us as professionals supporting the development of green green finance. So that will be my message. Let's do the AAA. Sean Sharp, AAA, fantastic. Thank you. And Otavio, last uh, last word from you. I'm not as good with acronyms, uh, so I'm I'm, I'm just going to go with uh, three main words. I think, as I said, impact is essential. I think um, financial results connected to um, uh, sustainable finance is essential. And the final point that I, uh, I'd like to make is uh, standardization of, of data. I think um, standardization in this industry is going to be key going forward. Fantastic. I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you heard this first here. The future is bright. The future is sustainable finance. We're, we're, we're on the right trend. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you all today. Uh, thanks to Jacek uh, in London. Thanks to Otavio in Washington, D.C. Davila here in, uh, in Vilnius, Lithuania. And uh, back over to you, Arumas. Many thanks to, uh, for watching. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, and the panel for an enlightening discussion. I think, uh, in general, the future seems to be bright. So uh, finance has a crucial role to play in uh, tackling climate change. Recent news from Lithuania and Europe reveal that we are ready to overcome the challenges posed by COVID-19 and start a new era of green sustainable finance. On the 27th of May 2020, the European Commission updated its seven-year uh, 1 trillion euro budget proposal and announced 
uh, the biggest recovery plan in EU history, uh, Next Generation EU, uh, bringing to bear an additional 750 billion euros of financial firepower. All funds will be filtered by reserving 25% spending for climate change expenditure, uh, ensuring implementation of the European Green New Deal initiative. And now I would like to switch to some other very important topic for fintech. How many times have you heard the story a legitimate website gets hacked and the perpetrators gain access to countless accounts and identities? And I think from there the story unfolds in all sorts of negative manner. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our next panel, Cybersecurity Increased Risks in the Current Environment. Moderator, Jivile Necheoskaite, Director of Marketing and Communication at NRD Cybersecurity. Jivile has organized uh, and hosted a number of cybersecurity events aimed at financial sector, not only in Lithuania, but also in East Africa. She is also a member of various working groups at international organizations, such as GFCE, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. Ladies and gentlemen, cybersecurity, increased risks in the current environment. So hello everybody and please welcome uh, our panelists for today's uh, panel discussion. And it's really great that we are quite geographically dispersed. So I'll try to locate you all, then I introduce you. So meet uh, May Michelson, who is now in Israel. Am I correct? Yes. Yes, yes so Tel Aviv City. Hi, May. So she's a senior director of global sales at uh, JK8, a cybersecurity company that offers a high security custodian technology for managing and safeguarding digital assets. Um, please meet Malte Polman, um, chief security officer at Ultimaco, who is now in Germany. Hello. Right? Uh, a hello. Company. hello from Germany. Hello, hello. So Ultimaco is a company which has uh, been developing hardware-based high security appliances and compliance solutions for telecommunication pro provider regulations. And it's Thomas Kerr in Austria. Yes, streaming from Vienna. <laughs> hello, hello. So Thomas is team lead uh, or principal security consultant at Sec Consultant one of the leading consultancies in the field of cyber and application security. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Rita Srinis, who is in Lithuania right now. Hello, everyone. And uh, Dr. Itis is director at uh, National Cyber Security Center of Lithuania, which is the main Lithuanian uh, cyber security institution responsible for unified management of cyber incidents, monitoring and control of the implementation of cyber secu security requirements. And we have a very interesting topic today, cyber security uh, meets fintech. Uh, in, the, in terms of cybersecurity and the fintech, there have been two great trends recently. Uh, so the first one is that with the emergence of new wave of internet users from rural and semi-urban areas, digital financial inclusion initiatives are most susceptible to data breaches uh, that involve consumer fraud, such as phishing, for example. And secondly, it's the COVID-19 after, uh, crisis aftershock. It has been already uh, mentioned um, throughout the couple of days of uh, uh, FinTech week uh, that um, um, COVID crisis has fast forwarded the dig digitalization of the economy and our lives in general. There has been a major shift away from cash due to a uh, sharp decline in face-to-face -face interactions uh, because people are afraid of uh, viruses be being transmitted through banknotes and coins. Uh, so fintech companies uh, that provide uh, contactless solutions have been booming. 
In this discussion, we aim not only to identify what cyber uh, dangers may currently affect fintechs, but also to take a peek at what the future holds. So I would like to open with a question for all. How do you feel cybersecurity landscape has been changing recently? Do you see any tendencies different in your country to other countries? So let's start with uh, May for this question. Sure. Um, so I think the cybersecurity landscape has changed dramatically over the past few years. If in the past, you can only be in the same network with someone and just monitor everything that's going on in their network. Now, nowadays, people are much more aware for their security, of their privacy, the anonymity that they want. Uh, much more traditional assets and assets are becoming digitalized, which incentivize the hackers uh, to do more hacking, um, whether it's uh, based from ideology that you want to hack a certain country, a certain organization, whether it's much more money that you can gain or whether it's the reputation. So we see many more hacking events happening, uh, whether it's in 2018 that more than one point, the $1 uh, billion were stolen on digital assets or last year that more than $4.6 billion US dollars were stolen on digital assets. I believe that this trend will keep growing and growing. If you ask me about territory, in Israel, we are facing cyber security threats all the time. Uh, me personally, I earned my stripe uh, serving in the Israeli uh, Air Force in a cybersecurity unit under the Special Operations Department. Uh, I can tell you that for us, cybersecurity was always on top of our priority, uh, whether it's because of national security or uh, whether it's to protect uh, any kind of asset that is exposed to, to terror uh, attacks. So um, we see more hacking events in Israel. It's always hacking events, and it's uh, on top of our game. Right, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Malta, what uh, would be your opinion? So you spoke to a very important recent event. Obviously, this crisis is driving this in behavior. Um, we see, and we have many, many banking customers, um, a dramatic change to um, more electronic, more cashless payments, um, more contactless payments. That drives a lot of changes, of course, in the behavior of attackers, but of course also of users and prevention as well as security. Um, second to that, the current crisis is dramatically speeding up digitalization, which is in many, many areas a good thing. In many areas, the solutions are there, but they have been laggard. So um, whether it's telehealth, whether it's remote access to machines, whether it's e-government, um, those areas are now speeding up, of course, digitalization. And that brings a whole new user type. Um, uh, I mean, the brown uh, workers, the, the workers who have been uh, on shop floors, uh, they suddenly have to face remote access to their uh, machinery that gives new attack surface, but also it gives, of course, uh, new needs for prevention and, and security. Um, so the current crisis teaches us to digitalize faster and in order to enable that to build cybersecurity into many, many new areas, um, which I think mid to long term will be a good thing. Okay. And Thomas, what would you say? Yeah, I just want to, to continue where Malte left off uh, because exactly that's what we are seeing when uh, our SEC defense team uh, analyzes uh, specific security incidents that uh, with more and more people out there who are forced to work remotely, who are not that tech savvy, are more and more falling victim to uh, phishing attacks, to targeted attacks. And what the attackers are doing is basically taking the credentials to get log in via VPN and compromise the networks directly. What's also interesting to observe is that uh, the dwell time, the time until a successful attack is discovered, actually shortens. And that's a good thing because the attacker is uh, less and less time active in the network be uh, before he gets detected. The not so good aspect of this trend is that it's usually not the company itself detecting the breach, but it's often external parties identifying that there has been an issue and uh, telling the, the, the companies affected. 
And I talked to our SEC defense team about uh, what's the most critical challenge at the moment for them. And they told me that it's the lack of, of collecting evidence. Many organizations don't prepare accordingly. They start doing this more and more. But often when they have forensic investigations, they don't find the data, they don't find the artifacts they require to analyze the incident. So it's critical for the companies to prepare better to, to support forensic investigations. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ritas, uh, do you have anything to add? Actually, I agree on most of the what was said by colleagues, uh, but want to add that we feel in Lithuania that in the past years the sophistication of cyber attacks is increasing. And for example, last year our annual report showed that the amount of uh, incidents that needed to be processed by by hands, by specialists, uh, increased it three times. In Lithuania, we registered more than 3,000 incidents that was needed for uh, specialists to be processed, handled, and even more thousands of incidents that were processed during uh, with uh, automatic tools, special uh, intrusion detection system sensors within the network. So that is um, the dangerous thing. And I as well would like to point that financial sector is uh, very much targeted. Only last year, we in Lithuania registered uh, cybercrime incidents that our citizens in the country lost 1.5 million euros, and it's only what was registered uh, officially, I believe, uh, much more cyber incidents uh, on financial sectors are not registered and processed. Mm, and answering a question, how is different between the countries? Actually, I believe that is similar to most of our countries that we are talking because internet is without the borders. So the incidents uh, that are detected in the internet, in the network global, is spreading around the world. So it should be common for all of them, for all of us. Thank you. Right, okay, so we, well, we all agree that the number of uh, cybersecurity incidents is increasing. And there are more and more uh, hacking incident, hacking incident, related incidents occurring. Uh, there's a change of behavior for of attackers, but at the same time, uh, due to uh, a lot of people moving to on online working environment, uh, there are easier victims, um, and there's lack of data for investigation from companies. Right. Let's focus on um, fintech then. Uh, which cybersecurity uh, threats uh, are in particular significant to fintech? We, touch, we touched on financial sector overall, but uh, what would you say are uh, uh, particularly important to fintech? Do you feel they differ in various regions within Europe or even further? Uh, Thomas, I would like to start with you. I think you are muted, Thomas. Yes, you're totally right. I was muted. Sorry about that. Um, no I fully agree that the um, internet is borderless and I don't see a real distinction when it comes to cyber threats. But uh, what at least here in, in Austria I have been, been seeing during the last year is that the regulators definitely stepped up their game a lot. Uh, it's probably also the case in, in many other countries. But they became way more stricter during their audits. They are taking cybersecurity much more seriously. And uh, if your security posture is lacking in this regards, you will definitely have a bad time when it comes to, to those audits. Talking about the cyber threat specifically, I don't think there is a, a difference between the different regions. But uh, we see a, a steep increase in targeted malware against uh, smartphones. And when we're talking about online banking and we're talking about strong customer authentication, if this important factor is compromised, uh, yes, this, this has a huge impact. And therefore, this would be the, the highest rated uh, change when it comes to fintech, in my opinion. Okay, brilliant. And uh, 
May, do you have anything to add or contradict maybe to Thomas? No, not contradict. I, I definitely agree. Uh, I would add that um, in our field, the attack that we see recently uh, by uh, financial institutions uh, are uh, a lot of uh, phishing events that are happening and many in the middle attacks when people are uh, trying to change data, whether it's in the, the blockchain space, our area, when people just send, for example, a new addressee to receive the money by email, then they could be compromised. Or uh, people, when they try to do everything online, get a lot of phishing events. So I would agree and add that those are the kind of attacks we see all the time and, and have to face and help the bank to cope. Right. Okay. Thank you. And before we move to our next question, I would like to address our audience. Uh, please don't feel us like it's only five of us talking. Please uh, ask uh, questions uh, and uh, make this panel discussion uh, even more interactive. Uh, so let's move on to the next uh, question, which is um, about uh, fintechs uh, focusing too much on user experience and um, uh, key features rather than on cyber security. Do you agree with the statement or not? And what are the criteria for success in creating secure financial technology? Uh, Ritas, I would like uh, to address this question to you. Yes, thank you. Um, well, actually, from my side, as I see, I see, especially in Lithuania, a lot of startups in the fintech sector. And when we speak with them about the cybersecurity, we feel that the main issue for those startups uh, usually is to start a business, actually, to, to, to start up. And uh, security will come later. So the main focus on, on uh, starting a company, making clients, making applications up and running, uh, I think, it could be a wrong strategy, uh, not paying attention on competence in, in cybersecurity right from the beginning. It could cause incidents, cyber attacks uh, on a database and could compromise the ball, our Lithuanian nation as fintech nation reputation. That's my worry about. and. Um, yeah, I believe you are right. That the focus on, on financial issues on uh, clients uh, and users' side could be uh, could cause incidents later, and incidents in cybersecurity, the damage, the reputation uh, for fintech technology could cause us a lot of problems in the future. That's my opinion to discuss. Thanks. Right. Uh, Malta, uh, what would be your thoughts? Uh, is the situation any different in Germany? Well, I think it would be unfair to put all fintechs into like one uh, bucket which claims that they are not aware of the necessary security kind of boundaries and, and fundaments they have to build up. Um, I think it really, really depends uh, on the business model. We have uh, customers who are fintechs and engage in crypto asset brokerage. Um, they absolutely know that high security is very, very important, is core to their business model. And we see now others, and that, that is a good thing that regulation also can create markets and break it up, who try to use PSD2 um, to uh, provide new new services and they may not be aware of the complexity of what you really need to access other people's financial data to make now a new business model to build a virtual bank and they may not know complex situations like digital signatures, EIDAS guidelines, what is behind that, what, what you need to have established. So they're looking either for partners uh, or for other solutions, cloud solutions to deliver them those necessary security uh, fundamentals. So um, I think overall it depends. We will uh, have a big need everywhere for much more awareness, consulting, teaching and information what is necessary to enable these 
digital business models and as we see many fintechs bundling very interesting services with um, new iot applications i mean it could be my car which automatically pays for the parking lot um, and it needs to be payment compliant uh, we need that knowledge base uh, in much wider areas of the industry what is necessary to truly provide secure financial secure payments secure authentication solutions and uh, how do you think that knowledge could be transferred then? Well, um, that is a very, very big and if not maybe the key, uh, because if we look into current forecasts, there will be until 2003 about 2 million cybersecurity experts lacking all over in the world. Um, so um, many, many more, um, yeah, uh, Companies, or service companies, will look for experts. Will look for um, uh, ready-made with all the certification uh, and security built into that. Um, it is a big challenge that we have that knowledge gap, um, and uh, the attackers have the unfair advantage that while they only have to find one whole and uh, one attack vector, we have to protect as defenders all of them, not knowing where they will attack. Um, so it is really a, a knowledge gap. We all need to work in the industry with smart solutions, with integrated platforms, with services, um, but also with attracting much more talent through education into the IT and cybersecurity sector. Right, okay, but I'm curious uh, how important uh, is regulation and uh, what are and should be the key regulating bodies uh, for making sure that uh, fintechs are creating secure technologies? Um, it is because you are our public sector representative, uh, my eyes are towards you. Well, actually, I think not only regulation that is important, even more important perhaps could be uh, a third party's uh, testing and uh, security of this and assessing, for example, applications that we are for fintech technology, we are having uh, more and more uh, such applications running to test cybersecurity, to have a competent third body that could, uh, could do that assessment is very important to set up as sooner the sooner the, the better, uh, and regulation will follow after that, uh, I think, that's my opinion. Okay, Thomas, maybe you have uh, anything to add from a slightly different uh, private sector perspective? Yes, I definitely uh, agree that uh, a, a testing body would be great to, to have, and but we have to discuss about uh, application security and system security right from the beginning. Building security in is crucial. Having verification, having testing is very, very important, but it actually starts with the planning and with the requirements engineering. And that that's where I see many organizations currently failing or investing too little, starting uh, right at the beginning and thinking security as a, as a, as a whole process. The good news is there are established standards. Uh, for example, OWASP SAM, the Security Assurance Maturity Model, is a great standard. It's open, it's available to ev everyone. It describes 30 activities which you should do throughout your development lifecycle to create really uh, resilient and secure application. It's out there, you just have to use it, you have to implement this. But you have to make this decision to invest in your security and to, to be properly prepared. And once you make this decision, the information on how to do this is out there. Right, okay. And there's uh, an open question for any of the panelists. Uh, so feel free to answer whoever wants. How should the regulators keep up with the fast forward digitalization and developments in uh, fintech? Well, I can say something that the regulator is doing in Israel, for example. Uh, so they're doing uh, meetings 
whether they invite uh, leading companies in the market, whether it's uh, fintech companies that are working with many financial institutions, whether it's cybersecurity companies that are aware to the risks that exist in the market. And, and they hear us. They hear uh, what we hear outside, what we want to develop. Uh, I can tell that they're, in Israel we have a lot of freedom with uh, try uh, new technologies and, and get them regulated quite quickly. Uh, so they listen a lot to the small companies, to the fintech, to the startups, uh, and and really work with us to form the right regulation. Uh, they also have an open forum where they can basically um, get requests from civilians. They see exactly what people want to have. Uh, so, for example, uh, if banks want to add another functionality that is currently uh, not possible in different countries and not regulated yet. They can approach a regulator and they can test it quite easily. And if they see that it works, it gets passed and regulated uh, on a fast track. Right, okay. Uh, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. And uh, with one of them, we're going to move slightly from fintech and it's going to be towards, uh, uh, in general, working from home. Uh, so the question goes, most businesses moved to their uh, employees operating from home during the pandemic. What are the main threats that you can address and what are your recommendations to secure communication channels? Who would like to take up this question? So I can I can start maybe with um, sure. our specific perspective. Um, we provide secure identification, authentication, and encryption solutions. So I have a very very specific view to that. And of course, many of our customers uh, face this right now. So um, making sure in this newly distributed um, working environment, uh, you can properly um, authenticate all of the elements uh, you suddenly have distributed and not anymore within your classic control. So whether you permit employees to work and connect to sensitive areas of your business, of your production, from their private networks, from their private devices, uh, with um, new means of authentication, you may use different ones then in the office, make sure that your, your principal um, uh, paradigm is um, everything has to be verified. Um, so it's kind of a zero trust model, um, which is a good way of thinking this, and it's a much more important way as we work in this very, very remote uh, area. So uh, also we have in our uh, German cybersecurity industries had many, many critical developers, developers of critical networks and systems work suddenly remotely. And we had an intensive discussion with the uh, auditors as well as with the um, general office here, the Federal Office of Information Security, how this can be enabled in even the most sensitive areas. Um, and the good news is there are solutions for that. It's much more important than the exact technical solution that your paradigm of thinking security is the right one, that you want to authenticate everything, every data access, every system access, every employee, every device uh, to your distributed situation, whatever that is, whether that is a power plant uh, or a sensitive software. Right. And do you see that uh, many organizations uh, that send uh, their employees to work from home, they, that they already started, you know, applying those security measures and thinking about uh, um, restricted access to certain files and folders? Uh, Absolutely. So, I mean, we've seen many with encrypt everything strategies, but I mean, in such a pandemic, um, of course, the, um, the the threat is, first of all, you want to continue your business. So it, it also has to be a balance between business continuity, uh, the awareness of the threats, and then the technical means you can, you can implement fast. Uh, organizations who were very far along the process of encrypting as much as possible using zero trust models, um, having um, access and authentication based really also on strong root of trust, not on, on weak elements, whatever that is, uh, they certainly work. I think why we have seen 
um, many IT organizations um, uh, do this work from home model in a very fast way. And why unfortunately, and we've seen the same here in Germany, education, some parts of government, um, telehealth and so on, um, were lagging behind. Um, but that will change right now. Uh, so we see that all organizations see that it is uh, not acceptable uh, to not have a distributed uh, work environment enabled, uh, even if you don't use need to use it all the time, uh, but it has to be enabled and you have to think through those models. Right. Well, let's hope that uh, these uh, practices uh, stay in put even then the workforce, the workforce comes back to, to the office uh, just in case, uh, you know, there's uh, another wave of pandemic or something else. Uh, and there's a need to work from home in such large amounts again. Uh, let's go back to fintechs uh, again. And we have a question about uh, cyber defense. So what are the best practices uh, for defense for fintechs? Um, May, what would be your thoughts on this? Great. Best approach for defense is is to think like a hacker. It's basically to to define who could be your hacker. It could be from an uh, internal job or it could be from outside. How would the hacker think? Uh, that would be the right approach to take. Uh, I, I definitely agree with what uh, Malte said. Basically, we need to protect an overall holistic solution from everything, while a hacker only needs to find one bridge of security and that's it. So while well, thinking like a hacker or doing isolated solutions, uh, which will prevent all um, attack uh, vector if possible, that will be the right approach to take. I can tell that once we start developing the solution, our solution, uh, we had to find the right balance between the user experience and the security. And because in our field, in the blockchain space, blockchain is irreversible protocol, we took the security to extreme and, and hired, and basically all our team are from uh, ex-cybersecurity and elite unit that served under the Israeli prime minister office because they are hackers and they know how the hacker thinks. Um, so that's the right approach that we decided to take and that's the approach that I believe should be taken. Right. Thomas, would you like to add anything to uh, May? I fully agree with the with the threat assessment approach. Just uh, try to identify what are the main attack vectors or what can go wrong and what would be the, the most critical things that can happen to your organization. And very likely, in addition to the technical measures you have to take, you also have to invest into the people and in the awareness of the people, especially your employees who are working uh, remote from home office for the first time who are not used to this no new scenario uh, are especially exposed. We know we as human beings, we love our rituals, we love our day to day, we, we are familiar with what we are doing, the same processes, the same people, we are interacting the same way and suddenly without warning we have to change completely. completely. We only talk to each other uh, via communication channels like this one we have uh, remote meetings we don't meet our boss face to face and scenarios like the ceo fraud scenario or other scenarios where people are targeted directly are much more likely uh, to to work with people who are not aware about the threats who are cannot easily identify the uh, different attack actors that, that may want to compromise them. So in addition to the technical security measures, I highly recommend thinking about training your people properly, investing in, in proper awareness. This can range from larger awareness trainings to just simple things like like sending regular uh, reminder emails, some kind of, of um, um, activities that, that neatly integrate in the, in the daily practices to remind the people to be more aware about the, the, the different threats. Right, okay, thank you, Thomas and me. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, question. Uh, that will go to uh, Ritis, it, and it goes like this. How you define standard, uh, standards or levels of cybersecurity for fintechs? What could be the criteria? Well, uh, it is basically, it is 
difficult to safeguard everyone and everything from cybersecurity threats and incidents. And we believe in Lithuania that it's a good strategy to pick up critical infrastructures uh, and put higher security standards for those critical infrastructures because they are essential services for a society. And I believe the fintech and financial sector in general are one of those critical infrastructures whose cybersecurity should be on a higher standard sense. The practice we will already use, for example, Lithuania is more than 100 critical infrastructures identified by the government and institutions as our institutions, national cybersecurity centers, is responsible to regulating, uh, putting higher standards, uh, working with cyber incidents that are targeting those critical infrastructures, uh, putting the priority uh, as well uh, to the fintech in general as a critical infrastructures. Okay, thank you. And May, um, what's the situation then uh, in terms of standards, uh, standard levels of cybersecurity for fintechs in Israel? Is it any different? Well, the fintechs in Israel I usually do not work in Israel. Uh, we usually uh, work with uh, different uh, financial institutions abroad, and we need to comply with their regulation. Uh, so whether it's uh, in Hong Kong that every new solution just comes out and the bank wants to, to uh, provide to their customer, we need to get uh, regulation approval. Also in uh, Taiwan, so uh, really the fintechs in Israel are just comply with every uh, financial institution that they're working with that regulation in that country. Right, okay. And uh, Thomas, do you have anything to add? Well, here in Austria, it's, it's, uh, it's not really fintech specific, but I have been working with uh, the Austrian Standards Institute for many years, defining such standards like the A7700, which is basically a requirements catalog for secure web applications, which is, of course, crucial and also mandatory in Austria to use for uh, online banking application and similar fintech application, but it's not fintech specific. So I, I'm not really aware of any fintech specific standards, but there are technical standards available also here in Austria for application system security. Right. And uh, Malta, do you have any final thoughts on this question? Uh, I think um, positively, um, and we spent a lot of effort and time and cost in complying with regulations and making sure our products are certified according to some regulations. Um, I think positively, is certain compliance with these regulations can be a business enabler. Uh, so we have some fintech certified their solution as the first ones against uh, some BaFin regulations here in Germany for crypto asset trading. Um, and it was for them a clear USP. Um, if regulators think in a smart way, they can also generate or at least help to generate positive market potential. Um, for that, they need to um, make sure that the culture, the behavior um, is put into part of that regulation. Particular payment behavior is very, very different in different parts of at least Europe and the world. Um, but also they need to think in terms of scale. So thinking where their regulation can be positively promoted, maybe the best uh, regulation for it from Europe was GDPR. Um, uh, that can be a business enabler even for fintechs. Right, okay. Uh, thank you all. And uh, because uh, the time is uh, chasing us, so let's move to the future. Because uh, we said it's not going to be only about uh, the current uh, threats, but also about the future prospects. So, uh, what is the potential impact of artificial intelligence developments within the cybersecurity field? And how this may benefit fintech? Thomas? What would be your thoughts? 
Yeah, that's a, a quite a broad question because there are so many aspects because artificial intelligence can be utilized as by the attackers as well as by the defenders. And what we have seen in the past is this red race where the attackers are trying something new and the defenders uh, have to catch up and want it. It's not working anymore what the attackers are doing. Um, they have to improvise. They have to come up with new attacks and the defenders have to catch up. When we're talking about artificial intelligence, intelligence, this process will definitely speed up and uh, taking a look at things like um, adversarial neural networks, which basically uh, outcompete, try to outcompete each other at uh, different and more or less arbitrary tasks. I suspect that this will have an impact during the, the next years uh, in seeing increased and more advanced attack, uh, attack techniques, but also uh, more uh, potential to defend against the same attacks. Right. Okay. So it uh, it sounds like a little bit of a, a mouse and cat game without uh, artificial intelligence then in cybersecurity. Um, May, what would be your thoughts? I definitely agree. I believe that we see AI is incorporating the cybersecurity space since it started. Uh, whether it's solution to try to find anomaly in attack. Um, and just like Thomas said, it's, it's, it is the cat and mouse uh, approach because you try to find an anomaly and they try to do it in a way that you will not find it. So uh, we'll just see more and more sophisticated attacks happening. And the attackers are becoming a lot more sophisticated. Right. Okay. Uh, Malta? Um, I mentioned earlier that we have this unfortunate gap in it only needs one attacker, but it needs many defenders, and we have the lack of defenders uh, forecasted for the future. So we need the help of machine learning AI of these technologies to make as much as possible automation of the defensive work, um, intelligence, anomaly detection, everything uh, we can imagine there. Uh, and actually, even on the um, yeah, uh, obfuscation side, to make it uh, harder and more manual labor for the attackers. Um, uh, AI can greatly help us to bridge the uh, resource gap between attackers and defenders. Uh, and therefore, everything we can do around that uh, can only be helpful. Right. So it seems uh, that the mostly positive notes towards artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. But do you see any dangers in that as well? Ritis? Well, of course, it. Uh, go ahead, go yes, ahead, Ritis. Go, go ahead, Ritis. Well, um, yes, actually. Uh, our Lithuanian National Cybersecurity Center is the only one in the European Union, actually, that do have an R&D division. We have uh, scientific people, actually, that are working for the past two years on artificial intelligence system, uh, as Malta said, to use for defense purpose. We are develop developing next generation sensor that uh, will and we'll, we already have a prototype uh, using artificial intelligence system uh, for better detection and early warning systems with intrusion detection, those sensors. Uh, and you ask Julia about the dangers, and we recently, when we set up this uh, first interaction of our next generation sensor with artificial intelligence system, and we tried to, to put on the networks to test. We observed that uh, we have a problem that artificial systems with a core of AI is self-learning process could be foolish or how to say the hackers could influence learning of AI process uh, that it would go in a wrong direction and uh, hackers will could bypass those artificial intelligence systems of IDS and IPS sensors 
And that's the dangers that we are investigating, and we collaborated recently with uh, European projects to put a research project um, within the Lithuania to investigate and to find solution how to uh, have the correct uh, AI learning process for cyber defense purpose. Thank you. The Malta, um, would you like to add anything or maybe contradict? Uh, well, I, I, I would express the hope that um, these technologies help the defenders more in automate our smart processes. But um, let's not be naive. Um, there is definitely um, also a threat potential. And the threat potential is maybe biggest in networks we don't yet, I would that I would say, understand as we do in the general enterprise IT network. We have spent the last more than 20 years in defending standard enterprise IP-based networks, and now we are getting into decades where we are connecting new production networks. We are connecting a lot of legacy uh, technology because uh, I mean, a big factory is not exchanging for the newest machinery, uh, everything at the same day. Uh, for ages, you have legacy technology in huge telco networks, in huge energy networks, in huge production networks. But they all combine now um, with uh, new IT um, access, and that means that means. So if AI is massively used um, to speed up the process in propagating threats into those OT-type networks, uh, then we may be in a, in a dramatic um, uh, cat-and-mouse game. Um, so my hope can just be that we are, as an industry, also the regulators and end users, fun putting security by design properly into those systems before we see AI being malused for uh, propagating threats into these OT networks. Okay. Uh, if I may jump in, yeah, uh, sure. what, what I see as a, a really, really big threat when it comes to AI is that what we traditionally do is we write algorithms and we can analyze, what algor uh, analyze these algorithms for vulnerabilities. At the current moment, when we are talking about neural network and self-learning algorithms, we basically write a program, an algorithm, that designs an algorithm uh, and it's really, really hard to analyze and really intransparent. And where we are going at the moment uh, is taking the next step uh, is meta learning. And meta learning basically means we are writing algorithms that choose and design uh, the right algorithm that defines the correct algorithm that's al actually running. And once you're at this moment, uh, the lack of transparency, uh, transparency becomes really, really obvious and you have to use technology which you do not really know what it's actually doing and how it is making its decisions. So what, what could be the possible solution to that? To well, I think we need to. I think we need to go back. Um, I would. I would suggest to uh, verify again more. Yeah. So, uh, particularly in those algorithms who are being further developed and enhanced, um, making sure with technologies like digital signatures, uh, stamping, fingerprinting. I mean, we we have a number of technologies at our hands to make sure that I properly understand each and every state. Yeah. The moment how I bought the car with the autonomous driving system or assistance, and also the moment where somebody's updating this car um, to the new algorithm. Yeah? I need to make sure for many, many reasons, for not only security, but also safety and liability, that I um, can retroactively verify each and every state. Um, uh, that at least give, gives us some transparency and control what may be then happening and changing through AI and those uh, algorithm development. Right, okay, thank you. Um, our audience wants us to move slightly from fintech again towards uh, gen general cybersecurity field. Um, the question goes like this. You mentioned uh, a lack of talent uh, in cybersecurity space. Is there a market-wide accepted certification for cybersecurity? an education program that you could name? 
I guess that uh, that could be different um, in all of the countries. So um, uh, let's start with uh, May for, with Israel. For us, it's um, it's very different because no matter which background you're coming, no matter what you learn at school, once you turn 18, you join the military. And the biggest unit sure. in the military is intelligence. So basically, no matter what you learn in school, whether it was a theater, whether it was literature, if you're joining the intelligence force, you're going through three years of basically tough training uh, in one of the toughest neighborhoods um, on cybersecurity, whether it's programming, uh, very long hours, very stressful jobs. So it's, it's very different in Israel because of the nature of the country and because of the nature of our military and how it's, it's built. Um, I would say that also in, in Israel, we have a lot of programs that the government is encouraging. So whether you're uh, 30, 40, 50, and want to go suddenly into the cybersecurity space, there's a lot of free uh, programs that you can take. Uh, there's a lot of free mentoring uh, programs as well that the government is sponsoring to help people go more into the tech field. So it's very different in my country um, because we are a lot of we are we're really cyber security oriented here. Right. Okay. Uh, Thomas. Well, there are uh, so many different certifications, actually, that it's hard to pinpoint the, the right one. And it usually depends a lot on the actual field you're working at. For example, our uh, SEC defense experts who are working in forensic and uh, investigation of incidents, they do total different trainings and certifications uh, than the people uh, who do the penetration testing and do the security code reviews and doing the architecture analysis. Again, there are different certifications when it comes to uh, secure software development, security architecture, and so on. So just to name uh, some acronyms will not will not really help you in this regard. But from my experience, I have, I'm also responsible for recruiting at my company. And I have seen so, so many CVs of people who are full of different certifications and uh, large lists of those acronyms. You To really find out if those people are skilled, you have to, to talk to them, you have to see what they're actually capable of, because just judging from the certification, you can there, there are some out there, for example, some SANS certifications who are really, really good and you won't pass them if you are skilled. But there are also a lot of them you can just pass by learning a few weeks and, and forget everything afterwards. So I wouldn't put too much value on those certifications. Right. But they mostly sound that uh, you can get those uh, or acquire those uh, certifications once you get experience. Uh, but what, what is uh, the situation in Austria in terms of uh, growing that talent uh, in cybersecurity from university, for example? Luckily, we have some great universities in, in uh, Austria who are, have dedicated cybersecurity um, how do you say it, branches that educate the people. So uh, at least four or five different institutions come to mind where we recruit our people from. But in the end, they lay a good groundwork. They, they give them a good foundation. In the end, it comes down to proper training, usually training on the job, because most of our people are doing penetration testing and security code reviews. And to do this in the wild is actually pretty difficult. So uh, when they're coming from the universities, they have some project experience, but to really get in the nitty-gritty details, they, they need the training on the job and they have to spend their years working in those projects to get the experience they need to, to, to grow. And uh, of course, we do have such programs and we also invest in people. There's something like a development bonus, which everyone is able to invest in his uh, education, where he can do training courses, where he can visit conferences and so on. But right. uh, yeah, it comes with experience and it comes with time. Right. Uh, Ritas, would, what would you say uh, Lithuania, or how is Lithuania doing in terms of growing their cybersecurity talents? Well, actually, Thomas described it very well uh, about the private sector situation and private certification system that 
there are plenty of them and it's good. Uh, I think universities and uh, education system is lacking on cybersecurity. We do cooperate with our, let's say in Lithuania, for example, with our technology universities, which we have quite a strong, and they do have uh, cybersecurity programs, baccalaureate and master degrees, um, but it's not enough. Uh, we are hiring those people, but we are struggling in getting uh, educated already specialists, for example, my authority in the past two years from 30 employees grow it to 63. And it's in, in that process was quite challenging to find the experts. And uh, what we do actually, we are hiring uh, young people uh, with informatic and programming skills only and we teach internally in our organizations. We have systems and uh, the process how to educate and train people, those specialists, to be able to react to incidents properly, uh, work with um, the same artificial intelligence system, intrusion detection sensors that we do have. So perhaps uh, our way is to train internally, have the training systems inside the organization, but because uh, it's quite difficult to get already educated and certified uh, specialists, or they maybe cost more than we in a public sector can afford. Okay, and uh, Malte, uh, what uh, about Germany? Is it is um, the situation yeah, similar? We have we have also a lack, of course, of experts, particularly in the industries who are not core IT, but like manufacturing, automotive, they are all looking for cybersecurity experts. We have a number of good universities. We as Utimaco have um, ourselves, therefore, also created a joint venture with one university, which already has applied IT security on site and we've transformed that into an international model. So um, you can join this as an uh, online course. We have students from all over the world there um, and the same professors who teach this on site uh, drive you through a multi-year uh, online certification to, to get a master. This is only a little help, um, but uh, I agree with uh, all my predecessors who, who, who spoke to this. Um, there can uh, only be more experts uh, in all industries, and for this it's a combination of um, education but also practical experience. So uh, whether you look for a basic education or you look for something really in-depth, uh, make sure that this is not a one-time event, uh, that you choose something where you continue to be part of a community, where you uh, join really a community of practitioners who help you to stay up to date because cybersecurity is a very fast moving area. It's good to have deep basics and to have good understanding, but you also need to stay current. Um, so um, maybe the situation in Germany is that we are aware, but also we by far don't have enough experts. So we are trying on all uh, elements and with all levers to create more. Right, okay, uh, thank you all. And now as our time is uh, coming to close, uh, our discussion time is coming to close, so we have uh, one final question uh, which uh, asks us to provide a tip or a couple of tips um, for end users uh, in terms of uh, fintech. Uh, what, is, uh, wh what would be our security tips uh, for the end users of fintech technology? Uh, Malta? Protect your identity. Um, however you authenticate, protect your identity. Okay, Ritas? My advice would be for end users to be very critical uh, because we are getting as end users uh, social engineering attempts from the hackers uh, 
via social media, emails, etc. So first of all, be a critical for all those links and files that we are getting not to open, not to follow the links which can lead in malicious websites and we as a users can lose money. Okay, thank you, May. Uh, I agree with uh, both of the previous answers and I would add um, don't send yourself all, the, all your passwords to everything by email and don't use the same password for everything, for just uh, a, a stupid uh, website that wants you to log in and then use the same password to log into your bank account. So just not use the same password everywhere. Right, okay, so password security. And Thomas? Well, basically, stay alert and, and stay critical. When someone approaches you, especially people you don't know, or if someone you actually know and who contacts you over different channel, stay really critical and ensure that uh, uh, the interest of this person is aligned with your interests. We are seeing so many attacks via LinkedIn, for example, where people are addressed directly with job offers or stuff like this. Uh, and the idea, of course, is to do uh, espionage and, and similar attacks don't install any anything from from third, uh, third parties and really really uh, reconsider sharing anything with anyone if you're not 100 percent secure that's the person you are uh, expecting to talk to right so be cautious and double check okay thank you all uh, so today uh, in our panel discussion cyber security increased risks in the current environment uh, we had uh, may michelson from uh, jk8 malte polman from ultimaco thomas kerbel from second salt group uh, dr rita srenis from national cyber security center of lithuania and myself, Zhvila Nechowskaita from NRD Cybersecurity. Thank you very much. The conversation about cybersecurity cannot be understated ever, right? This is a very important subject. So thank you very much, Jivila, for spending uh, your time with the panel in discussing these important topics for us. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, I will move on to something slightly different. Uh, as you can probably tell, uh, for those of you who are connecting, this is FinTech Week Lithuania, and we are broadcasting to you live from Vilnius. Uh, Vilnius has a world-class ICT infrastructure, flexible, multilingual, Tank talent, close-knit business community, yeah, you could start your business here in Vilnius. Vilnius uh, was rated as one of, one of the safest destinations in Europe, uh, with 20 times fewer infected by coronavirus than in the most affected European countries. With the borders now opening, it's the perfect time to visit Vilnius, and I would like to show you a trailer of your Vilnius movie. Welcome to Vilnius, Austria, the undiscovered jewel of the Alps. Vilnius is characterized by having most of its landmarks just a few minutes away from each other by foot. This admirable city is in the heart of Austria. Vilnius in Italy? Um, in the heart of Italy, being its most well-kept secret. Its effervescent streets and colorful markets make it a perfect destination for any traveler. For obvious reasons, Vilnius is the pride of Italy. Finland? Um, I mean, the pride of Finland. Vilnius's old town, considered one of the biggest in the region, is crowned by the majestic Gedamino Tower, where travelers like this young fellow there, buddy, can have the same view that the old ruler of Venezuela, uh, the, the old ruler of Venezuela. Sweden? Uh, I mean, Sweden. Oh, okay. Ethiopia. Of Ethiopia. Romania. Uh, 
What if I told you that Vilnius is the capital of Lithuania? Oh, oh no, no, no. Yeah? yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, that's right. Yes! <laughs> Welcome to Vilnius, Lithuania. Yes, Vilnius is the capital city of Venezuela, uh, fin I mean Lithuania. Please come, take a look at the, uh, at the city, you're definitely going to fall in love. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, I move forward to our last, but certainly not least, presenter. Uh, and the subject uh, of the panel is going to be, uh, apologies, I went through uh, with so much nervousness, scaling your fintech in time of crisis. Mission Impossible? Or is it? Our moderator, Yeva Polauskine, investment advisor for FinTech at Invest Lithuania. She has worked with companies from the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Spain, and the United States, helping them to build their European operations by leveraging benefits of Lithuanian FinTech landscape talent pool, infrastructure, and regulatory environment. Scaling your FinTech in time of crisis. Mission impossible? joining us today for this discussion on scaling your fintech in time of crisis. Mission possible or impossible? I'm Yao Polarskine, fintech investment advisor at Invest Lithuania. Invest Lithuania is the official agency for foreign direct investment and business development, helping companies to discover business opportunities in Lithuania. I have a huge pleasure to be moderating this session today. Fintech businesses have made an extraordinary impact in the past five years. When reacting to the pandemic situations, fintechs were among the first ones to respond to the pandemic situation by introducing new solutions to help the clients and customers. But the main question, how does the next potential fintech giant can navigate all the challenges of scaling and growth, not only in the light of the current COVID-19 situation, but even be prepared for any other upcoming pandemic crisis. Today you will hear from fintech company leaders on how the companies are adapting to the changing world and what approaches are they taking fostering collaboration, securing funding and reshaping businesses in response to this crisis. So I would like to introduce my panelists for today. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce Siguta Kuncevicute, CEO of SOMAP EU Payments. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, I'm Sukuta, uh, CEO of SumUp EU Payments. We are part of SumUp Group. Our product is a mobile payment solution that we deliver to our customers globally. Um, we are one of the fastest growing fintechs uh, in the European Union. Uh, and uh, definitely thanks for having me here. Looking forward for the discussion uh, about the recent changes um, within the markets and businesses uh, due to COVID impact. Thank you, Sigurda. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Stefano Wetsano, founder and CEO of Yapile. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me uh, today. Um, Yapili is a tech company uh, that plays in the open banking space and our objective is uh, to remove the technical barrier for anyone that wants to benefit from uh, the open finance revolution. So our objective is to make uh, connecting to bank uh, easy. Thank you, Stefano. Finally, I would like to introduce our third speaker today, Nigel Verdon, co-founder and CEO of Reels Bank. 
Hi, and, and thank you for the invitation to talk, and welcome to the to the audience. I say my name is Nigel Verdon. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rails Bank, and it's my third fintech I founded uh, within and led through the dot, first one through the dot com crash, the second one through credit crunch, and now COVID. So uh, luck seems to follow me. Uh, Rails Bank's uh, goal is uh, we're a global banking as a service platform, and we're the only global platform that's there uh, today. And our goal is to enable any business, brand, or bank uh, to become a fintech and participate in this new world of embedded finance. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you all for joining us today. So without further ado, I would like to kick off uh, the discussion with the first question actually to Nigel. Nigel, you already mentioned that you were leading uh, startups through different crises, and you are one of the most experienced fintech leaders. And at this stage, you're also leading Reels Bank. Uh, even in times like this, uh, Reels Bank is growing and expanding into the new markets. So as a leader, what key actions did you take not only to mitigate the crisis, but actually accelerate the fintech growth in the time of crisis. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. The uh, the, the first thing is uh, get we got control of our costs, and so you very clear and understand your costs. Uh, get a new plan in place uh, and a. a bearish plan that says nothing's going to happen over this year or declining and so you in the back of your head you actually know where your cash flows are and cash is the most important thing uh, in this uh, in the special downturn uh, next most important thing is engage even more with your customers because your customers help you through and I remember in dot com crash we had two big customers called Goldman Sachs and UBS and uh, we renegotiated with them and they helped us through that crash so customers helping them be successful helps us be successful and uh, that was the, the approach and in terms of uh, growing in this I, I think downturns for for young companies uh, without handcuffs or without huge legacy cost bases we have massive opportunity uh, to all of us here on, on the call uh, because uh, we can invest when others can't uh, in terms of growth and I, I think there's COVID has made a very, very clear uh, a sort of partition between what we call the digitized world, uh, which is people who have basically uh, figured out that digital change means having a PDF, but it doesn't actually mean that. It's just uh, the PDF is of no use to you whatsoever. And the digital natives, like all of us on the call, who, for example, we sent 127 people home in uh, to work from home in, uh, in February, and no customers were impacted, and the customers didn't even realize we were working from home. Uh, look to some of the legacy financial services, they've still got to go into machine rooms, they've still got to get security infrastructure, all those type of things. So I think the opportunity is we're all digital natives, we can all operate as distributed companies, uh, we're all cloud natives, and uh, so we can carry on operating and growing. And uh, this year we had a our best ever quarter in Q1. Uh, we grew 10% uh, in, in April on Q1 and grew another 10% in May. And it looks like we're going to have a record June too. And uh, it's because we can operate in this this world where it's, the, as I said, the, the non-PDF world. It's actually a true digital native world. Thanks, Nigel. Actually, I couldn't agree more that you know it's no longer the PDF world, and you just need to grow more, more and more agile. Uh, but uh, just wanted to uh, to touch another point. So, what do you think? Which qualities are more important to a good crisis time manager? Is it a quick reaction or a deep analytical thinking? You know that you can evaluate the situation. Because it seems that you know you were very quick, you know, to respond to the situation, but you know sometimes companies need also do some analytical thinking. You've got to think, and you've got to think with the data you have in front of you. And I think uh, a lot of people get into uh, analysis paralysis because they're trying to overthink. And there's criticism of government doing the wrong decision, but hey, you've got data, you've got a very small amount of data, you've got to make a decision on, you can change your decision later. So decision making uh, with data and some planning, et cetera, is super important and making decisions fast. And nobody should be, uh, nobody should be shot for making the wrong decision because we're humans we do we do what we've done with data but super fast changing it if you need to it's uh, if you just keep to your your path everything is changing on a daily basis here 
Uh, we've seen uh, all sorts of events happen over the past uh, five months that we'd never seen before in our lives uh, and everything. And so you've got to work out, figure out, change, go forward. And that's a massive advantage of being a digital native and be a smaller company. You can change quick. You don't have to wait for the super tanker to, to move while you're trying to get a curve. We can move and take opportunity quickly. So I think it's a, a combination of thinking and preparing. Preparing is the analytic side. And so having a plan, you can just change some of the data in it, say, okay, that's what my cash flow looks like now. I can re-go and change. I can go into growth. I can invest instead of hunker down. So it's a combination of both. Uh, they're both equally as important. But don't overthink. <laughs> yeah, don't overthink. Uh, Stefano, uh, uh, you are leading the enterprise connected to platform Yapli, and uh, you already have recently successfully closed a funding round. Huge congratulations to that. And still hiring. So, what were the key steps in organizing your top leadership's response to this crisis and growth strategy? Uh, could you share the lessons you learned with your, our audience? Yeah, of course. Um... Thank you for the question. So I will not maybe touch on uh, uh, points that uh, Nigel uh, uh, touched, like uh, uh, analyzing your cost uh, or being close to your customer. Um, so from our perspective, we saw uh, the current situation um, as a potential to catch up with some other player uh, in the space. Uh, so that's why we keep uh, we keep growing, um, uh, and uh, we have not changed our growth plan. So. I would say probably there are three, four suggestions or lessons learned. First, actually, what also Nigel was saying, be prepared uh, as a company in general and be prepared for the worst. As a company, obviously, we had uh, business uh, continuity plan in place uh, um, when the crisis hit. Uh, um, so even before uh, the government imposed the lockdown, uh, we were already working on a team A, team B configuration. So when uh, the lockdown was imposed, uh, it was very easy for the team to migrate on a fully remote, uh, uh, let's say, way of operating. Uh, the productivity actually uh, of the team has increased in the last uh, few months, and we learned a lot of uh, how we could uh, let's say, operate uh, in, uh, in the future. We were forced in this exercise of uh, working from home, uh, and we learned a lot uh, about, uh, uh, let's say, ourselves. The second point is, uh, um, from a leadership perspective, uh, as what I found very important is stay close to the team. Um, working remotely during one of the biggest economic and uh, health crises uh, that uh, many of us uh, will witness uh, during our life uh, require a lot more empathy than uh, what you require if you actually see your uh, your colleagues every day in the office so personally i've been reaching out uh, chatting and talking to all uh, all of my employees on a regular basis uh, all of my colleagues uh, and we are more than 50 people so i made sure that uh, i was spending time uh, with each one of them, but also organize more events than we were doing uh, before. So we had from quiz uh, to uh, master chef to running squad. Uh, so trying to be closer, uh, even if you're far. The third uh, uh, point is uh, the ground communication. Um, over communicator, uh, it's a general rule. Uh, but I guess in this situation, it was uh, uh, even more important to make sure that uh, the team knows what was going on, uh, and we we had even more session during which we were uh, uh, we were uh, uh, sharing with the team uh, uh, our plans. Uh, so the last point, probably for us, was uh, uh, from a leadership perspective, was uh, never stop. We didn't change our um, our objective. Um, the energy uh, has remained the same. Um, so this uh, led to the team to be keep driving in the same direction rather than uh, in the volatility of the situation maybe being a bit lost uh, so we didn't change uh, let's say um, our vision and direction for the company yeah, so vision and direction is very important in the time uh, like this um, 
Sigurde, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, you managed Lithuanian subsidiary of SumUp, uh, which is one of the leading card payments processing companies with offices in three continents. Uh, what organizational changes have been implemented across your company globally uh, to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, by the way, specific actions that we're taking in Lithuania? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. As as you correctly noted, uh, we have global offices uh, in worldwide uh, locations within the company. Nevertheless, the, the the same measures were implemented in on all the group level companies. Uh, the first thing we we did, and I'm pretty proud that we were proactive when making these steps. So we uh, reviewed our key priorities uh, because our our uh, main customers are the small medium enterprises that definitely suffered from, from the lockdown. I will not go into the numbers, uh, but they definitely, I mean, the decrease was definitely impressive and we understood and understood very quickly that we need to do something in order to help our customers. So what we did, we reviewed the priorities, uh, we reviewed our product roadmap, uh, our future plans, and uh, allocated uh, the resources uh, to the main initiatives that uh, we thought will help our merchants uh, throughout these difficult times. Um, I, I mean, I, I will not go maybe into all the details, but we managed to launch products uh, to the market uh, in a couple of weeks that in fact in the roadmap we have planned to be launched in months. Uh, so I'm, I'm, really, I'm really proud how the team were kind of able to, to, to structurize uh, themselves and working remotely accomplish that. And uh, what is also uh, important, I mean, the lockdown uh, was impacting the global offices also from working from home perspectives as other panelists were indicating. It's, uh, I mean, we were remote teams already, uh, but working uh, remotely definitely required to review our kind of internal communication ways, uh, all the rituals we have and, and, and etc. But again, I think we are in this for a long haul. Uh, I mean, overall the business uh, and the way we do business is changing. Uh, so. Uh, uh, being reactive, uh, uh, w uh, watching the clo situation closely, um, and thinking about new methods, new products will be key uh, for the future in my eyes. Uh, and yeah, and we are trying to accomplish that in and being by on the same time being pretty 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 big organization. Yeah, thank you for sharing this. Uh, I guess, you know, uh, every company is already having more and more data uh, that helps to evaluate the pre-pandemic situation and, you know, the post-COVID uh, situation. So I guess this brings me to another topic, funding, uh, which is also a very important topic for the companies. So I would like to dedicate my question to Stefano, uh, your team uh, have secured a successful Series A funding uh, during this coronavirus crisis. Uh, could you share your experience with us? Uh, how was the funding process different from, let's say, the normal investment raising? Um, yes, yeah, so certainly uh, raising during the COVID crisis was uh, um, was more challenging. And I think the first reason is because uh, I had COVID myself. Uh, so during the week of the signature, I had actually pneumonia, fever, headaches. Uh, so a funding round, uh, I'll definitely uh, remember. Um, but uh, in general, the process uh, went, uh, I would say, quite, uh, quite smoothly. Uh, and the advice that uh, is something that uh, I guess uh, uh, you will hear uh, from, from many founders is uh, to raise when you can and not what you have to. In our situation, the reason I'm mentioning that is that uh, we were not planning to raise until April, May. And uh, uh, so in January, while I was uh, catching up uh, and uh, sharing my, my plan uh, with Lakestar that invested in us, they, they, they thought about uh, um, Making, making us an offer. The offer was great. Lakestar is a, was a fantastic partner. 
camera, so we didn't think it twice. Um, so the process actually went super smoothly because uh, we met them January, February we signed the term sheet, and March uh, we closed the round. Um, so my my advice is whenever you find a seller partner um, from a from a, let's say founder perspective, uh, don't think about uh, uh, maximizing valuation, maximizing timing, uh, waiting three, four months. It's all about maximizing chances of uh, success for the company. Yes, this is a very good advice you know, uh, for the future fintech leaders or the ones who are willing to start the, uh, the companies for, for themselves. Uh, Nigel and Seguda, I would be keen to hear your thoughts on this. How do you think the funding landscape will change? Do you have anything to add? Maybe start with Nigel? Nigel, why right, you can uh, unmute yourself? Apologies, I had a mute on. Uh, well spotted. <laughs> uh, no, there are a lot of things that Stefano was saying. Uh, very true and wise words. And Lexa, a great, great investor. Uh, we are capital raising. I've uh, literally been talking to around 52 funds at the moment. Uh, yeah, and bizarrely enough, uh, a good uh, 85, 90 percent of those have all been inbound uh, over the past uh, few months. So the, uh, the people are investing at the moment. Uh, each one I've talked to is writing checks. Uh, the the difference is the, the first part of this uh, this quarter, sorry, first part of this half of the year, uh, uh, most funds were focused on uh, defending their portfolios, working out, getting plans uh, for the portfolio companies making sure the LPs were clear and whether they made capital calls, et cetera, on them. And so uh, I think deemed not to be investing when they were investing, but they, they were, their focus was elsewhere. So the other one is uh, um, they sort of split in two. Some are writing some very big checks and only having met the founders uh, on uh, on video on Zoom or, or one of the other products. Uh, and others are making smaller checks uh, on Zoom and then with a view to a larger check next year. So it's, it's changed some of the dynamics uh, of, of the industry. And uh, as just uh, detect uh, from talking everything from, from Southeast Asia, Europe, and East and West Coast US, uh, the, there is a, a real positivity about investing in, uh, especially on the fintech world, because of this, uh, we are digitally native businesses who can survive. We don't have this legacy like branches or PDFs, as we said earlier, uh, to uh, to take care of. And so, uh, be positive, uh, as, as Stefano says. Take money, uh, not when you need it. Take money if you're a good investor and you've got good people looking at you. Uh, sell them. Uh, it's all about getting, ensuring that you've got the right story and the right ambition. And also, uh, just also, would just one word of advice to people, especially on the seed stage: don't worry about your plan. Uh, all plans are wrong at seed to seed stage. Uh, they're ninety nine percent wrong. And they're investing the team, and they're just seeing: have you got a plan? Yes, yeah, tick. Every don't try and justify it; it's it's wrong. Uh, and as you get towards Series E and and uh, floating and stuff like that, then your plan has to be vaguely correct uh, because that's what you got standby and warrant. But yeah, investment world is. Is looking positive, uh, and and uh, some people are surprised when I say, "Are you investing at the moment?" I say, "Of course we are." It's just like almost an offence <laughs> they've been accused of not investing at the moment. So I say positivity. Don't don't. The media may report differently, uh, but when do any of us believe the media? Uh, to be honest, so uh, believe in yourself. Uh, pick up the phone, and speak to people, and uh, don't don't believe the media that's giving you a certain story because they, they've got an edge to do. As of sometimes is uh, ability. Yeah, investment positivity. Uh, Suguta, do you have anything to add or to share your perspective how the funding landscape will change? So, if honestly, my opinion is not that much <laughs> different from what, what our panelists were talking about. Uh, even looking into the Lithuanian fintech and 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 startup market, um, recently we did see a couple of examples with really impressive funding rounds uh, and, and 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 money allocated for product development. So, I I believe it's it's possible. Uh, there is never a bad time to 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 launch something if you have a good idea. 
that was always kind of my, my, my personal mantra. But again, I also believe that uh, funding will be uh, a little bit more complicated in the near future, but it uh, doesn't mean it's not available. Uh, it's just uh, the expectations from, 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 from investors and from the markets will be uh, slightly higher in terms of financial discipline, profitability, and etc. Uh, so yeah, my, my, my advice was would be that if you have an idea, it's it's not a bad time. Uh, you just uh, need to search for opportunities. There are definitely uh, some available, and practical examples represent that. Just add this one quick thing to that is. Uh, Venture capital has certain yields uh, that investors chase. Uh, we're going to be in a pretty much near zero interest rate environment for the next 10, 20 years, thanks to devaluing of, of pretty much everybody's currency and quantitative easing that's going on at the moment. And so, uh, uh, and because nobody's going to the, uh, on the stock market at the moment, there's a ton of money chasing uh, venture uh, investments because at least it's getting some may get some sort of yield. There's some risk obviously associated with it, and so uh, in market downturns like this, it's either flight to bonds or flight to places to find yield. Uh, asset prices, uh, which are uh, uh, buildings and all that type of thing, massively uh, deflated now. As well, so there's, there's, I think, money chasing good companies uh, uh, across the world, and because everybody's seen downturns and knows what a downturn looks like from 2007, 2008, 2000, and has seen what. Uh, investors are, and people who supply the money are, are pretty damn smart people, and especially venture. It's a long term. You, uh, you've, you, as you say, it's like getting you're almost getting married. You've got to take that sort of thing to the investor. You've got six year relation, a seven year relationship with them or more, uh, and so that's uh, that's what you've got to think on. So the cycle will be moving up then, and IPOs will be back, and hence investor at this end of the cycle. Uh, valuations may be affected slightly, but it's probably a good thing uh, for all parties. Uh, on it, uh, and the sense of investors aren't uh, predatory. Uh, they are they're very good, even-minded people. As you, as you mentioned, Lake Star, they, people like that are just uh, they do the right thing because the entrepreneur has to be part of the marriage. If you said I mean, going forward. Yeah, actually, while we are, while we are on this topic, so I would like also to touch. Uh, we touch investment and funding, and you know. So, are there any other ways for fintechs to get support and resources for growth? Might you have any other examples? Uh, the British Business Bank's doing convertible loan notes at the moment, and they're quite uh, company friendly because there's, there's no cap on them. So, from a corporate finance side, they're quite they're quite interesting. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's it's nice to have as opposed to uh, good investor money because money from from government is great and it's helpful. But uh, when you get money with an amazing fund uh, behind it and experience and playbooks, uh, the venture money say it comes at a discount to the uh, to the government money. I take the venture money, uh, quality venture money, at any time because the contact network and everything. British Business Bank is doing a great thing. The government doing a great thing to help, uh, but uh, the, it's, it's, it's money, uh, and it's, it's much better to go to people who will help you and generally interested in helping you and pushing you, and they're not just interested in your reporting every month to them of the shareholding and the price and everything, because that's of no value to us as entrepreneurs. Yeah. Stefano, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe you have something to add, you know, some examples from your experience. So I agree with uh, uh, with Nigel that uh, smart money is the most important thing. Money is not all the same. Um, it's difficult to make example because I think every jurisdiction is trying to help their own uh, ecosystem in a different way. Um, so we can make example of what the UK government is doing, but considering we are Lithuania FinTech Week, maybe it's less, uh, uh, it's less relevant for you guys. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, your government is supporting the, uh, the ecosystem the way they can. Um, so it's, it's difficult to say what other available methods are, because it really depends on where the company is based. 
Yeah, location matters. Uh, Suguta, might you have anything uh, to share with us? Um, same, nothing new. I mean, uh, definitely there are various opportunities in various uh, geographies. Um, maybe as a company, we um, we didn't research it that depth, uh, and we concentrated more on our kind of internal in initiatives in terms of, of adjusting the business model to the existing situation, our products, and etc. Um, but yeah, I, I heard uh, good feedbacks regarding some measures in uh, from our customers customers uh, themselves, I mean, from the small median enterprises that uh, that really did suffer and needed support um, uh, <laughs> at that time when the, the, the lockdown happened. So, but yeah, it very much varied from country to country. Uh, so, so, so I guess uh, location does, does matter. But, but we as a company, we, we utilized our internal resources, if I can say so. Yeah, so actually this brings us to another topic, you know, so we just uh, touched funding and, uh, you know, uh, even in the period like this, uh, scaling is also very important. And, you know, uh, you are representing fintech companies that are already scaling in other markets. Uh, Nigel, uh, you are currently, uh, what we heard and read, uh, you are focused on expanding your footprint in Southeast Asia. You also do have the U.S. offering uh, that is set to go. So what are the main challenges and advantages scaling Reels Bank in different continents at the time like this? Uh, Sure, uh, uh, I come back to uh, 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 scaling when competition's hurting is good. Uh, we, we, the, the philosophy is a lot of Wales Bank uh, have been professional sports people, or military and others, so we like working at a very high pace. And I think now is we've upped our pace to another level uh, to, to be able to grow ahead of a competition. Uh, that's just one just, just one thing, there's our philosophy on it. Uh, we also, if you look at, read any business school book, they'll say don't operate on three fronts uh, because you haven't got the, it's very difficult to do that. And it's whether it's business, military, anything, operating on three fronts is, is, is incredibly difficult. The way we get around that is we have a, an amazing team uh, in, in Europe, uh, about to uh, hopefully hire an amazing individual in, to lead us in North America, who've worked together before as well and has a, has a pre-baked team. And I'm based in, in Singapore. So, and we, we've always worked as distributed businesses. I've been, uh, as our, our core team came together in uh, 1996 in uh, when that's Bank and the first company I founded. So we know how to work uh, and things. And when you've got pre-baked teams, know how to work together and know the, the downsides of everybody and the upsides of everybody, what they're good and bad at and everything, that enables you, I think, to operate on a, on a, on a few fronts. And, and the other thing we use, uh, we just rip off Google and Intel. Uh, these are things called OKRs, uh, which is a, just an approach of giving everybody the same direction and feedback fast on it and change fast. And we use OKRs for his company, each, uh, a business unit of the company, each team and things, is to give that direction. So it's documented, it's clear, you feedback and you discuss it, uh, but you can, you can, you don't have to be redirecting everybody the whole time and that allows you to build global organizations. So we're sort of breaking the, the, the playbook a little bit, uh, but I think we've got the right people, uh, we've got the right market as well, uh, and because US, uh, we, we believe competition is all quite weak at the moment. Uh, Southeast Asia is coming out of COVID uh, and economically will come out faster than, than, than Western Europe. And Europe, we've got, we're still growing at 10% a month. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, with a reasonable environment. And it's uh, sometimes it does feel like you're, you've got to keep the wheels on as you, as you getting at speed, but that's hiring a, a, a come back to Stefano's point earlier, it's your team. Uh, if you've got a team that's experienced, knows how to go forward, doesn't overthink, uh, very good leaders in, in the team, and that's what uh, you, you, you to give you direction and execution. And I'm quite proud of our team. We're all quite grey-haired. We're all ex-capital markets, so we've all come from trading floors and et cetera in, in, in London and around the world. And we work at that sort of pace, and we've worked in international businesses, most of us, before. And uh, that really does help. So you know how to have these conversations with in the early days, it was on just on the phone, on the scorebox. Uh, today, video is a, is a luxury. <laughs> I mean, 
and meeting is an even bigger luxury, I think, going forward. Yeah, indeed. So the main drivers, they talent, the team, and uh, uh, their the philosophy of scaling. You know, just to be agile to do that. Uh, Stefano, uh, you were also expanding to the new markets, uh, mainly in Europe. Uh, what is your experience? Could you share with us uh, your advice on how to stay agile, grow, and find new customers? Yes. Yeah, so. Linked to what uh, um, Nigel was saying, the importance of the team uh, and the quality of talent you have, it's key to any company. You are as good as the people you have in the company. Um, so we, are we, we keep growing, we are still hiring. Um, and fortunately for us, but unfortunately because of the situation, hiring is becoming, uh, is becoming easier. Uh, because uh, there are a lot of talented people that uh, they were simply unfortunate to be in sector that were more affected uh, than the fintech sector. Uh, but uh, they are extremely talented. Simply, uh, this crisis is affecting them more than uh, maybe us. Um, in terms of uh, uh, how things are changing now, is uh, um, definitely we are seeing uh, uh, more demand of people to have flexibility around working. Um, so. Uh, working remote uh, is becoming kind of the new normal. Um, so uh, we are scaling and scaling in a more distributed uh, uh, distributed way. But what concerns the expansion uh, uh, from a commercial perspective, which is what you were asking, yeah, we are operating already in uh, UK, Italy, France, Germany, Spain, Ireland. So let's say most of the European um, jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, um, the only way to scale and grow at the pace we're doing is to remain focused and not try to do too many things uh, um, and too many product uh, just to do one thing and try to do it well and this is applicable to covid or uh, normal time it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, makes a, uh, makes a huge difference what we might be seeing more now because of the crisis is uh, other companies maybe were less good at focusing um, focus more on their core competencies and be more open to partner uh, with the with tech company. Uh, so in terms of expansion, uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, the tech company here today, we will see a lot more openness uh, from a bigger company partner and work with them because they themselves as a company, they are refocusing on what they do best and they need us even more than before. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, Suguta, uh, might you could share your experience? How is it different or you know similar uh, to, uh, to what uh, Nigel or Stefan already said? How is the scaling of products, uh, how the scaling of product situation is at sum up? Um, it's uh, similar uh, in the way that we, we definitely um, treat ourselves as an agile organization and people are enabled to, to deliver what's needed for the business success. Uh, but as, as, as discussed before, our strategy during uh, COVID was uh, to review the priorities, to the, review the product offerings that we have and to concentrate on what is needed for, for, for our customers. Uh, taking consideration the lockdown. Uh, so we came up with, with various uh, new ideas. Um, and as I, I agree that reaction is here key, uh, that there, there was no time to, you know, <laughs> to, to, to strategize for three months and then start the development. So, so we moved very fast. Uh, so we are also uh, hiring to, during these, these times because we still believe that uh, full, the team is the key to drive further uh, to scale further and we need the talent. Uh, I, uh, but I definitely uh, agree that hiring now is um it's different. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's more complicated than it was before. I myself did some few hirings here in Lithuania, so 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 definitely there's a lot of uncertainty between the market. So uh, some some people um, have concerns regarding uh, regarding changes in in in, in their careers, uh, even minor things like interview processes. It's it's just it's just different, but it's I still 
feel that it's possible uh, and we still need the talent uh, to to move forward and and yeah and and that's and that will continue being our strategy during these uh, these times just one thing following on from that, and it's probably a reflection of everybody on the call, is uh, one thing we, we've tried and I've observed other other companies is to go outside your, your borders. You've got to have a global ambition and a global mindset as a company. And uh, within Railsbank, we have something like 44 languages and 127 people. Uh, so having building diversity uh, of culture, of people, of, of everything from, grow, from day one, uh, generates a, a team with a global mindset. And that is, uh, I think, core to also being able to scale on different borders. I've, I've come across uh, companies in coming into Singapore from from uh, United States, for example, and uh, it's it, to uh, to adopt to the Southeast Asian market. So I grew up there as a kid. Uh, are very very different from operating in Europe and, and the US. And the US is very different from, from uh, even the UK because the US uh, they may speak the same language, but fundamentally there are some very different uh, behaviours. Uh, so having global mindset and the fact that everyone in this call is uh, uh, from all different parts of the uh, of, of Europe is uh, a sort of reflective of, of, of be global from day one, think global. And we started selling Access Global Banking with five lines of code back in 2016 when we launched our PowerPoint deck. And so we had global on the deck when there's only two of us, me and my co-founder. And uh, we've been selling that aspiration ever since. And if you start with an aspiration like that, you can continue it uh, as well. But Operationally, uh, you do need certain things. Working as distributed has its ups and downsides. Uh, we've learned to have like a center of excellence for a core of our of our platform, and that center of excellence is in Lithuania. Uh, and we usually know we've got a fair, fair, fair size team there, and we're going to be growing and investing in that team. Uh, so that is uh, just other observations of this, this tactics as well of of how to be global, but also have centers of excellence for product, for engineering, uh, sales. For on the marketing side and then localization and the other thing we, we did for globalization we, we call parts of the product uh, for example issue account uh, receive money and send money and they're fairly international words uh, if you look at some of the competitors uh, uh, then uh, I'm not, I'll pick on the US yet again <laughs> but uh, they call things uh, ACH uh, payments they call them uh, the checking accounts which we don't call them in Europe but an account is an account anywhere in the world so also, your, your terminology uh, being international helps you scale. You don't suddenly have to go back into the product or your documentation, uh, which is part of the product, and your contracts and everything, and, and be able to change your language. You've got to have this core of international and a wrapper of localization. So it feels local, but with a sort of, uh, you, you can localize a global product. We put a ton of thought into that before, uh, we, we uh, as we were launching the business, because our aspirations were to go global, and that's part of our course strategy. Yes, yeah, so actually, this is a good advice, you know, just uh, be global from uh, day one. Uh, actually, I would like to uh, to touch uh, our last points, you know, for this discussion and just to think about the opportunities what this crisis has brought to us. So, Nigel, you have mentioned that scaling, you know, is one of the opportunities in the time like this. Uh, Stefano, you're also scaling into the new markets. So, good are you also introducing new products. So, you now just think for a moment uh, what opportunities this crisis has brought, not even to your businesses, but maybe you can share what fintech products will be on a high demand uh, in the future. Maybe we can start with Stefano. Well, I can tell you um, what we are seeing now uh, in terms of uh, trends. Um, obviously, in our sector, uh, there are uh, uh, three let's say three, four trends that are uh, very clear at the moment. Uh, obviously, uh, the lending space is significantly accelerating the digitalization. During a crisis, availability of capital is even more important uh, than in a 
uh, let's say in uh, normal times uh, so all the lending space uh, uh, is investing even more in uh, becoming better at what they do from a payment perspective uh, also we see huge demand uh, with open banking you can achieve almost a free payment uh, while uh, uh, the average cost per transaction uh, in general is two percent whenever someone uh, does a payment so uh, big companies that before were focusing more on the, the best user experience now the understand that saving two percent on the bottom line is actually super important uh, so payment uh, is accelerating the digitization um, in general banks uh, were relying a lot on people going to branches now they realize that this might not be what the future holds for them and so they are accelerating uh, as well on the digitization of the of their own offering um, so to make sure they remain relevant in a world that is going more in a Revolut or Monzo type of direction. Uh, and then lastly, as I said, uh, the fourth trend is uh, partnering up uh, with people and focus on your core comp competencies is uh, what we are seeing more and more. Thank you, that's a great advice. Uh, so Guta, uh, would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short. I think all the products that will stimulate businesses uh, are the future. So as mentioned, loans, especially the micro, micro loans, uh, all e-commerce related product payment facilitates uh, and easy access to bank accounts. I still believe this, this is a huge problem in, in uh, some of the jurisdictions. Nigel, and your last thoughts? Just mirroring what everybody else says, did anybody who's a digital native has massive opportunity going forward. Uh, in terms of the personal observations, in, uh, investing in or figuring out what's the next generation of Zoom and next generation of Google Hangouts, uh, because one of the real observations is the workplace is, is now massively changed uh, and will, I think, continue to be that. And the tools need to grow up. Uh, I, I, drastically missing what well, Google have a thing called Jamboard, but it's not, not hugely great and massively expensive. But if there's tools to, to let us go back and collaborate again with a wonderful thing called a whiteboard, but do it uh, uh, remotely. So it's slightly not FinTech, but it's like tech to enable amazing collaboration. There's a massive opportunity for someone to fix that because the world of working has changed to go and see people. Yeah, I guess so with this last thought, I would like to thank you uh, sincerely to our panelists. Uh, thank you, uh, Sigute, Stefano, and, and Nigel for the insights, your thoughts, and practical advices you already have shared. And thank you, everyone, for listening to uh, our live discussion today. And we hope that you find it inspiring and useful. And if you have any questions or comments uh, you know, for our speakers, so please uh, follow the company's program profiles or the LinkedIn profiles, you know, just to get the latest updates. And if you have any questions or comments, so just drop us a line and we'll respond to you. So with that, I would like to say thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Yira and the panel, for an interesting discussion. I really love Nigel's quote, don't overthink and get into paralysis by analysis. That wraps up day three of FinTech Week Lithuania. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had your chance to discuss new ideas, learn something, and just have a great time in general. Uh, I enjoyed myself thoroughly. It was a really good day. It's so many people, so many beautiful ideas spread across. And uh, don't forget, tomorrow uh, the recordings of the events will be available on the OnVent platform. And if you want to review something from the previous days, you can also visit the webpage and try and review it if you haven't had the chance to do that yet. Tomorrow we kick off at 3 p.m. Lithuania time or GMT plus 3. And I'll give you a quick sneak peek on what's up tomorrow. So we have Lithuanian uh, FinTech Awards, winners and leaders of FinTech. Then the sector leaders are going to present practical tips on how to survive after the crisis, uh, discussing 
about reskilling as a main tool and have a fun fundraising possibilities. Listen uh, to a true story how Lithuania became a successful fintech hub. Ladies and gentlemen, I enjoyed myself thoroughly. I hope you did too. We will see more of each other tomorrow. Uh, another productive and very interesting day awaits us. And right now, Fintech Week Lithuania signing out. Hey, hey.